Cutting Edge, edited by Dennis Etchison. Copyright 1986 by Dennis Etchison. Narrated by David Palmer. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Annotation. Collection of twenty original horror stories marked by an unusual ferocity of language and vision. Some of the visceral offerings are by such authors as Peter Straub, Robert Bloch, Whitley Strieber, and Ramsey Campbell. Some strong language, some violence, and explicit descriptions of sex. 1986. From the Book Jacket. All original tales of horror and mystery by Peter Straub, Clive Barker, Joe Haldeman, Mark Laidlaw, Roberta Lannis, Steve Rasnick Tam, Les Daniels, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, Nicholas Royal, Ray Russell, Whitley Strieber, Robert Block, W. H. Pugmire, Jessica Amanda Salmonson, Charles L. Grant, George Clayton Johnson, Richard Christian Matheson, William F. Nolan, Ramsey Campbell, Edward Bryant, Carl Edward Wagner. Audacious, grotesque, and startling stories of modern horror, specially composed for the midnight hour. Near the beginning of the last decade, a remarkable awakening occurred. It was a brave new literary renaissance that saw the vision of the dark fantasist return from a restless exile. Writers seeking a form beyond the edge of mainstream horror now found an eager, hungry audience for their idiosyncratic creations. Anthologies such as Shadows, Whispers, Night Chills, and Dark Forces broke new ground in a prolific movement that continually defied genre labels. Now in a landmark collection of never-before-published works, Cutting Edge brings together twenty of today's master craftsmen to celebrate a bold new age of speculative fiction. From an original novella by Peter Straub to brilliant short stories by Whitley Strieber, Ramsey Campbell, Clive Barker, Robert Block, Charles L. Grant, and more, this extraordinary volume invites us into strange and unexplored realms of the imagination. Here we discover tales of modern life, of hopes and fears that lurk in the cold light of a new dawn. At their most intense, they tell of urban paranoia, of empty faces and subway shadows, and walking dead who work in deserted all-night markets. At their most lyrical, they record the timeless struggle to retain innocence and love in a dehumanized world poised on the brink of disaster. Audacious, startling, and specially composed for the twilight hours, Cutting Edge is a rich and satisfying treasury for fans of the form, and all those who have not yet felt the pleasure of its seductive chill. About the Editor An exciting new voice in the field of speculative literature, Dennis Etchison is the author of two short story collections, Red Dreams and The Dark Country. He lives in Los Angeles, California. Dedication To Kirby McCauley and Carl Faber Table of Contents Introduction Side 1 Part 1. Bringing It All Back Home Blue Rose by Peter Straub, Side 1, Tone 2 The Monster by Joe Haldeman, Side 2, Tone 1 Lacuni by Carl Edward Wagner, Side 3, Tone 1 Part 2. They're Coming for You Pale Trembling Youth by W. H. Pugmire and Jessica Amanda Salmonson, Side 3, Tone 2. Muzak for Torso Murders, by Mark Laidlaw, Side 3, Tone 3. Goodbye, Dark Love, by Roberta Lannis, Side 3, Tone 4. Out There, by Charles L. Grant, Side 4, Tone 1. Little Cruelties, by Steve Rasnick Tem, Side 4, Tone 2. The Man with the Hoe, by George Clayton Johnson, Side 4, Tone 3. They're Coming for You, by Les Daniels, Side 5, Tone 1. Part 3, Walking the Headlights. Vampire, by Richard Christian Matheson. Side 5, Tone 2 Lapses by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough Side 5, Tone 3 The Final Stone 
by William F. Nolan, Side 5, Tome 4. Irrelativity by Nicholas Royal, Side 6, Tome 1. The Hands by Ramsey Campbell, Side 6, Tome 2. The Bell by Ray Russell, Side 7, Tone 1. Lost Souls by Clive Barker, Side 7, Tone 2. Part 4 Dying All the Time. Reaper by Robert Block, Side 7, Tone 3. The Transfer by Edward Bryant, Side 8, Tone 1. Pain by Whitley Strieber, Side 8, Tone 2. Introduction There are seasons of pain. I have assembled this book because the blood is on the rock. It is my blood. When I started reading and writing in the 1950s, much of my attention was given to science fiction, a very exciting field indeed to grow up with. At that time a boom of sorts was on, and the literature was alive with promise. Brave new writers were everywhere, and it was my impression that they not only were content with their lot as outcasts, but were busily forging an alternative to the protections of the larger society. And so, tentatively at first, and then with the naive self-assurance of my own awakening consciousness, I decided to join them. The rock, I thought, was not such a bad place to be. After a while, either the field or my perception of it changed. Did it overreach itself? Or had I merely misread its potential? In any event, eventually a split seemed to occur. While one faction retreated to the less ambiguous ray guns and rocket ships of its space opera past, another channeled its imaginative energies into fabricating ever more baroque variations on heroic medieval pageant plays. By the 1970s, this latter, heretofore but a splinter of a literary subgenre, moved into a position of dominance, or so it appeared from my perspective. Perhaps it was tight money that frightened publishers into playing it safe with imitations of the phenomenally successful Tolkien books and T. H. White's The Once and Future King, or perhaps it was the readers who lost faith after a baptism of unrest and social upheaval. Whatever the cause, booksellers became convinced that their customers were more interested in pseudo-historical pastiches about attractive role models engaged in quests for grails beyond mysterious forests, aided by gnomes with crossbows, elves and chain mail and magic, in other words, in adolescent fantasies of potency disguised as rite-of-passage fairy tales, than in any further confrontation with a future of scaled-down expectations. Hard science fiction went retrograde and began eating itself, excreting shiny but sterile wet dreams of a Fourth Reich in space, while behind the backs of the technocrats the fayest of the fans marshaled their forces and took over the asylum. Those misfits among us who could not find nourishment in such reactionary enclaves discovered that we were stranded. Further, by embracing a protean life at the expense of membership in the social collective, a price had been set without our realizing it. The tide shifted, revealing the extent of the break, and dues were now to be extracted. In my youthfulness I hadn't expected that. As James Baldwin has put it, I didn't even know what dues were. But in that moment the benefits of consensus were lost. The tide was out, and the separation from the mainland was complete. At high noon on the rock I began to write of the pain. Or, more accurately, to focus directly on my isolation, in the belief that I might forge from it something stronger and more beautiful than what had been lost as the illusion of membership crumbled. I vowed that I would make of it my strength. And then, because this is a just universe, I would be permitted to rejoin the world before it was too late, and on my own terms. Time passed, and the shadows lengthened. At some point it became clear to me that what I was undergoing was not a trial, it was my life. And, never satisfied, the rock continued to take my blood. 
It was only then, when I knew that I must embrace my lot or die, that my Heracles appeared. In the questioning, uprooted sixties, some of the more poetic and humanistic writers within the science fiction community chose to concentrate on the soft sciences and explorations of the inscape, incorporating attitudes of contemporary existential philosophy and metaphysics via the fractured artistic techniques of an unsettled time. But this attempt at evolution within a commercial category was quickly diffused by the field, which borrowed a shop-worn term from another medium and pigeonholed this latest development as a temporary aberration called the New Wave, thereby effectively cutting its authors out of the herd and abandoning their revisionist efforts to stillbirth before they could carry the field into riskier, less insurable territory. During the same period, a much older form of fantastic storytelling, predicated on a philosophy of pessimism and despair, gained a broadened base of support. Morbid allegorists of the non-scientific variety, such as Poe and Lovecraft, were discovered to hold strong emotional appeal for growing numbers of people unable to find succor within the monolithic gates of the futurist establishment. Ancient belief systems derived from mysticism and the occult recruited new converts by the millions, as the horror tale grew more popular than ever before and an alternative brand of moral fable became viable in the marketplace. With no relief forthcoming from the power complex, the seventies saw reflections of malaise spread through the popular media on an even greater scale than in former crisis pockets of depression and world war. Paranoid melodramas of suspense and terror became bankable as best-selling books, while film-goers refused to tire of obsessively blood-spattered portents of impending death and destruction. Like the nightmares of apocalypse and atomic mutation that had haunted Japanese films, Western pop culture drenched itself ever deeper in the sacrificial blood of its own darkening unconscious. Unfortunately, the horror novel has fared little better than science fiction or fantasy. Supermarket racks continue to stock a never-ending farrago of flashy paperbacks, their lurid covers competing with The National Enquirer and People, each one promising to render previous bestsellers about unruly children, possession, or suburban unrest, poltergeists, as passé as last week's TV guide. Like fad diets and astrological predictions of disaster, such pandering seeks to exploit middle-class unease with the latest prepackaged devil theory. Those old standbys, the communists, or terrorists now, may or may not be lurking just around the corner and up your street this month, according to the editors of Time and Newsweek, but something not from around here is surely behind the ubiquitous disintegration of the American family and an endless supply of facile excuses is being marketed to housewives hungry for answers at three dollars and fifty cents a shot. Watchman, what of the night? Only character remains alive in the silence, in the hour when the scales are lifted from our eyes, and we finally see what is there, what is really at the end of every fork, as William Burroughs put it. Only after the failure of consciousness can the dream come. It is at this edge that change takes place. Sometime around the beginning of the last decade, something happened. It was a strange awakening. Within the decaying manse of horror literature, of all places, a surprising and unexpectedly fecund movement began, one that has not yet been diffused or aborted. I am not speaking now of your meat market authors, who stuff books like sausages by the pound, but of those who never came in from the cold, and yet were not broken by the night. Most of them were, as I am, primarily short-story writers, who in this country are considered to be only one step up from poets, who are considered to be only one step up from bums. Soon what I thought was only a wish-fulfillment hallucination turned out to be something more along the lines of a miracle. Consider the unlikelihood of it all. The climate was hardly encouraging for readers or writers who sought a fiction not bounded by the homeostatic limitations of mainstream literature. The old futures of the science fiction years had become quaint anachronisms, 
no more relevant to the crucible of contemporary life than visions of Zeppelins over Broadway. And the haunted houses and fetid graveyards of traditional horror were being strip-mined and bulldozed for the prefab market, jerry-built into hermetically sealed tombs with a view. The forms which previously gave shape and meaning to our dreams were moribund, and there was nowhere left to turn. Darkness wove ever closer, warning us to make peace with the long night of the soul. There was, it seemed, little left of a once-so-rich art to give courage during the human winter to come. I remember composing a bitter poem. The snow on the wheel turns and the century ices. We could no longer ask our doctors, psychiatrists, politicians, intellectuals for a candle to light the way. They were all sick from the same thing. Our artist philosophers busied themselves programming their word processors to churn out fast food fiction for a drive through society, dangerously close to running out of gas, scrambling after trilogies about an elfin land that never was and never will be. Or they were lost and gone mad in the mirrored halls of academe, posturing and twitching like hebephrenix and what might as well have been the private language of terminal schizophrenia. Readers and writers alike had been trapped between a stainless steel rock and a moss-covered hard place, so to speak. One could buy into the propaganda machine of the engineer literateurs with their germ-free O'Neill colonies, seeking redemption in some robotized orbiting womb, or wallow in the fatalism of popular horror, with its ancient ones still bumping around in the cellar, and the Antichrist forever bestirring in the woodpile. Pick your poison, either one will do. Consensus is everything in this society. Without it you are damned, or on your own, which is presumed to be the same thing. Well, in the words of Kenneth Patchen, it may be a long time till morning, but there's no law against talking in the dark. I first heard it in the pages of Whispers magazine, which I stumbled across quite by accident. Formerly, Whispers from Arkham, under the editorship of a dentist and collector named Stuart David Schiff, this small circulation periodical endeavored to offer a platform for the voices of the disenfranchised, some of them exiles from science fiction, alongside more traditional material. The most authentic signs of life I had seen in some time were glimpsed there, as a new generation of dark fantasists, as how could they not be in such times, gathered together to keep each other warm. Then came Whispers Press, and other lines of limited-edition hardcovers, culminating in the 1980s with the spectacular success of Scream Press, and then original anthologies through established publishers, after former fan and neophyte agent Kirby McCauley fired the opening gun with his landmark Frights. In short, a kind of renaissance began to happen under so many turned-up noses. Iconoclastic reviewers predisposed to the outre, Jack Sullivan, Douglas Winter, others, pointed the way, and so did some admirably unprejudiced and independent editors, including Gerald Page, Carl Edward Wagner, Charles L. Grant, and Ramsey Campbell. The last three are also now among the most important writers in the field. Perhaps they became editors by default, because in the beginning few others were willing to take the job and because they were excited about what was happening. Readers kept the night watch and demanded more titles. Whispers, shadows, terrors, new terrors, fears, night chills, horrors, death. The milestone, dark forces. The list reads deceptively like a litany of the perverse. We have an adventurous audience and brave compilers to thank for providing a forum for this activity, for taking chances on defiantly idiosyncratic stories that really do not fit the category as it has been known, but which probably would have found no other home. Many of the stories in these books have been like no others anywhere, stories which with rare power and immediacy addressed the ordeal of preserving our humanity through the rigors of 1984 and beyond. The fact that these extraordinary volumes, caskets overflowing with bright and dark jewels, managed to slip into the racks next to so much old wine and so many garish bottles, 
is a special grace for which we should be grateful. Their numbers multiply as the readership expands, at least partially because of beachheads established by so many sensation-mongering macabre-esques. Out of the mud grows the lotus. When this parturient new field opened up, I had already been writing for many years, placing my stories wherever I could, in science fiction and literary publications, in girly books and slick magazines. In one of my regular perusals of market lists and writer's digest, I came upon Stu Schiff's modest solicitation. My contact with him, and later with others like him, led to acceptances for stories that in some cases had gone begging for years. One manuscript in particular, I remember, had been in submission continuously for more than half a decade. My work was too soft for what S.F. had become by then, too speculative for the mainstream markets, too hard-edged and disquieting for the slicks, and too downbeat for the fantasy field. Then, after thirteen or fourteen years as a professional writer, I received a humble letter from Kirby Macaulay. He had seen something of mine in whispers, claimed to like the way I wrote, and asked if I had a story for a new anthology he was putting together. I did. Shortly thereafter, Macaulay was instrumental in organizing the World Fantasy Convention. At its third meeting in Los Angeles, I was astounded to learn that after years of obscurity, I was now suddenly a minor celebrity, at least at that gathering, my contribution to frights having been voted a place on the final ballot of the World Fantasy Awards by popular tally. I didn't win, but my life has not been the same since. I had never considered myself a horror writer in any traditional sense, so I was naturally reluctant to claim membership in that camp. However, through no particular plan, but rather by following the path of least resistance, I found my work being accepted more often in their publications than anywhere else. In most cases I am convinced that these stories could have found a home nowhere else. In some cases I have absolute proof. As the field developed, Macaulay took me on as a client, and the rest is as improbable as any bizarrerie I have ever written. He taught me that I could, after all, survive without altering what I wrote, and that I was not alone on the rock. This book, then, is my offering of gratitude to those who have made the fever dream of safe harbor a reality, not the least of whom is Pat Lobruto of Doubleday, who agreed to publish it. Many of them are represented here, though not all, of course, because of the limitations of space. If you have been reading in the field, you know who they are. If you have not, then it is my hope that Cutting Edge will introduce you to some of them. It is my little song to Kirby Macaulay and the field that miraculously appeared at the nadir of my despair and took me in at my darkest hour, when I had lost hope of surviving by doing what means more to me than anything else, art without compromise. Once you have truly given up the ghost, wrote Henry Miller, everything follows with absolute certainty even in the midst of chaos. It is also my fervent wish that this book will serve as a kind of beacon for others who may believe that they have been left to sink or swim on their own, and who doubt their own strength. I, too, was lost before I was found. The blood is on the rock, but I know now that it is not mine alone. Dennis Etchison Part One Bringing It All Back Home Blue Rose by Peter Straub For Rosemary Clooney On a stifling summer day, the two youngest of the five Beavers' children, Harry and little Eddie, were sitting on cane-backed chairs in the attic of their house on South Sixth Street in Palmyra, New York. Their father called it the upstairs junk room as this large, irregular space was reserved for the boxes of tablecloths, stacks of diminishingly sized girls' winter coats, and musty old dresses Mary Rose Beavers had mummified as testimony to the superiority of her past to her present. A tall mirror that could be tilted in its frame, an artifact of their mother's one-time glory, now revealed to Harry the rear of little Eddie's head. This object, looking more malleable than a head should be, 
an elongated wad of play-doh covered with straggling feathers, was just peeking above the back of the chair. Even the back of little Eddie's head looked tense to Harry. Listen to me, Harry said. Little Eddie squirmed in his chair, and the wobbly chair squirmed with him. You think I'm kidding you? I had her last year. Well, she didn't kill you, little Eddie said. Of course not. She liked me, you little dummy. She only hit me a couple of times. She hit some of those kids every single day. But teachers can't kill people, little Eddie said. At nine, little Eddie was only a year younger than he, but Harry knew that his undersized, fretful brother saw him as much a part of the world of big people as their older brothers. Most teachers can't, Harry said. But what if they live right in the same building as the principal? What if they won teaching awards? Hey, and what if every other teacher in the place is scared stiff of them? Don't you think they can get away with murder? Do you think anybody really misses a snot-faced little brat? A little brat like you? Mrs. Franken took this kid, this runty little Tommy Goals, into the cloakroom, and she killed him right there. I heard him scream. At the end, it sounded just like bubbles. He was trying to yell, but there was too much blood in his throat. He never came back, and nobody ever said boo about it. She killed him, and next year she's going to be your teacher. I hope you're afraid, little Eddie, because you ought to be. Harry leaned forward. Tommy Golds even looked sort of like you, little Eddie. Little Eddie's entire face twitched as if a lightning bolt had crossed it. In fact, the young Golds boy had suffered an epileptic fit and been removed from school, as Harry knew. Mrs. Franken especially hates selfish little brats that don't share their toys. I do share my toys, little Eddie wailed, tears beginning to run down through the delicate smears of dust on his cheeks. Everybody takes my toys, that's why. So give me your ultra-glide roadster, Harry said. This had been little Eddie's birthday present, given three days previous by a beaming father and a scowling mother. Or I'll tell Mrs. Franken as soon as I get inside that school this fall. Under its layer of grime, little Eddie's face went nearly the same white-gray shade as his hair. An ominous slamming sound came up the stairs. Children, are you messing around up there in the attic? Get down here. We're just sitting in the chairs, Mom, Harry called out. Don't you bust those chairs. Get down here this minute. Little Eddie slid out of his chair and prepared to bolt. I want that car, Harry whispered, and if you don't give it to me, I'll tell Mom you were fooling around with her old clothes. I didn't do nothing, little Eddie wailed and broke for the stairs. Hey, Mom, we didn't break any stuff, honest, Harry yelled. He bought a few minutes more by adding, I'm coming right now, and stood up and went toward a cardboard box filled with interesting books he had noticed the day before his brother's birthday and which had been his goal before he had remembered the roadster and coaxed little lady upstairs. When a short time later Harry came through the door to the attic steps, he was carrying a tattered paperback book. Little Eddie stood quivering with misery and rage just outside the bedroom the two boys shared with their older brother Albert. He held out a small blue metal car, which Harry instantly took and eased into a front pocket of his jeans. When do I get it back? Little Eddie asked. Never, Harry said. Only selfish people want to get presents back. Don't you know anything at all? When Eddie pursed his face up to wail, Harry tapped the book in his hands and said, I got something here that's going to help you with Mrs. Franken, so don't complain. His mother intercepted him as he came down the stairs to the main floor of the little house. Here were the kitchen and living room, both floored with faded linoleum, the actual junk room separated by a stiff brown woolen curtain from the little makeshift room where Edgar Beavers slept, and the larger bedroom reserved for Mary Rose. Children were never permitted more than a few steps within this awful chamber, for they might disarrange Mary Rose's mysterious papers, 
or interfere with the rows of antique dolls on the window seat, which was the sole, much revered architectural distinction of the beaver's house. Mary Rose Beaver stood at the bottom of the stairs, glaring suspiciously up at her fourth son. She did not ever look like a woman who played with dolls, and she did not look that way now. Her hair was twisted into a knot at the back of her head. Smoke from her cigarette curled up past the big glasses like bird's wings, which magnified her eyes. Harry thrust his hand into his pocket and curled his fingers protectively around the ultra-glide roadster. "'Those things up there are the possessions of my family,' she said. "'Show me what you took.' Harry shrugged and held out the paperback as he came down within striking range. His mother snatched it from him and tilted her head to see its cover through the cigarette smoke. Oh, this is from that little box of books up there? Your father used to pretend to read books. She squinted at the print on the cover. Hypnosis made easy. Some drugstore trash. You want to read this? Harry nodded. I don't suppose it can hurt you much. She negligently passed the book back to him. People in society read books, you know. I used to read a lot, back before I got stuck here with a bunch of dummies. My father had a lot of books. Mary Rose nearly touched the top of Harry's head, then snatched back her hand. You're my scholar, Harry. You're the one who's going places. I'm going to do good in school next year he said. Well, you're going to do well, as long as you don't ruin every chance you have by speaking like your father. Harry felt that particular pain composed of scorn, shame, and terror that filled him when Mary Rose spoke of his father in this way. He mumbled something that sounded like acquiescence, and moved a few steps sideways and around her. 2. The porch of the beaver's house extended six feet on either side of the front door, and was the repository for furniture either too large to be crammed into the junk room or too humble to be enshrined in the attic. A sagging porch swing sat beneath the living room window, to the left of an ancient couch whose imitation green leather had been repaired with black duct tape. On the other side of the front door, through which Harry Beavers now emerged, stood a useless icebox, dating from the earliest days of the Beavers' marriage, and two unsteady camp chairs Edgar Beavers had won in a card game. These had never been allowed into the house. Unofficially, this side of the porch was Harry's father's, and thereby had an entirely different atmosphere, defeated, lawless, and shameful, from the side with the swing and couch. Harry knelt down in neutral territory directly before the front door, and fished the ultra-glide roadster from his pocket. He placed the hypnotism book on the porch and rolled the little metal car across its top. Then he gave the car a hard shove and watched it clunk nose down onto the wood. He repeated this several times before moving the book aside, flattening himself out on his stomach, and giving the little car a decisive push toward the swing and the couch. The roadster rolled a few feet before an irregular board tilted it over on its side and stopped it. You dumb car, Harry said, and retrieved it. He gave it another push, deeper into his mother's realm. A stiff, brittle section of paint, which had separated from its board, cracked in half and rested atop the stalled roadster like a miniature mattress. Harry knocked off the chip of paint and sent the car backwards down the porch, where it flipped over again and skidded into the side of the icebox. The boy ran down the porch and this time simply hurled the little car back in the direction of the swing. It bounced off the swing's padding and fell heavily to the wood. Harry knelt before the icebox, panting. His whole head felt funny, as if wet hot towels had been stuffed inside it. Harry picked himself up and walked across to where the car lay before the swing. He hated the way it looked, small and helpless. He experimentally stepped on the car and felt it pressing into the undersole of his moccasin. Harry raised his other foot and stood on the car, but nothing happened. He jumped on the car, but the moccasin was no better than his bare foot. Harry bent down to pick up the roadster. You dumb little car, he said. You're no good anyhow, you low-class little jerky thing. He turned it over in his hands. 
Then he inserted his thumbs between the frame and one of the little tires. When he pushed, the tire moved. His face heated. He mashed his thumbs against the tire, and the little black doughnut popped into the tall, thick weeds before the porch. Breathing hard, more from emotion than exertion, Harry popped the other front tire into the weeds. Harry whirled around and ground the car into the wall beside his father's bedroom window. Long, deep scratches appeared in the paint. When Harry peered at the top of the car, it too was scratched. He found a nail head which protruded a quarter of an inch out from the front of the house and scraped a long paring of blue paint off the driver's side of the roadster. Gray metal shone through. Harry slammed the car several times against the edge of the nail head, chipping off small quantities of paint. Panting, he popped off the two small rear tires and put them in his pocket, because he liked the way they looked. Without tires, well scratched and dented, the Ultra Glide Roadster had lost most of its power. Harry looked it over with a bitter, deep satisfaction, and walked across the porch and shoved it far into the nest of weeds. Gray metal and blue paint shone at him from within the stalks and leaves. Harry thrust his hands into their midst and swept his arms back and forth. The car tumbled away and fell into invisibility. When Mary Rose appeared, scowling on the porch, Harry was seated serenely on the squeaking swing, looking at the first few pages of the paperback book. "'What are you doing? What was all that banging?' "'I'm just reading. I didn't hear anything.' Harry said. Three. Well, if it isn't the shitbird, Albert said, jumping up the porch steps thirty minutes later. His face and T-shirt bore broad black stripes of grease. Short, muscular, and thirteen, Albert spent every possible minute hanging around the gas station two blocks from their house. Harry knew that Albert despised him. Albert raised a fist and made a jerky, threatening motion toward Harry, who flinched. Albert had often beaten him bloody, as had their two older brothers, Sonny and George, now at army bases in Oklahoma and Germany. Like Albert, his two oldest brothers had seriously disappointed their mother. Albert laughed, and this time swung his fist within a couple of inches of Harry's face. On the backswing he knocked the book from Harry's hands. Thanks, Harry said. Albert smirked and disappeared around the front door. Almost immediately, Harry could hear his mother beginning to shout about the grease on Albert's face and clothes. Albert thumped up the stairs. Harry opened his clenched fingers and spread them wide, closed his hands into fists, then spread them wide again. When he heard the bedroom door slam shut upstairs, he was able to get off the swing and pick up the book. Being around Albert made him feel like a spring coiled up in a box. From the upper rear of the house— Little Eddie emitted a ghostly wail. Mary Rose screamed that she was going to start smacking him if he didn't shut up, and that was that. The three unhappy lives within the house fell back into silence. Harry sat down, found his page, and began reading again. A man named Dr. Roland Mentane had written Hypnosis Made Easy, and his vocabulary was much larger than Harry's. Dr. Mentane used words like orchestrate and ineffable and enhance, and some of his sentences wound their way through so many subordinate clauses that Harry lost his way. Yet Harry, who had begun the book only half expecting that he would comprehend anything in it at all, found it a wonderful book. He had made it most of the way through the chapter called Mind Power. Harry thought it was neat that hypnosis could cure smoking, stuttering, and bedwetting. He himself had wet the bed almost nightly, until months after his ninth birthday. The bedwetting stopped the night a certain lovely dream came to Harry. In the dream he had to urinate terribly, and was hurrying down a stony castle corridor, past suits of armor and torches guttering on the walls. At last Harry reached an open door, through which he saw the most splendid bathroom of his life. The floors were of polished marble, the walls white-tiled. As soon as he entered the gleaming bathroom, a uniformed butler waved him toward the rack of urinals. Harry began pulling down his zipper, fumbled with himself, and got his penis out of his underpants just in time. As the dream urine gushed out of him, 
Harry had blessedly awakened. Hypnotism could get you right inside someone's mind and let you do things there. You could make a person speak in any foreign language they'd ever heard, even if they'd only heard it once. And you could make them act like a baby. Harry considered how pleasurable it would be to make his brother Albert lie squalling and red-faced on the floor, unable to walk or speak, as he pissed all over himself. Also, and this was a new thought to Harry, you could take a person back to a whole row of lives they had led before they were born as the person they were now. This process of rebirth was called reincarnation. Some of Dr. Mantain's patients had been kings in Egypt and pirates in the Caribbean. Some had been murderers, novelists, and artists. They remembered the houses they lived in, the names of their mothers and servants and children, the locations of shops where they'd bought cake and wine. Neat stuff, Harry thought. He wondered if someone who had been a famous murderer a long time ago could remember pushing in the knife or bringing down the hammer. A lot of the books remaining in the little cardboard box upstairs, Harry had noticed, seemed to be about murderers. It would not be any use to take Albert back to a previous life, however. If Albert had any previous lives, he had spent them as inanimate objects on the order of boulders and anvils. Maybe in another life Albert was a murder weapon, Harry thought. Hey, college boy! Joe College! Harry looked toward the sidewalk and saw the baseball cap and t-shirted gut of Mr. Petrosian, who lived in a tiny house next to the tavern on the corner of South Sixth and Livermore Street. Mr. Petrosian was always shouting genial things at kids, but Mary Rose wouldn't let Harry or little Eddie talk to him. She said Mr. Petrosian was common as dirt. He worked as a janitor in the telephone building and drank a case of beer every night while he sat on his porch. Me? Harry said. Yeah. Keep reading books, and you could go to college, right? Harry smiled noncommittally. Mr. Petrosian lifted a wide arm and continued to toil down the street toward his house next to the idle hour. In seconds, Mary Rose burst through the door, folding an old white dish towel in her hands. Who was that? I heard a man's voice. Him, Harry said, pointing at the substantial back of Mr. Petrosian, now half of the way home. What did he say? As if it could possibly be interesting, coming from an Armenian janitor. He called me Joe College. Mary Rose startled him by smiling. Albert says he wants to go back to the station tonight, and I have to go to work soon. Mary Rose worked the night shift as a secretary at St. Joseph's Hospital. God knows when your father will show up. Get something to eat for little Eddie and yourself, will you, Harry? I've just got too many things to take care of, as usual. I'll get something at Big John's. This was a hamburger stand, a magical place to Harry, erected the summer before in a vacant lot on Livermore Street, two blocks down from the idle hour. His mother handed him two carefully folded dollar bills, and he pushed them into his pocket. Don't let little Eddie stay in the house alone, his mother said before going back inside. Take him with you. You know how scared he gets. Sure, Harry said, and went back to his book. He finished the chapter on mind power, while first Mary Rose left to stand up at the bus stop on the corner, and then Albert noisily departed. Little Eddie sat frozen before his soap operas in the living room. Harry turned a page and started reading Techniques of Hypnosis. 4. At 8.30 that night the two boys sat alone in the kitchen, on opposite sides of the table covered in yellow bamboo formica. From the living room came the sound of Sid Caesar babbling in fake German to Imogene Coca on your show of shows. Little Eddie claimed to be scared of Sid Caesar, but when Harry had returned from the hamburger stand with a big John burger with the works for himself and a Mama Mary dog for Eddie, double fries and two chocolate shakes, he had been sitting in front of the television, his face moist with tears of moral outrage. Eddie usually liked Mama Mary dogs, but he had taken only a couple of meager bites from the one before him now, and was disconsolately pushing a French fry through a blob of ketchup. Every now and then he wiped at his eyes, 
leaving nearly symmetrical smears of ketchup to dry on his cheeks. "'Mom said not to leave me alone in the house,' said little Eddie. "'I heard. It was during the edge of night, and you were on the porch. I think I'm going to tell on you.' He peeped across at Harry, then quickly looked back at the French fry and drew it out of the puddle of ketchup. "'I'm as scared to be alone in the house.' Sometimes Eddie's voice was like a queer, speeded-up mechanical version of Mary Rose's. "'Don't be so dumb,' Harry said, almost kindly. "'How can you be scared in your own house? You live here, don't you?' "'I'm as scared of the attic,' Eddie said. He held the dripping french fry before his mouth and pushed it in. "'The attic makes noise.' A little squirm of red appeared at the corner of his mouth. You were supposed to take me with you. Oh, geez, Eddie, you slow everything down. I wanted to just get the food and come back. I got you your dinner, didn't I? Didn't I get you what you like? In truth, Harry liked hanging around Big John's by himself, because then he could talk to Big John and listen to his theories. Big John called himself a renegade papist and considered Hitler the greatest man of the twentieth century followed closely by Paul the Sixth, Padre Pio, who bled from the palms of his hands, and Elvis Presley. All these events occurred in what is usually but wrongly called a simpler time, before Kennedy and feminism and ecology, before the Nixon presidency and Watergate, and before American soldiers, among them a twenty-one-year-old Harry Beavers, journeyed to Vietnam. I'm still going to tell, said little Eddie. He pushed another French fry into the puddle of ketchup. And that car was my birthday present. He began to snuffle. Albert hit me, and you stole my car, and you left me alone, and I was scared. And I don't want to have Mrs. Franken next year, because I think she's going to hurt me. Harry had nearly forgotten telling his brother about Mrs. Franken and Tommy Gould's, and this reminder brought back very sharply the memory of destroying Eddie's birthday present. Eddie twisted his head sideways and dared another quick look at his brother. "'Can I have my ultra-glide roadster back, Harry? You're going to give it back to me, aren't you? I won't tell Mom you left me alone if you give it back.' "'Your car's okay,' Harry said. "'It's in a sort of a secret place, I know.' "'You hurt my car!' Eddie squalled. You did! Shut up! Harry shouted, and little Eddie flinched. You're driving me crazy! Harry yelled. He realized that he was leaning over the table and that little Eddie was getting ready to cry again. He sat down. Just don't scream at me like that, Eddie. You did something to my car! Eddie said with a stunned certainty. I knew it! Look, I'll prove your car is okay. Harry said, and took the two rear tires from his pocket and displayed them on his palm. Little Eddie stared. He blinked, then reached out tentatively for the tires. Harry closed his fist around them. Do they look like I did anything to them? You took them off! But don't they look okay? Don't they look fine? Harry opened his fist, closed it again, and returned the tires to his pocket. I didn't want to show you the whole car, Eddie, because you'd get all worked up. And you gave it to me, remember? I wanted to show you the tires so you'd see everything was all right, okay? Got it? Eddie miserably shook his head. Anyway, I'm going to help you, just like I said. With Mrs. Franken? A fraction of his misery left little Eddie's smeary face. Sure. You ever hear of something called... Hypnotism? I heard a hypnotism. Little Eddie was sulking. Everybody in the whole world heard of that. Hypnotism, stupid, not hypnotism. Sure, hypnotism. I saw it on the TV. They did it on As the World Turns. A man made a lady go to sleep and think she was going to have a baby. Harry smiled. That's just TV, little Eddie. Real hypnotism is a lot better than that. I read all about it in one of the books from the attic. Little Eddie was still sulky because of the car. 
So what makes it better? Because it lets you do amazing things, Harry said. He called on Dr. Mentane. Hypnosis unlocks your mind and lets you use all the power you really have. If you start now, you'll really knock those books when school starts up again. You'll pass every test Mrs. Franken gives you, just like the way I did. He reached across the table and grasped little Eddie's wrist, stalling a fat brown french fry on its way to the puddle. But it won't just make you good in school. If you let me try it on you, I'm pretty sure I can show you that you're a lot stronger than you think you are. Eddie blinked. And I bet I can make you so you're not scared of anything anymore. Hypnotism is real good for that. I read in this book there was this guy who was afraid of bridges. Whenever he even thought about crossing a bridge, he got all dizzy and sweaty. Terrible stuff happened to him, like he lost his job, and once he just had to ride in a car across a bridge and he dumped a load in his pants. He went to see Dr. Mentane, and Dr. Mentane hypnotized him and said he would never be afraid of bridges again, and he wasn't. Harry pulled the paperback from his hip pocket. He opened it flat on the table and bent over the pages. Here, listen to this. Benefits of the course of treatment were found in all areas of the patient's life, and results were obtained for which he would have paid any price. Harry read these words haltingly, but with complete understanding. Hypnotism can make me strong? Little Eddie asked, evidently having saved this point in his head. Strong as a bull. Strong as Albert? A lot stronger than Albert. A lot stronger than me, too. And I can beat up on big guys that hurt me? You just have to learn how. Eddie sprang up from the chair, yelling nonsense. He flexed his string-like biceps, and for some time twisted his body into a series of muscle-man poses. "'You want to do it?' Harry finally asked. Little Eddie popped into his chair and stared at Harry. His T-shirt's neckband sagged all the way to his breastbone without ever actually touching his chest. "'I want to start.' "'Okay, Eddie, good man.' Harry stood up and put his hand on the book. Up to the attic. Only I don't want to go in the attic, Eddie said. He was still staring at Harry, but his head was tilted over like a weird little echo of Mary Rose, and his eyes had filled with suspicion. I'm not going to take anything from you, little Eddie, Harry said. It's just we should be out of everybody's way. The attic's real quiet. Little Eddie stuck his hand inside his T-shirt and let his arm dangle from the wrist. You turned your shirt into an armrest, Harry said. Eddie jerked his hand out of its sling. Albert might come waltzing in and wreck everything if we do it in the bedroom. If you go up first and turn on the lights, Eddie said. Five. Harry held the book open on his lap and glanced from it to little Eddie's tense, smeary face. He had read these pages over many times while he sat on the porch. Hypnotism boiled down to a few simple steps, each of which led to the next. The first thing he had to do was to get his brother started right. Relaxed and receptive, according to Dr. Mentane. Little Eddie stirred in his cane-back chair and kneaded his hands together. His shadow, cast by the bulb dangling overhead, imitated him like a black little chair-bound monkey. I want to get started. I want to get to be strong he said. Right here in this book it says you have to be relaxed, Harry said. Just put your hands on top of your legs, nice and easy, with your fingers pointing forward. Then close your eyes and breathe in and out a couple of times. Think about being nice and tired and ready to go to sleep. I don't want to go to sleep. It's not really sleep, little Eddie. It's just sort of like it. You'll still really be awake, but nice and relaxed. Or else it won't work. You have to do everything I tell you. Otherwise everybody will still be able to beat up on you, like they do now. I want you to pay attention to everything I say. Okay. Little Eddie made a visible effort to relax. 
He placed his hands on his thighs and twice inhaled and exhaled. Now close your eyes. Eddie closed his eyes. Harry suddenly knew that it was going to work. If he did everything the book said, he would really be able to hypnotize his brother. Little Eddie, I want you just to listen to the sound of my voice, he said, forcing himself to be calm. You are already getting nice and relaxed, as easy and peaceful as if you were lying in bed, and the more you listen to my voice, the more relaxed and tired you are going to get. Nothing can bother you. Everything bad is far away, and you're just sitting here, breathing in and out, getting nice and sleepy. He checked his page to make sure he was doing it right, and then went on. It's like lying in bed, Eddie, and the more you hear my voice, the more tired and sleepy you're getting. A little more sleepy the more you hear me. Everything else is sort of fading away, and all you can hear is my voice. You feel tired, but good, just like the way you do right before you fall asleep. Everything is fine, and you're drifting a little bit, drifting and drifting, and you're getting ready to raise your right hand. He leaned over and very lightly stroked the back of little Eddie's grimy right hand. Eddie sat slumped in the chair with his eyes closed, breathing shallowly. Harry spoke very slowly. I'm going to count backwards from ten, and every time I get to another number, your hand is going to get lighter and lighter. When I count, your right hand is going to get so light it floats up and finally touches your nose when you hear me say, One. And then you'll be in a deep sleep. Now I'm starting. Ten. Your hand is already feeling light. Nine. It wants to float up. Eight. Your hand really feels light now. It's going to start to go up now. Seven. Little Eddie's hand obediently floated an inch up from his thigh. Six. The grimy little hand rose another few inches. It's getting lighter and lighter now, and every time I say another number, it gets closer and closer to your nose, and you get sleepier and sleepier. Five. The hand ascended several inches nearer Eddie's face. Four. The hand now dangled like a sleeping bird half of the way between Eddie's knee and his nose. Three. It rose nearly to Eddie's chin. Two. Eddie's hand hung a few inches from his mouth. One. You are going to fall asleep now. The gently curved, ketchup-streaked forefinger delicately brushed the tip of little Eddie's nose and stayed there while Eddie sagged against the back of the chair. Harry's heart beat so loudly that he feared the sound would bring Eddie out of his trance. Eddie remained motionless. Harry breathed quietly by himself for a moment. Now you can lower your hand to your lap, Eddie. You are going deeper and deeper into sleep. Deeper and deeper and deeper. Eddie's hand sank gracefully downward. The attic seemed hot as the inside of a furnace to Harry. His fingers left blotches on the open pages of the book. He wiped his face on his sleeve and looked at his little brother. Little Eddie had slumped so far down in the chair that his head was no longer visible in the tilting mirror. Perfectly still and quiet, the attic stretched out on all sides of them, waiting, or so it seemed to Harry, for what would happen next. Mary Rose's trunks sat in rows under the eaves far behind the mirror. Her old dresses hung silently within the dusty wardrobe. Harry rubbed his hands on his jeans to dry them and flicked a page over with the neatness of an old scholar who had spent half his life in libraries. You're going to sit up straight in your chair, he said. Eddie pulled himself upright. Now I want to show you that you're really hypnotized, little Eddie. It's like a test. I want you to hold your right arm straight out before you. Make it as rigid as you can. This is going to show you how strong you can be. 
Eddie's pale arm rose and straightened to the wrist, leaving his fingers dangling. Harry stood up and said, That's pretty good. He walked the two steps to Eddie's side and grasped his brother's arm and ran his fingers down the length of it, gently straightening Eddie's hand. Now I want you to imagine that your arm is getting harder and harder. It's getting as hard and rigid as an iron bar. Your whole arm is an iron bar, and nobody on earth could bend it. Eddie, it's stronger than Superman's arm. He removed his hands and stepped back. Now, this arm is so strong and rigid that you can't bend it no matter how hard you try. It's an iron bar, and nobody on earth could bend it. Try. Try to bend it. Eddie's face tightened up, and his arm rose perhaps two degrees. Eddie grunted with invisible effort, unable to bend his arm. Okay, Eddie, you did real good. Now your arm is loosening up, and when I count backwards from ten, it's going to get looser and looser. When I get to one, your arm will be normal again. He began counting, and Eddie's fingers loosened and drooped, and finally the arm came to rest again on his leg. Harry went back to his chair, sat down, and looked at Eddie with great satisfaction. Now he was certain that he would be able to do the next demonstration, which Dr. Mentane called the chair exercise. Now you know that this stuff really works, Eddie, so we're going to do something a little harder. I want you to stand up in front of your chair. Eddie obeyed. Harry stood up, too, and moved his chair forward and to the side, so that its cane seat faced Eddie about four feet away. I want you to stretch out between these chairs with your head on your chair and your feet on mine, and I want you to keep your hands at your sides. Eddie hunkered down uncomplainingly and settled his head back on the seat of his chair. Supporting himself with his arms, he raised one leg and placed his foot on Harry's chair. Then he lifted the other foot. Difficulty immediately appeared in his face. He raised his arms and clamped them in so that he looked trussed. Now your whole body is slowly becoming as hard as iron, Eddie. Your entire body is one of the strongest things on earth. Nothing can make it bend. You could hold yourself there forever and never feel the slightest pain or discomfort. It's like you're lying on a mattress. You're so strong. The expression of strain left Eddie's face. Slowly his arms extended and relaxed. He lay propped string straight between the two chairs, so at ease that he did not even appear to be breathing. While I talk to you, you're getting stronger and stronger. You could hold up anything. You could hold up an elephant. I'm going to sit down on your stomach to prove it. Cautiously, Harry seated himself down on his brother's midriff. He raised his legs. Nothing happened. After he had counted slowly to fifteen, Harry lowered his legs and stood. I'm going to take my shoes off now, Eddie, and stand on you. He hurried over to a piano stool embroidered with fulsome roses and carried it back. Then he slipped off his moccasins and stepped on top of the stool. As Harry stepped on top of Eddie's exposed thin belly, the chair supporting his brother's head wobbled. Harry stood stock still for a moment, but the chair held. He lifted the other foot from the stool. No movement from the chair. He set the other foot on his brother. Little Eddie effortlessly held him up. Harry lifted himself experimentally up on his toes and came back down on his heels. Eddie seemed entirely unaffected. Then Harry jumped perhaps half an inch into the air. And since Eddie did not even grunt when he landed, he kept jumping five, six, seven, eight times until he was breathing hard. You're amazing, little Eddie, he said, and stepped off onto the stool. Now you can begin to relax. You can put your feet on the floor. Then I want you to sit back up in your chair. Your body doesn't feel stiff any more. Little Eddie had been rather tentatively lowering one foot, but as soon as Harry finished speaking, he buckled in the middle and thumped his bottom on the floor. Harry's chair, Mary Rose's chair, sickeningly tipped over.
but landed soundlessly on a neat woolen stack of layered winter coats. Moving like a robot, little Eddie slowly sat upright on the floor. His eyes were open but unfocused. You can stand up now and get back in your chair, Harry said. He did not remember leaving the stool, but he had left it. Sweat ran into his eyes. He pressed his face into his shirt sleeve. For a second, panic had brightly beckoned. Little Eddie was sleepwalking back to his chair. When he sat down, Harry said, Close your eyes. You're going deeper and deeper into sleep. Deeper and deeper, little Eddie. Eddie settled into the chair as if nothing had happened, and Harry reverently set his own chair upright again. Then he picked up the book and opened it. The print swam before his eyes. Harry shook his head and looked again, but still the lines of print snaked across the page. When Harry was a sophomore at Adelphi College, he was asked to read several poems by Guillaume Apollinaire, and the appearance of the wavering lines on the page brought back this moment with a terrible precision. Harry pressed the palms of his hands against his eyes, and red patterns exploded across his vision. He removed his hands from his eyes, blinked, and found that although the lines of print were now behaving themselves, he no longer wanted to go on. The attic was too hot, he was too tired, and the toppling of the chair had been too close a brush with actual disaster. But for a time he leafed purposefully through the book while Eddie tranced on, and then found the subheading, Post-Hypnotic Suggestion. Little Eddie, we're just going to do one more thing. If we ever do this again, it'll help us go faster. Harry shut the book. He knew exactly how this went. He would even use the same phrase Dr. Mentane used with his patients. Blue Rose. Harry did not quite know why, but he liked the sound of that. I'm going to tell you a phrase, Eddie, and from now on, whenever you hear me say this phrase, you will instantly go back to sleep and be hypnotized again. The phrase is, Blue Rose, Blue Rose. When you hear me say Blue Rose, you will go right to sleep, just the way you are now, and we can make you stronger again. Blue Rose is our secret, Eddie, because nobody else knows it. What is it? Blue Rose, Eddie said in a muffled voice. Okay, I'm going to count backward from ten, and when I get to one... You will be wide awake again. You will not remember anything we did, but you will feel happy and strong. Ten? As Harry counted backwards, little Eddie twitched and stirred, let his arms fall to his sides, thumped one foot carelessly on the floor, and at one opened his eyes. Did it work? What'd I do? Am I strong? You're a bull, Harry said. It's getting late, Eddie. Time to go downstairs. Harry's timing was accurate enough to be uncomfortable. As soon as the two boys closed the attic door behind them, they heard the front door slide open and a cacophony of harsh coughs and subdued mutterings, followed by the sound of unsteady footsteps, proceeding to the bathroom. Edgar Beavers was home. 6. Late that night the three homebound Beavers' sons— lay in their separate beds in the good-sized second-floor room next to the attic stairs. Directly above Mary Rose's bedroom, its dimensions were nearly identical to it, except that the boys' room, the dorm, had no window seat, and the attic stairs shaved a couple of feet from Harry's end. When the other two boys had lived at home, Harry and little Eddie had slept together. Albert had slept in a bed with Sonny, and only George, who at the time of his induction into the army had been six feet tall and weighed two hundred and one pounds, had slept alone. In those days, Sonny had often managed to make Albert cry out in the middle of the night. The very idea of George could still make Harry's stomach freeze. Though it was now very late, enough light from the street came in through the thin white net curtains to give complex shadows to the bunched muscles of Albert's upper arms as he lay stretched out atop his sheets. The voices of Mary Rose and Edgar Beavers, one approximately sober and the other unmistakably drunk, 
came clearly up the stairs and through the open door. Who says I waste my time? I don't say that. I don't waste my time. I suppose you think you've done a good day's work when you spell a bartender for a couple of hours and then drink up your wages. That's the story of your life, Edgar Beavers, and it's a sad, sad story of W-A-S-T-E. If my father could have seen what would become of you, I ain't so damn bad. You ain't so damn good, either. Albert. Eddie said softly from his bed between his two brothers. As if galvanized by little Eddie's voice, Albert suddenly sat up in bed, leaned forward, and reached out to try to smack Eddie with his fist. I didn't do nothing, Harry said, and moved to the edge of his mattress. The blow had been for him, he knew, not Eddie, except that Albert was too lazy to get up. I hate your lousy guts, Albert said. If I wasn't too tired to get out of this here bed, I'd pound your face in. Harry stole my birthday car, Albert, Eddie said. Make him give me it back. One day, Mary Rose said from downstairs, at the end of the summer when I was seventeen, late in the afternoon, my father said to my mother, Honey, I believe I'm going to take out our pretty little Mary Rose and get her something special and he called up to me from the drawing-room to make myself pretty and get set to go. And because my father was a gentleman and a man of his word, I got ready in two shakes. My father was wearing a very handsome brown suit and a red bow-tie and his boater. I remember just like I can see it now. He stood at the bottom of the staircase, waiting for me, and when I came down, he took my arm, and we just went out that front door like a courting couple. Down the stone walk, which my father put in all by himself, even though he was a white-collar worker, down Majeski Street, arm in arm, down to South Palmyra Avenue. In those days, all the best people, all the people who counted, did their shopping on South Palmyra Avenue. I'd like to knock your teeth down your throat, Albert said to Harry. Albert, he took my birthday car, he really did, and I want it back. I'm a scared he busted it. I want it back so much I'm going to die. Albert propped himself up on an elbow, and for the first time really looked at little Eddie. Eddie whimpered. You're such a twerp, Albert said. I wish you would die, Eddie. I wish you'd just drop dead so we could stick you in the ground and forget about you. I wouldn't even cry at your funeral. Probably I wouldn't even be able to remember your name. I'd just say, Oh, yeah, he was that little creepy kid used to hang around crying all the time. Glad he's dead, whatever his name was. Eddie had turned his back on Albert and was weeping softly, his unwashed face distorted by the shadows into an uncanny image of the mask of tragedy. You know, I really wouldn't mind if you dropped dead, Albert mused. You neither, shitbird. Realized he was taking me to Alouette's. I'm sure you used to look in their windows when you were a little boy. You remember Alouette's, don't you? There's never been anything so beautiful as that store. When I was a little girl and lived in the big house, all the best people used to go there. My father marched me right inside, with his arm around me, and took me up in the elevator, and we went straight to the lady who managed the dress department. Give my little girl the best, he said. Price was no object. Quality was all he cared about. Give my little girl the best. Are you listening to me, Edgar? Albert snored face down into his pillow. Little Eddie twitched and snuffled. Harry lay awake for so long he thought he would never get to sleep. Before him he kept seeing little Eddie's face, all slack and dopey under hypnosis. Little Eddie's face made him feel hot and uncomfortable. Now that Harry was lying down in bed, it seemed to him that everything he had done since returning from Big John's seemed really to have been done by someone else, or to have been done in a dream. Then he realized that he had to use the bathroom. Harry slid out of bed, quietly crossed the room, went out onto the dark landing, 
and felt his way downstairs to the bathroom. When he emerged, the bathroom light showed him the squat black shape of the telephone atop the Palmyra directory. Harry moved to the low telephone table beside the stairs. He lifted the phone from the directory and opened the book, the width of a big five tablet, with his other hand. As he had done on many other nights when his bladder forced him downstairs, Harry leaned over the page and selected a number. He kept the number in his head as he closed the directory and replaced the telephone. He dialed. The number rang so often Harry lost count. At last a hoarse voice answered. Harry said, I'm watching you, and you're a dead man. He softly replaced the receiver in the cradle. 7. Harry caught up with his father the next afternoon, just as Edgar Beavers had begun to move up South 6th Street toward the corner of Livermore. His father wore his usual costume of baggy gray trousers cinched far above his waist by a belt with a double buckle, a red and white plaid shirt, and a brown felt hat stationed low over his eyes. His long fleshy nose swam before him, cut in half by the shadow of the hat brim. Dad! His father glanced incuriously at him, then put his hands back in his pockets. He turned sideways and kept walking down the street, though perhaps a shade more slowly. What's up, kid? No school? It's summer. There isn't any school. I just thought I'd come with you for a little. Well, I ain't doing much. Your ma asked me to pick up some Hamburg on Livermore, and I thought I'd slip into the idle hour for a quick belt. You won't turn me in, will you? No. You ain't a bad kid, Harry. Your ma's just got a lot of worries. I worry about little Eddie, too, sometimes. Sure. What's with the books? You read when you walk? I was just sort of looking at them, Harry said. His father insinuated his hand beneath Harry's left elbow and extracted two luridly jacketed paperback books. They were titled Murder Incorporated and Hitler's Death Camps. Harry already loved both of these books. His father grunted and handed Murder Incorporated back to him. He raised the other book nearly to the tip of his nose and peered at the cover, which depicted a naked woman pressing herself against a wall of barbed wire while a uniformed Nazi aimed a rifle at her back. Looking up at his father, Harry saw that beneath the harsh line of shadow cast by the hat brim, his father's whiskers grew in different colors and patterns. Black and brown, red and orange, the glistening spikes swirled across his father's cheek. I bought this book, but it didn't look nothing like that, his father said and returned the book. What didn't? That place. Dachau. That death camp. How do you know? I was there, wasn't I? You wasn't even born then. It didn't look anything like that picture on that book. It just looked like a piece of shit to me, like most of the places I saw when I was in the army. This was the first time Harry had heard that his father had been in the service. You mean you were in World War II? Yeah, I was in the big one. They made me a corporal over there. Had me a nickname, too. Beans. Beans Beavers. And I got a purple heart from the time I got an infection. You saw Dachau with your own eyes? Damn straight I did. He bent down suddenly. Hey, don't let your ma catch you reading that book. Secretly pleased, Harry shook his head. Now the book and the death camp were a bond between himself and his father. Did you ever kill anybody? His father wiped his mouth and both cheeks with one long hand. Harry saw a considering eye far back in the shadow of the brim. I killed a guy once. A long pause. I shot him in the back. His father wiped his mouth again and then motioned forward with his head. He had to get to the bar, the butcher, and back again in a very carefully defined period of time. You really want to hear this? Harry nodded. He swallowed. I guess you'd do it that. 
Okay, we were sent into this camp, Dachau, at the end of the war to process the prisoners and arrest the guards and the commandant. Everything was all arranged. A bunch of brass hats from division were going to come on an inspection, so we had to wait there a couple days. We had these guards lined up, see, and these skinny old wrecks would come up and give them hell. We wasn't supposed to let them get too near. They were passing Mr. Petrosian's little tar-paper house, and Harry felt a spasm of relief that Mr. Petrosian was not out on his tiny porch working on his case of beer. The idle hour was only a few paces ahead. Anyhow, one of these guards, one of the worst ones, suddenly decided he's going to run for it. He takes off, running like crazy toward the woods. What do I do? I ask. Nobody knows what the hell to do. Shoot him, somebody says. So I shot him in the back. That was all she wrote. Now they had reached the screen door which led into the idle hour, and the smells of malt and hops filled the air. See you back at the house, his father said, and disappeared through the screen door like a magician. 8. After Harry had read a hundred pages of Murder Incorporated, his favorite murderers were Louis Lepke Buckhalter and Abe Kid Twist Rellis. They were dependable professionals. A kind of black light surrounded them and made them glitter. Lepke Buckalter and Abe Rellis looked out at the world from the shadows of their hat brims. They lived in shadowy rooms and peered out through the curtains. They appeared on a dark corner before their terrified victim, did their work, and walked away, turning up their coat collars. Suppose you had some kind of job that took you around the country, like a salesman's job. Harry thought as he read away the afternoon in the porch swing. Suppose you had a job that took you from one town to another. Suppose you killed someone in each one of those towns, carefully and quietly, and hid the bodies so it would take people a long time to find them. Your work would never be done. 9. Blue Rose, Harry said. Little Eddie sagged open-mouthed against the cane of his chair, his hands loose in his lap. It had worked. Harry looked around as if he expected applause, and did feel that all the things in the attic looked back at him with warm approval. It was nine-thirty at night. He and Eddie, alone in the house, occupied the attic in perfect safety. Harry wanted to see if he could put other people under and make them do things. But for now, for tonight, he was content to experiment with Eddie. You're going deeper and deeper asleep, Eddie. Deeper and deeper. And you're listening to every word I say. You're just sinking down and down, hearing my voice come to you, going deeper and deeper with every word. And now you are real deep asleep and ready to begin. Little Eddie sat sprawled over Mary Rose's cane-back chair his chin touching his chest and his little pink mouth drooping open. He looked like a slightly undersized seven-year-old, like a second grader instead of the fourth grader he would be when he joined Mrs. Franken's class in the fall. Suddenly he reminded Harry of the ultra-glide roadster, scratched and dented and stripped of its tires. Tonight you're going to see how strong you really are. Sit up, Eddie. Eddie pulled himself upright and closed his mouth almost comically obedient. Harry thought it would be fun to make little Eddie believe he was a dog and trot around the attic on all fours, barking and lifting his leg. Then he saw little Eddie staggering across the attic, his tongue bulging out of his mouth, his own hands squeezing and squeezing his throat. Maybe he would try that, too, after he had done several other exercises he had discovered in Dr. Mentane's book. He checked the underside of his collar, or maybe the fifth time that evening, and felt the long, thin shaft of the pearl-headed hat-pin. He had stopped reading Murder Incorporated long enough to smuggle out of Mary Rose's bedroom after she had left for work. "'Eddie,' he said, "'now you are very deeply asleep, and you will be able to do everything I say. I want you to hold your right arm straight out in front of you. 
Eddie stuck his arm out like a poker. That's good, Eddie. Now I want you to notice that all the feeling is leaving that arm. It's getting number and number. It doesn't even feel like flesh and blood anymore. It feels like it's made out of steel or something. It's so numb that you can't feel anything there anymore. You can't even feel pain in it. Harry stood up, went toward Eddie, and brushed his fingers along his arm. You didn't feel anything, did you? No, Eddie said in a slow, gravel-filled voice. Do you feel anything now? Harry pinched the underside of Eddie's forearm. No. Now? Harry used his nails to pinch the side of Eddie's biceps hard and left purple dents in the skin. No, Eddie repeated. How about this? He slapped his hand against Eddie's forearm as hard as he could. There was a sharp, loud smacking sound, and his fingers tingled. If little Eddie had not been hypnotized, he would have tried to screech down the walls. No, Eddie said. Harry pulled the hat pin out of his collar and inspected his brother's arm. You're doing great, little Eddie. You're stronger than anybody in your whole class. You're probably stronger than the whole rest of the school. He turned Eddie's arm so that the palm was up and the white forearm, slightly traced by small blue veins, faced him. Harry delicately ran the point of the hat pin down Eddie's pale veined forearm. The pinpoint left a narrow chalk-white scratch in its wake. For a moment Harry felt the floor of the attic sway beneath his feet. Then he closed his eyes and jabbed the hat pin into little Eddie's skin as hard as he could. He opened his eyes. The floor was still swaying beneath him. From little Eddie's lower arm protruded six inches of the eight-inch hat pin, the mother-of-pearl head glistening softly in the light from the overhead bulb. A drop of blood the size of a watermelon seed stood on Eddie's skin. Harry moved back to his chair and sat down heavily. Do you feel anything? No, Eddie said again in that surprisingly deep voice. Harry stared at the hat pin embedded in Eddie's arm. The oval drop of blood lengthened itself out against the white skin and began slowly to ooze toward Eddie's wrist. Harry watched it advance across the pale underside of Eddie's forearm. Finally he stood up and returned to Eddie's side. The elongated drop of blood had ceased moving. Harry bent over and twanged the hat pin. Eddie could feel nothing. Harry put his thumb and forefinger on the glistening head of the pin. His face was so hot he might have been standing before an open fire. He pushed the pin a further half-inch into Eddie's arm, and another small quantity of blood welled up from the base. The pin seemed to be moving in Harry's grasp, pulsing back and forth, as if it were breathing. Okay, Harry said. Okay. He tightened his hold on the pin and pulled. It slipped easily from the wound. Harry held the hat pin before his face, just as a doctor holds up a thermometer to read a temperature. He had imagined that the entire bottom section of the shaft would be painted with red, but saw that only a single winding glutinous streak of blood adhered to the pin. For a dizzy second he thought of slipping the end of the pin in his mouth and sucking it clean. He thought, Maybe in another life I was Lepke Buckhalter. He pulled his handkerchief, a filthy square of red paisley, from his front pocket and wiped the streak of blood from the shaft of the pen. Then he leaned over and gently wiped the red smear from little Eddie's underarm. Harry refolded the handkerchief so the blood would not show, wiped sweat from his face, and shoved the grubby cloth back into his pocket. That was good, Eddie. Now we're going to do something a little bit different. He knelt down beside his brother and lifted Eddie's nearly weightless, delicately veined arm. You still can't feel a thing in this arm, Eddie. It's completely numb. It's sound asleep, and it won't wake up until I tell it to. Harry repositioned himself in order to hold himself steady while he knelt and put the point of the hat pin nearly flat against Eddie's arm. 
He pushed it forward far enough to raise a wrinkle of flesh. The point of the hat pin dug into Eddie's skin, but did not break it. Harry pushed harder, and the hat pin raised the little bulge of skin by a small but appreciable amount. Skin was a lot tougher to break through than anyone imagined. The pen was beginning to hurt his fingers, so Harry opened his hand and positioned the head against the base of his middle finger. Grimacing, he pushed his hand against the pen. The point of the pen popped through the raised wrinkle. "'Eddie, you're made out of beer cans,' Harry said, and tugged the head of the pen backwards. The wrinkle flattened out. Now Harry could shove the pen forward again, sliding the shaft deeper and deeper under the surface of little Eddie's skin. He could see the raised line of the hat pin marching down his brother's arm, looking as prominent as the damage done to a cartoon lawn by a cartoon rabbit. When the mother of Pearl Head was perhaps three inches from the entry hole, Harry pushed it down into little Eddie's flesh, thus raising the point of the pin. He gave the head a sharp jab, and the point appeared at the end of the ridge in Eddie's skin, poking through a tiny smear of blood. Harry shoved the pen in further. Now it showed about an inch and a half of gray metal at either end. Feel anything? Nothing. Harry jiggled the head of the pen, and a bubble of blood walked out of the entry wound and began to slide down Eddie's arm. Harry sat down on the attic floor beside Eddie and regarded his work. His mind seemed pleasantly empty of thought, filled only with a variety of sensations. He felt, but could not hear, a buzzing in his head, and a blurry film seemed to cover his eyes. He breathed through his mouth. The long pin, stuck through little Eddie's arm, looked monstrous seen one way. Seen another, it was sheerly beautiful. Skin, blood, and metal. Harry had never seen anything like it before. He reached out and twisted the pen, causing another little blood snail to crawl from the exit wound. Harry saw all this as if through smudgy glasses, but he did not mind. He knew the blurriness was only mental. He touched the head of the pen again and moved it from side to side. A little more blood leaked from both punctures. Then Harry shoved the pen in, partially withdrew it, so that the point nearly disappeared back into Eddie's arm, moved it forward again, and went on like this, back and forth, back and forth, as if he were sewing his brother up for some time. Finally he withdrew the pen from Eddie's arm. Two long streaks of blood had nearly reached his brother's wrist. Harry ground the heels of his hands into his eyes, blinked, and discovered that his vision had cleared. He wondered how long he and Eddie had been in the attic. It could have been hours. He could not quite remember what had happened before he had slid the hat pin into Eddie's skin. Now his blurriness really was mental, not visual. A loud, uncomfortable pulse beat in his temples. Again he wiped the blood from Eddie's arm. Then he stood on wobbling knees and returned to his chair. How's your arm feel, Eddie? Numb, Eddie said in his gravelly, sleepy voice. The numbness is going away now, very, very slowly. You are beginning to feel your arm again, and it feels very good. There is no pain. It feels like the sun was shining on it all afternoon. It's strong and healthy. Feeling is coming back into your arm, and you can move your fingers and everything. When he had finished speaking, Harry leaned back against the chair and closed his eyes. He rubbed his forehead with his hand and wiped the moisture off on his shirt. "'How does your arm feel?' he said, without opening his eyes. "'Good.' "'That's great, little Eddie.' Harry flattened his palms against his flushed face, wiped his cheeks, and opened his eyes. "'I can do this every night,' he thought. "'I can bring little Eddie up here every single night, at least until school starts.' Eddie, you're getting stronger and stronger every day. This is really helping you. And the more we do it, the stronger you'll get. Do you understand me? I understand you, Eddie said. We're almost done for tonight. 
There's just one more thing I want to try, but you have to be really deep asleep for this to work. So I want you to go deeper and deeper, as deep as you can go. Relax, and now you are really deep asleep. Deep, deep, and relaxed and ready, and feeling good. Little Eddie sat sprawled in his chair with his head tilted back and his eyes closed. Two tiny dark spots of blood stood out like mosquito bites on his lower right forearm. When I talk to you, Eddie, you're slowly getting younger and younger. You're going backward in time. So now you're not nine years old anymore. You're eight. It's last year. And you're in the third grade. And now you're seven. And now you're six years old. And now you're five, Eddie, and it's the day of your fifth birthday. You're five years old today, little Eddie. How old are you? I'm five. To Harry's surprised pleasure, little Eddie's voice actually seemed younger, as did his hunched posture in the chair. How do you feel? Not good. I hate my present. It's terrible. Dad got it. And Mom says it should never be allowed in the house because it's just junk. I wish I wouldn't ever have to have birthdays. They're so terrible. I'm going to cry. His face contracted. Harry tried to remember what Eddie had gotten for his fifth birthday, but could not. He caught only a dim memory of shame and disappointment. What's your present, Eddie? In a teary voice, Eddie said, a radio, but it's busted, and Mom says it looks like it came from the junkyard. I don't want it any more. I don't even want to see it. Yes, Harry thought. Yes, yes, yes. He could remember. On little Eddie's fifth birthday, Edgar Beavers had produced a yellow plastic radio, which even Harry had seen was astoundingly ugly. The dial was cracked, and it was marked here and there with brown circular scab-like marks, where someone had mashed out cigarettes on it. The radio had long since been buried in the junk room, where it now lay beneath several geological layers of trash. Okay, Eddie, you can forget the radio now, because you're going backwards again. You're getting younger. You're going backwards through being four years old, and now you're three. He looked with interest at little Eddie, whose entire demeanor had changed. From being tearfully unhappy, Eddie now demonstrated a self-sufficient good cheer Harry could not ever remember seeing in him. His arms were folded over his chest. He was smiling, and his eyes were bright and clear and childish. "'What do you see?' Harry asked. "'Mommy, ommy, om. "'What's she doing?' "'Mommy's at her desk.' She's smoking and looking through her papers. Eddie giggled. Mommy looks funny. It looks like smoke is coming out of the top of her head. Eddie ducked his chin and hid his smile behind a hand. Mommy doesn't see me. I can see her, but she doesn't see me. Oh, Mommy works hard. She works hard at her desk. Eddie's smile abruptly left his face. His face froze for a second in a comic, rubbery absence of expression. Then his eyes widened in terror, and his mouth went loose and wobbly. What happened? Harry's mouth had gone dry. No, Mommy! Eddie wailed. Don't, Mommy! I wasn't spying! I wasn't, I promise! His words broke off into a screech. No! Mommy! Don't! Don't! Mommy! Eddie jumped upward, sending his chair flying back, and ran blindly toward the rear of the attic. Harry's head rang with Eddie's screeches. He heard a sharp crack of wood breaking, but only as a small part of all the noise Eddie was making as he charged around the attic. Eddie had run into a tangle of hanging dresses, spun around, and meshing himself deeper in the dresses and was now tearing himself away from the web of dresses, pulling some of them off the rack. 
A long-sleeved purple dress with an enormous lace collar had draped itself around Eddie like a ghostly dance partner, and another dress, this of dull red velvet, snaked around his right leg. Eddie screamed again and yanked himself away from the tangle. The entire rack of clothes wobbled and then went over in a mad jangle of sound. No! he screeched. Help! Eddie ran straight into a big wooden beam marking off one of the eaves, bounced off, and came windmilling toward Harry. Harry knew his brother could not see him. Eddie, stop! he said. But Eddie was past hearing him. Harry tried to make Eddie stop by wrapping his arms around him, but Eddie slammed right into him, hitting Harry's chest with a shoulder and knocking his head painfully against Harry's chin. Harry's arms closed on nothing, and his eyes lost focus, and Eddie went crashing into the tilting mirror. The mirror yawned over sideways. Harry saw it tilt with dreamlike slowness toward the floor, then in an eye blink, drop, and crash. Broken glass sprayed across the attic floor. Stop! Harry yelled. Stand still, Eddie! Eddie came to rest. The ripped and dirty dress of dull red velvet still clung to his right leg. Blood oozed down his temple from an ugly cut above his eye. He was breathing hard, releasing air and little whimpering exhalations. Holy shit, Harry said, looking around at the attic. In only a few seconds, Eddie had managed to create what looked at first like absolute devastation. Mary Rose's ancient dresses lay tangled in a heap of dusty fabrics from which wire hangers skeletally protruded. Gray, Eddie-sized footprints lay like a pattern over the muted explosion of colors the dresses now created. When the rack had gone over, it had knocked a section the size of a dinner plate out of a round wooden coffee table Mary Rose had particularly prized for its being made from a single section of teak. A single piece of teak, the rarest wood in all the world, all the way from Salon. The much-prized mirror lay in hundreds of glittering pieces across the attic floor. With growing horror, Harry saw that the wooden frame had cracked like a bone, showing a bone-pale, shockingly white fracture in the expanse of dark stain. Harry's blood tipped within his body, nearly tipping him with it like the mirror. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God! He turned slowly around. Eddie stood blinking two feet to his side, wiping ineffectually at the blood running from his forehead and now covering most of his left cheek. He looked like an Indian in war paint, a defeated, lost Indian, for his eyes were dim and his head turned aimlessly from side to side. A few feet from Eddie lay the chair in which he had been sitting. One of its thin curved wooden arms lay beside it, crudely severed. It looked like an insect's leg, Harry thought, like a toy gun. For a moment Harry thought that his face, too, was red with blood. He wiped his hand over his forehead and looked at his glistening palm. It was only sweat. His heart beat like a bell. Beside him, Eddie said, Ah! What? The injury to his head had brought him out of the trance. The dresses were ruined, stepped on, tangled, torn. The mirror was broken. The table had been mutilated. Mary Rose's chair lay on its side like a murder victim, its severed arm ending in a bristle of snapped ligaments. My head hurts, Eddie said in a weak, trembling voice. What happened? Ah! I'm all blood. I'm all blood, Harry. You're all blood. You're all blood, Harry shouted at him. Everything's all blood, you dummy. Look around. He did not recognize his own voice, which sounded high and tinny and seemed to be coming from somewhere else. Little Eddie took an aimless step away from him, and Harry wanted to fly at him, to pound his bloody head into a pancake, to destroy him, smash him. Eddie held up his blood-stained palm and stared at it. He wiped it vaguely across the front of his T-shirt and took another wandering step. I'm scared, Harry, his tiny voice uttered. Look what you did, Harry screamed. You wrecked everything. Damn it! What do you think is going to happen to us? What's Mom going to do? Eddie asked in a voice only slightly above a whisper. 
You don't know? Harry yelled. You're dead. Eddie started to weep. Harry bunched his hands into fists and clamped his eyes shut. They were both dead. That was the real truth. Harry opened his eyes, which felt hot and oddly heavy, and stared at his sobbing, red-smeared, useless little brother. Blue Rose, he said. Ten. Little Eddie's hands fell to his sides. His chin dropped and his mouth fell open. Blood ran in a smooth, wide band down the left side of his face, dipped under the line of his jaw, and continued on down his neck and into his T-shirt. Pooled blood in his left eyebrow dripped steadily onto the floor, as if from a faucet. You are going deep asleep, Harry said. Where was the hat pin? He looked back to the single standing chair and saw the mother of pearl head glistening on the floor near it. Your whole body is numb. He moved over to the pen, bent down, and picked it up. The metal shaft felt warm in his fingers. You can feel no pain. He went back to little Eddie. Nothing can hurt you. Harry's breath seemed to be breathing itself, forcing itself into his throat in hot, harsh, shallow pants, then expelling itself out. Did you hear me, little Eddie? In his gravelly, slow-moving, hypnotized voice, little Eddie said, I heard you. And you can feel no pain? I can feel no pain. Harry drew his arm back, the point of the hat pen extending forward from his fist, and then jerked his hand forward as hard as he could and stuck the pen into Eddie's abdomen right through the blood-soaked T-shirt. He exhaled sharply and tasted a sour misery on his breath. You don't feel a thing. I don't feel a thing. Harry opened his right hand and drove his palm against the head of the pen, hammering it in another few inches. Little Eddie looked like a voodoo doll. A kind of sparkling light surrounded him. Harry gripped the head of the pen with his thumb and forefinger and yanked it out. He held it up and inspected it. Glittering light surrounded the pen, too. The long shaft was painted with blood. Harry slipped the point into his mouth and closed his lips around the warm metal. He saw himself, a man and another life, standing in a row with men like himself, in a bleak gray landscape, defined by barbed wire. Emaciated people in rags shuffled up toward them and spat on their clothes. The smells of dead flesh and of burning flesh hung in the air. Then the vision was gone, and little Eddie stood before him again, surrounded by layers of glittering light. Harry grimaced or grinned, he could not have told the difference, and drove his long spike deep into Eddie's stomach. Eddie uttered a small oof. You don't feel anything, Eddie, Harry whispered. You feel good all over. You never felt better in your life. Never felt better in my life. Harry slowly pulled out the pen and cleaned it with his fingers. He was able to remember every single thing anyone had ever told him about Tommy Goals. Now you're going to play a funny, funny game, he said. This is called the Tommy Goals game, because it's going to keep you safe from Mrs. Franken. Are you ready? Harry carefully slid the pen into the fabric of his shirt collar, all the while watching Eddie's slack, blood-streaked person. Vibrating bands of light beat rhythmically and steadily about Eddie's face. Ready, Eddie said. I'm going to give you your instructions now, little Eddie. Pay attention to everything I say, and it's all going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay, as long as you play the game exactly the way I tell you. You understand, don't you? I understand. Tell me what I just said. Everything's gonna be okay as long as I play the game exactly the way you tell me. A dollop of blood slid off Eddie's eyebrow and splashed onto his already soaked T-shirt. Good, Eddie. Now the first thing you do is fall down. Not now, when I tell you. 
I'm going to give you all the instructions, and then I'm going to count backwards from ten, and when I get to one, we'll start playing the game, okay? Okay. So first you fall down, little Eddie. You fall down real hard. Then comes the fun part of the game. You bang your head on the floor. You start to go crazy. You twitch, and you bang your hands and feet on the floor. You do that for a long time. I guess you do that until you count to about a hundred. You foam at the mouth. You twist all over the place. You get real stiff, and then you get real loose. And then you get real stiff, and then real loose again. And all this time you're banging your head and your hands and feet on the floor. And you're twisting all over the place. And when you finish counting to a hundred in your head, you do the last thing. You swallow your tongue. And that's the game. When you swallow your tongue, you're the winner. And then nothing bad can happen to you, and Mrs. Franken won't be able to hurt you ever, ever, ever. Harry stopped talking. His hands were shaking. After a second, he realized that his insides were shaking, too. He raised his trembling fingers to his shirt collar and felt the hat pen. Tell me how you win the game, little Eddie. What's the last thing you do? I swallow my tongue. Right. And then Mrs. Franken and Mom will never be able to hurt you because you won the game. Good, said little Eddie. The glittering light shimmered about him. Okay, we'll start playing right now, Harry said. Ten? He went toward the attic steps. Nine. He reached the steps. Eight. He went down one step. Seven. Harry descended another two steps. Six. When he went down another two steps, he called up in a slightly louder voice. Five. Now his head was beneath the level of the attic floor, and he could not see little Eddie any more. All he could hear was the soft, occasional plop of liquid hitting the floor. Four, three, two. He was now at the door to the attic steps. Harry opened the door, stepped through it, breathed hard, and shouted, One! up the stairs. He heard a thud, and then quickly closed the door behind him. Harry went across the hall and into the dormitory bedroom. There seemed to be a strange absence of light in the hallway. For a second he saw, he was sure he saw, a line of dark trees across a wall of barbed wire. Harry closed this door behind him, too, and went to his narrow bed and sat down. He could feel blood beating in his face. His eyes seemed oddly warm, as if they were heated by filaments. Harry slowly, almost reverently, extracted the hat-pin from his collar and set it on his pillow. A hundred, he said, ninety-nine, ninety-eight, ninety-seven, ninety-six, ninety-five, ninety-four. When he had counted down to one, he stood up and left the bedroom. He went quickly downstairs without looking at the door behind which lay the attic steps. On the ground floor he slipped into Mary Rose's bedroom, crossed over to her desk, and slid open the bottom right-hand drawer. From the drawer he took a velvet-covered box. This he opened, and jabbed the hat-pin and the ball of material, studded with pins of all sizes and descriptions from which he had taken it. He replaced the box in the drawer, pushed the drawer into the desk, and quickly left the room and went upstairs. Back in his own bedroom Harry took off his clothes and climbed into his bed. His face still burned. He must have fallen asleep very quickly, because the next thing he knew Albert was slamming his way into the bedroom and tossing his clothes and boots all over the place. "'You asleep?' Albert asked. "'You left the attic light on, you fucking dummies. But if you think I'm going to save your fucking asses and go up and turn it off, you're even stupider than you look.' Harry was careful not to move a finger, not to move even a hair. He held his breath while Albert threw himself onto his bed, and when Albert's breathing relaxed and slowed, Harry followed his big brother into sleep. 
He did not awaken again until he heard his father half screeching, half sobbing up in the attic. And that was very late at night. 11. Sonny came from Fort Sill, George all the way from Germany. Between them they held up a sodden Edgar Beavers at the gravesite, while a minister Harry had never seen before read from a Bible as cracked and rubbed as an old brown shoe. Between his two older sons, Harry's father looked bent and ancient, a skinny old man only steps from the grave himself. Sonny and George despised their father, Harry saw. They held him up on sufferance, in part because they had chipped in thirty dollars apiece to buy him a suit and did not want to see it collapse with its owner inside into the lumpy clay of the graveyard. His whiskers glistened in the sun, and moisture shone beneath his eyes and at the corners of his mouth. He had been shaking too severely for either Sonny or George to shave him, and had been capable of moving in a straight line only after George let him take a couple of long swallows from a leather-covered flask he took out of his duffel bag. The minister uttered a few sage words on the subject of epilepsy. Sonny and George looked as solid as brick walls in their uniforms, like prison guards, or actual prisons themselves. Next to them, Albert looked shrunken and unfinished. Albert wore the green plaid sport jacket in which he had graduated from the eighth grade, and his wrists hung prominent and red four inches below the bottoms of the sleeves. His motorcycle boots were visible beneath his light gray trousers, but they, like the green jacket, had lost their flash. Like Albert, too. Ever since the discovery of Eddie's body— Albert had gone around the house looking as if he'd just bitten off the end of his tongue and was trying to decide whether or not to spit it out. He never looked anybody in the eye, and he rarely spoke. Albert acted as though a gigantic padlock had been fixed to the middle of his chest, and he was damned if he'd ever take it off. He had not asked Sonny or George a single question about the army. Every now and then he would utter a remark about the gas station so toneless that it suffocated any reply. Harry looked at Albert standing beside their mother, kneading his hands together and keeping his eyes fixed, as if by decree, on the square foot of ground before him. Albert glanced over at Harry, knew he was being looked at, and did what to Harry was an extraordinary thing. Albert froze. All expression drained out of his face, and his hands locked immovably together. He looked as little able to see or hear as a statue. He's that way because he told little Eddie that he wished he would die, Harry thought for the tenth or eleventh time since he had realized this, and with undiminished awe. Then was he lying? Harry wondered. And if he really did wish that little Eddie would drop dead, why isn't he happy now? Didn't he get what he wanted? Albert would never spit out that piece of his tongue, Harry thought, watching his brother blink slowly and sightlessly toward the ground. Harry shifted his gaze uneasily to his father, still propped up between George and Sonny, heard that the minister was finally reaching the end of his speech, and took a fast look at his mother. Mary Rose was standing very straight in a black dress and black sunglasses, holding the straps of her bag in front of her with both hands. Except for the color of her clothes, she could have been a spectator at a tennis match. Harry knew by the way she was holding her face that she was wishing she could smoke. Dying for a cigarette, he thought. Ha, ha. The monster mash. It's a graveyard smash. The minister finished speaking and made a rhetorical gesture with his hands. The coffin sank on ropes into the rough earth. Harry's father began to weep loudly. First George, then Sonny, picked up large, damp, shovel-marked pieces of the clay and dropped them on the coffin. Edgar Beavers nearly fell in after his own tiny clod, but George contemptuously swung him back. Mary Rose marched forward, bent and picked up a random piece of clay with thumb and forefinger, as if using tweezers, dropped it, and turned away before it struck. Albert fixed his eyes on Harry. His own clod had split apart in his hand and crumbled away between his fingers. Harry shook his head no. He did not want to drop dirt on Eddie's coffin and make that noise. He did not want to look at Eddie's coffin again. There was enough dirt around to do the job without him hitting that metal box like he was trying to ring Eddie's doorbell. He stepped back. 
Mom says we have to get back to the house, Albert said. Mary Rose lit up as soon as they got into the single black car they had rented through the funeral parlor and breathed out acrid smoke over everybody crowded into the back seat. The car backed into a narrow graveyard lane and turned down the main road toward the front gates. In the front seat, next to the driver, Edgar Beavers drooped sideways and leaned his head against the window, leaving a blurred streak on the glass. How in the name of hell could little Eddie have epilepsy without anybody knowing about it? George asked. Albert stiffened and stared out the window. Well, that's epilepsy, Mary Rose said. Eddie could have gone on for years without having an attack. That she worked in a hospital always gave her remarks of this sort a unique gravity, almost as if she were a doctor. Must have been some fit, Sonny said, squeezed into place between Harry and Albert. Grand mal, Mary Rose said, and took another hungry drag on her cigarette. Poor little bastard, George said. Sorry, Mom. I know you're in the armed forces, and armed forces people speak very freely, but I wish you would not use that kind of language. Harry, jammed into Sonny's rock-hard side, felt his brother's body twitch with a hidden laugh, though Sonny's face did not alter. I said I was sorry, Mom, George said. Yes. Driver! Driver! Mary Rose was leaning forward, reaching out one claw to tap the chauffeur's shoulder. Livermore is the next right. Do you know South Sixth Street? I'll get you there, the driver said. This is not my family, Harry thought. I came from somewhere else, and my rules are different from theirs. His father mumbled something inaudible as soon as they got in the door and disappeared into his curtained-off cubicle. Mary Rose put her sunglasses in her purse and marched into the kitchen to warm the coffee cake and the macaroni casserole, both made that morning in the oven. Sonny and George wandered into the living room and sat down on opposite ends of the couch. They did not look at each other. George picked up a Reader's Digest from the table and began leafing through it backward, and Sonny folded his hands in his lap and stared at his thumbs. Albert's footsteps plodded up the stairs, crossed the landing, and went into the dormitory bedroom. "'What's she in the kitchen for?' Sonny asked, speaking to his hands. "'Nobody's going to come. Nobody ever comes here, because she never wanted them to.' "'Albert's taking this kind of hard, Harry,' George said. He propped the magazine against the stiff folds of his uniform, and looked across the room at his little brother. Harry had seated himself beside the door, as out of the way as possible. George's attentions rather frightened him, though George had behaved with consistent kindness ever since his arrival two days after Eddie's death. His crew cut still bristled, and he could still break rocks with his chin, but some violent demon seemed to have left him. You think he'll be okay? Him? Sure. Harry tilted his head, grimaced. He didn't see little Eddie first, did he? No, Dad did, Harry said. He saw the light on in the attic when he came home, I guess. Albert went up there, though. I guess there was so much blood Dad thought somebody broke in and killed Eddie. But he just bumped his head, and that's where the blood came from. Head wounds bleed like bastards, Sonny said. A guy hit me with a bottle once in Tokyo. I thought I was going to bleed to death right there. And Mom's stuff got all messed up? George asked quietly. This time, Sonny looked up. Pretty much, I guess. The dress rack got knocked down. Dad cleaned up what he could the next day. One of the cane-back chairs got broke, and a hunk got knocked out of the teak table. And the mirror got broken into a million pieces. Sonny shook his head and made a soft whistling sound through his pursed lips. She's a tough old gal, George said. I hear her coming, though, so we have to stop, Harry. But we can talk tonight. Harry nodded. Twelve. After dinner that night, when Mary Rose had gone to bed, the hospital had given her two nights off, Harry sat across the kitchen table from a George who clearly had something to say. Sonny had polished off a six-pack by himself in front of the television and gone up to the dormitory bedroom by himself. Albert had disappeared shortly after dinner, 
and their father had never emerged from his cubicle beside the junk room. I'm glad Pete Fratrosian came over, George said. He's a good old boy. Ate two helpings, too. Harry was startled by George's use of their neighbor's first name. He was not even sure that he had ever heard it before. Mr. Petrosian had been their only caller that afternoon. Harry had seen that his mother was grateful that someone had come, and despite her preparations wanted no more company after Mr. Petrosian had left. "'Think I'll get a beer. That is, if Sonny didn't drink it all,' George said, and stood up and opened the fridge. His uniform looked as if it had been painted on his body, and his muscles bulged and moved like a horse's. Two left, he said. Good thing you're underage. George popped the caps off both bottles and came back to the table. He winked at Harry, then tilted the first bottle to his lips and took a good swallow. So what the devil was little Eddie doing up there, anyhow? Trying on dresses? I don't know, Harry said. I was asleep. Hell, I know I kind of lost touch with little Eddie, but I got the impression he was scared of his shadow. I'm surprised you had the nerve to go up there and mess around with Mom's precious stuff. Yeah, Harry said. Me too. You didn't happen to go with him, did you? George tilted the bottle to his mouth and winked at Harry again. Harry just looked back. He could feel his face getting hot. I just was thinking maybe you saw it happen to little Eddie and got too scared to tell anybody. Nobody would be mad at you, Harry. Nobody would blame you for anything. You couldn't know how to help someone who's having an epileptic fit. Little Eddie swallowed his tongue. Even if you'd been standing next to him when he did it, and had the presence of mind to call an ambulance, he would have died before it got there. Unless you knew what was wrong and how to correct it which nobody would expect you to know, not in a million years. Nobody would blame you for anything, Harry, not even Mom. I was asleep, Harry said. Okay, okay. I just wanted you to know. They sat in silence for a time, then both spoke at once. Did you know? We had this... Sorry, George said. Go on. Did you know that Dad used to be in the Army? In World War II? Yeah, I knew that. Of course I knew that. Did you know that he committed the perfect murder once? What? Dad committed the perfect murder. When he was at Dachau, that death camp. Oh, Christ, is that what you're talking about? You got a funny way of seeing things, Harry. He shot an enemy who was trying to escape. That's not murder, it's war. There's one hell of a big difference. I'd like to see war some day, Harry said. I'd like to be in the army, like you and Dad. Hold your horses, hold your horses, George said, smiling now. That's sort of one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. He set down his beer bottle, cradled his hands around it, and tilted his head to look at Harry. This was obviously going to be serious. You know, I used to be crazy and stupid. That's the only way to put it. I used to look for fights. I had a chip on my shoulder the size of a house, and pounding some dipshit into a coma was my idea of a great time. The army did me a lot of good. It made me grow up. But I don't think you need that, Harry. You're too smart for that. If you have to go, you go. But out of all of us, you're the one who could really amount to something in this world. You could be a doctor or a lawyer. You ought to get the best education you can, Harry. What you have to do is stay out of trouble and get to college. Oh, college, Harry said. Listen to me, Harry. I make pretty good money, and I got nothing to spend it on. I'm not going to get married and have kids, that's for sure. So I want to make you a proposition. If you keep your nose clean and make it through high school, I'll help you out with college. Maybe you can get a scholarship. I think you're smart enough, Harry, and a scholarship would be great. But either way, I'll see you make it through. George emptied the first bottle, set it down, and gave Harry a quizzical look. Let's get one person in this family off on the right track. What do you say? 
I guess I'd better keep reading, Harry said. I hope you'll read your ass off, little buddy, George said, and picked up the second bottle of beer. 13. The day after Sonny left, George put all of Eddie's toys and clothes into a box and squeezed the box into the junk room. Two days later, George took a bus to New York so he could get his flight to Munich from Idlewild. An hour before he caught his bus, George walked Harry up to Big John's and stuffed him full of hamburgers and french fries, and said, You'll probably miss Eddie a lot, won't you? I guess, Harry said. But the truth was that Eddie was now only a vacancy, a blank space. Sometimes a door would close, and Harry would know that little Eddie had just come in, but when he turned to look he saw only emptiness. George's question, asked a week ago, was the last time Harry had heard anyone pronounce his brother's name. In the seven days since the charmed afternoon at Big John's and the departure on a southbound bus of George Beaver's, everything seemed to have gone back to the way it was before. But Harry knew that really everything had changed. They had been a loose, divided family of five, two parents and three sons. Now they seemed to be a family of three and Harry thought that the actual truth was that the family had shrunk down to two, himself and his mother. Edgar Beavers had left home. He, too, was an absence. After two visits from policemen who parked their cars right outside the house, after listening to his mother's muttered expressions of disgust, after the spectacle of his pale, bleary, but sober and clean-shaven father trying over and over to knot a necktie in front of the bathroom mirror, Harry finally accepted that his father had been caught shoplifting. His father had to go to court, and he was scared. His hands shook so uncontrollably that he could not shave himself, and in the end Mary Rose had to knot his tie, doing it in one, two, three quick movements, as brutal as the descent of a knife, never removing the cigarette from her mouth. Grief-stricken area man forgiven of shoplifting charge read the headline over the little story in the evening newspaper, which at last explained his father's crime. Edgar Beavers had been stopped on the sidewalk outside the Livermore Avenue National Tea, T-bone stakes, hidden inside his shirt, and a bottle of Rhinegold beer in each of his front pockets. He had stolen two stakes. He had put beer bottles in his pockets. This made Harry feel like he was sweating inside. The judge had sent him home, but home was not where he went. For a short time, Harry thought, his father had hung out on Old Town Road, Palmyra's Skid Row, and slept in vacant lots with winos and bums. Then a woman was supposed to have taken him in. Albert was another mystery. It was as though a creature from outer space had taken him over and was using his body, like invasion of the body snatchers. Albert looked like he thought somebody was always standing behind him, watching every move he made. He was still carrying around that piece of his tongue, and pretty soon, Harry thought, he'd get so used to it that he would forget he had it. Three days after George left Palmyra, Albert had actually tagged along after Harry on the way to Big John's. Harry had turned around on the sidewalk and seen Albert in his black jeans and grease-blackened T-shirt halfway down the block shoving his hands in his pockets and looking hard at the ground. That was Albert's way of pretending to be invisible. The next time he turned around, Albert growled, Keep walking. Harry went to work on the pinball machine as soon as he got inside Big John's. Albert slunk in a few minutes later and went straight to the counter. He took one of the stained paper menus from a stack squeezed in beside a napkin dispenser and inspected it as if he had never seen it before. "'Hey, let me introduce you guys,' said Big John, leaning against the far side of the counter. Like Albert, he wore black jeans and motorcycle boots, but his dark hair, daringly for the 1950s, fell over his ears. Beneath his stained white apron he wore a long-sleeved black shirt with a pattern of tiny azure palm trees. "'You two are the Beavers boys, Harry and Bucky. Say hello to each other, fellows.' Bucky Beaver was a toothy rodent in an Ipana television commercial. Albert blushed. 
still grimly staring at his menu sheet. Call me Beans, Harry said, and felt Albert's gaze shift wonderingly to him. Beans and Bucky, the Beavers boys, Big John said. Well, Buck, what'll you have? Hamburger, fries, shake, Albert said. Big John half turned and yelled the order through the hatch to Mama Mary's kitchen. For a time the three of them stood in uneasy silence. Then Big John said, Heard your old man found a new place to hang his hat. His new girlfriend is a real pistol, I heard. Spent some time in county hospital. On account of she picked up little messages from outer space on the good old Philco. You hear that? He's going to come home real soon, Harry said. He doesn't have any new girlfriend. He's staying with an old friend. She's a rich lady, and she wants to help him out because she knows he had a lot of trouble. And she's going to get him a real good job, and then he'll come home, and we'll be able to move to a better house and everything. He never even saw Albert move. But Albert had materialized beside him. Fury, rage, and misery distorted his face. Harry had time to cry out only once, and then Albert slammed a fist into his chest and knocked him backwards into the pinball machine. "'I bet that felt real good,' Harry said, unable to keep down his own rage. "'I bet you'd like to kill me, huh? Huh, Albert? How about that?' Albert moved backward two paces and lowered his hands, already looking impassive, locked into himself. For a second, in which his breath failed and dazzling light filled his eyes, Harry saw little Eddie's slack, trusting face before him. Then Big John came up from nowhere with a big hamburger and a mound of french fries on a plate, and said, Down, boys, time for Rocky here to tackle his dinner. That night Albert said nothing at all to Harry, as they lay in their beds. Neither did he fall asleep. Harry knew that for most of the night Albert just closed his eyes and faked it, like a possum in trouble. Harry tried to stay awake long enough to see when Albert's fake sleep melted into the real thing, but he sank into dreams long before that. He was rushing down the stony corridor of a castle, past suits of armor and torches guttering in sconces. His bladder was bursting. He had to let go. He could not hold it more than another few seconds. At last he came to the open bathroom door and ran into that splendid, gleaming place. He began to tug at his zipper, and looked around for the butler and the row of marble urinals. Then he froze. Little Eddie was standing before him. Not the uniformed butler. Blood ran in a gaudy streak from a gash high on his forehead, over his cheek, and right down his neck, neat as paint. Little Eddie was waving frantically at Harry, his eyes bright and hysterical, his mouth working soundlessly, because he had swallowed his tongue. Harry sat up straight in bed, about to scream, then realized that the bedroom was all around him, and little Eddie was gone. He hurried downstairs to the bathroom. 14. At two o'clock the next afternoon, Harry Beavers had to pee again, and just as badly. But this time he was a long way from the bathroom, across from the junk room and his father's old cubicle. Harry was standing in the humid sunlight across the street from 45 Old Town Way. This short street connected the bums, transient hotels, bars, and seedy movie theaters of Old Town Road with the more respectable hotels, department stores, and restaurants of Palmyra Avenue, the real downtown. Forty-five Old Town Way was a four-story brick tenement with an exoskeleton of fire escapes. Black iron bars covered the ground-floor windows. On one side of Forty-five Old Town Way were the large soap-smeared windows of a bankrupted shoe store. On the other, a vacant lot where loose bricks and broken bottles nestled amongst dandelions and tall Queen Anne's lace. Harry's father lived in that building now. Everybody else knew it, and since Big John had told him, now Harry knew it, too. He jigged from leg to leg, waiting for a woman to come out through the front door. It was as chipped and peeling as his own, and a broken fanlight sat drunkenly atop it. 
Harry had checked the row of dented mailboxes on the brick wall just outside the door for his father's name, but none bore any names at all. Big John hadn't known the name of the woman who had taken Harry's father, but he said that she was large, black-haired, and crazy, and that she had two children in foster care. About half an hour ago, a dark-haired woman had come through the door, but Harry had not followed her because she had not looked especially large to him. Now he was beginning to have doubts. What did Big John mean by large, anyhow? As big as he was? And how could you tell if someone was crazy? Did it show? Maybe he should have followed that woman. This thought made him even more anxious, and he squeezed his legs together. His father was in that building now, he thought. Harry thought of his father lying on an unmade bed, his brown winter coat around him, his hat pulled low on his forehead, like Lepke Buckhalter's, drawing on a cigarette, looking moodily out the window. Then he had to pee so urgently that he could not have held it in for more than a few seconds, and trotted across the street and into the vacant lot. Near the back fence the tall weeds gave him some shelter from the street. He frantically unzipped and let the braided yellow stream splash into a nest of broken bricks. Harry looked up at the side of the building beside him. It looked very tall, and seemed to be tilting slightly toward him. The four windows on each floor looked back down at him, blank and fatherless. Just as he was tugging at his zipper, he heard the front door of the building slam shut. His heart slammed, too. Harry hunkered down behind the tall white weeds. Anxiety that she might walk the other way, toward downtown, made him twine his fingers together and bend his fingers back. If he waited about five seconds, he figured, he'd know she was going toward Palmyra Avenue, and would be able to get across the lot in time to see which way she'd turned. His knuckles cracked. He felt like a soldier hiding in a forest, like a murder weapon. He raised up on his toes and got ready to dash back across the street, because an empty grocery cart, closely followed by a moving belly with a tiny head and basketball shoes— a cigar tilted in its mouth like a flag, appeared past the front of the building. He could go back and wait across the street. Harry settled down and watched the stomach go down the sidewalk past him. Then a shadow separated itself from the street side of the fat man, and the shadow became a black-haired woman in a long, loose dress, now striding past the grocery cart. She shook back her head, and Harry saw that she was tall as a queen, and that her skin was darker than olive. Deep lines cut through her cheeks. It had to be the woman who had taken his father. Her long, rapid strides had taken her well past the fat man's grocery cart. Harry ran across the rubble of the lot and began to follow her up the sidewalk. His father's woman walked in a hard, determined way. She stepped down into the street to get around groups too slow for her. At the Old Town Road corner— she wove her way through a group of saggy-bottomed men, passing around a bottle and a paper bag, and cut in front of two black children dribbling a basketball up the street. She was on the move, and Harry had to hurry along to keep her in sight. "'I bet you don't believe me,' he said to himself, practicing, and skirted the group of winos on the corner. He picked up his speed until he was nearly trotting. The two black kids with the basketball ignored him as he kept pace with them, then went on ahead. Far up the block, the tall woman with bouncing black hair marched right past a flashing neon sign in a bar window. Her bottom moved back and forth in the loose dress, surprisingly big whenever it bulged out the fabric of the dress. Her back seemed as long as a lion's. "'What would you say if I told you?' Harry said to himself. A block and a half ahead, the woman turned on her heel and went through the door of the A&P store. Harry sprinted the rest of the way, pushed the yellow wooden door marked Enter, and walked into the dense, humid air of the grocery store. Other A&P stores may have been air-conditioned, but not the little shop on Old Town Road. What was foster care, anyway? Did you get money if you gave away your children? A good person's children would never be in foster care, Harry thought. He saw the woman turning into the third aisle past the cash register. He saw with a small shock that she was taller than his father. If I told you, you might not believe me. 
He went slowly around the corner of the aisle. She was standing on the pale wooden floor about fifteen feet in front of him, carrying a wire basket in one hand. He stepped forward. What I have to say might seem— For good luck he touched the hat pin inserted into the bottom of his collar. She was staring at a row of brightly colored bags of potato chips. Harry cleared his throat. The woman reached down and picked up a big bag and put it in the basket. Excuse me, Harry said. She turned her head to look at him. Her face was as wide as it was long, and in the mellow light from the store's low wattage bulbs her skin seemed a very light shade of brown. Harry knew he was meeting an equal. She looked like she could do magic, as if she could shoot fire and sparks out of her pierced black eyes. I bet you don't believe me, he said. But a kid can hypnotize people just as good as an adult. What's that? His rehearsed words now sounded crazy to him, but he stuck to his script. A kid can hypnotize people. I can hypnotize people. Do you believe that? I don't think I even care, she said, and wheeled away toward the rear of the aisle. I bet you don't think I could hypnotize you, Harry said. Kid, get lost. Harry suddenly knew that if he kept talking about hypnotism, the woman would turn down the next aisle and ignore him no matter what he said, or else begin to speak in a very loud voice about seeing the manager. My name is Harry Beavers, he said to her back. Edgar Beavers is my dad. She stopped and turned around and looked expressionlessly into his face. Harry dizzyingly saw a wall of barbed wire before him, a dark green wall of trees at the other end of a barren field. I wonder if you maybe call him Beans, Harry said. Oh, great, she said. That's just great. So you're one of his boys. Terrific. Beans wants potato chips. What do you want? I want you to fall down and bang your head and swallow your tongue and die and get buried and have people drop dirt on you, Harry said. The woman's mouth fell open. Then I want you to puff up with gas. I want you to rot. I want you to turn green and black. I want your skin to slide off your bones. You're crazy, the woman shouted at him. Your whole family's crazy. Do you think your mother wants him any more? My father shot us in the back, Harry said, and turned and bolted down the aisle for the door. When he got outside, he began to trot down seedy Old Town Road. When he came to Old Town Way, he turned left. When he ran past number 45, he looked at every blank window. His face, his hands, his whole body felt hot and wet. Soon he had a stitch in his side. Harry blinked and saw a dark line of trees, a wall of barbed wire before him. At the top of Old Town Way he turned into Palmyra Avenue. From there he could continue running past Alouette's boarded-up windows, past all the stores, old and new, to the corner of Livermore, and from there, he only now realized, to the little house that belonged to Mr. Petrosian. 15. On a sweltering mid-afternoon, eleven years later, at a camp in the central highlands of Vietnam, Lieutenant Harry Beavers closed the flap of his tent against the mosquitoes and sat on the edge of his temporary bunk to write a long-delayed letter back to Pat Caldwell, the young woman he wanted to marry, and to whom he would be married for a time after his return from the war to New York State. This is what he wrote, after frequent crossings out and hesitations. Harry later destroyed this letter. Dear Pat, First of all, I want you to know how much I miss you, my darling and that if I ever get out of this beautiful and terrible country, which I am going to do, that I am going to chase you mercilessly and unrelentingly until you say that you'll marry me. Maybe in the euphoria of relief, yes. I have the future all worked out, Pat, and you're a big part of it. I have eighty-six days until Deros, when they pat me on the head and put me on that big bird out of here. Now that my record is clear again, I have no doubts that Columbia Law School will take me in. As you know, my law board scores were pretty respectable, modest me, 
when I took them at Adelphi. I am pretty sure I could even get into Harvard Law, but I settled on Columbia because then we could both be in New York. My brother George has already told me that he will help out with whatever money I, you and I, will need. George put me through Adelphi. I don't think you knew this. In fact, nobody knew this. When I look back, in college I was such a jerk. I wanted everybody to think my family was well-to-do, or at least middle class. The truth is we were damn poor, which I think makes my accomplishments all the more noteworthy, all the more love-worthy. You see, this experience, even with all the ugly and self-doubting and humiliating moments, has done me a lot of good. I was right to come here, even though I had no idea what it was really like. I think I needed the experience of war to complete me, and I tell you this, even though I know that you will detest any such idea. In fact, I have to tell you that a big part of me loves being here, and that, in some way, even with all this trouble, this year will always be one of the high points of my life. Pat, as you see, I am determined to be honest, to be an honest man. If I am going to be a lawyer, I ought to be honest, don't you think? Or maybe the reverse is the reality. One thing that has meant a lot to me here has been what I can only call the close comradeship of my friends and my men. I actually like the grunts more than the usual officer types, which of course means that I get more loyalty and better performance from my men than the usual lieutenant. Some day I'd like you to meet Mike Poole and Tim Underhill and Pumo the Puma, and the most amazing of all, M. O. Dengler, who of course was involved with me in the Yaw-Took Cave incident. These guys stuck by me. I even have a nickname, Beans. They call me Beans Beavers, and I like it. There was no way my court-martial could have really put me in any trouble— because all the facts, and my own men, were on my side. Besides, could you see me actually killing children? This is Vietnam, and you kill people. That's what we're doing here. We kill Charlies. But we don't kill babies and children. Not even in the heat of wartime. And Yaw Took was pretty hot. Well, this is my way of letting you know that at the court-martial, of course, I received a complete and utter vindication. Dangler did, too. There were even unofficial mutterings about giving us medals for all the B.S. we put up with for the past six weeks, including that amazing story in Time magazine. Before people start yelling about atrocities, they ought to have all the facts straight. Fortunately, last week's magazines go out with the rest of the trash. Besides. I already knew too much about what death does to people. I never told you that I once had a little brother named Edward. When I was ten, my little brother wandered up into the top floor of our house one night and suffered a fatal epileptic fit. This event virtually destroyed my family. It led directly to my father's leaving home. He had been a hero in WW2, something else I never told you. It deeply changed, I would say even damaged, my older brother Albert. Albert tried to enlist in 1964, but they wouldn't take him because they said he was psychologically unfit. My mom, too, almost came apart for a while. She used to go up in the attic and cry and wouldn't come down. So you could say that my family was pretty well destroyed, or ruined, or whatever you want to call it, by a sudden death. I took it, and my dad's desertion, pretty hard myself. You don't get over these things easily. The court-martial lasted exactly four hours. Big deal, hey? As we used to say back in Palmyra. We used to have a neighbor named Pete Petrosian, who said things like that, and against what must have been million-to-one odds, who died exactly the same way my brother did, about two weeks after. Lightning really did strike twice. I guess it's dumb to think about him now, but maybe one thing more does is to make you conversant with death. How it happens, what it does to people, what it means, how all the dead in your life are somehow united, joined, part of your eternal family. 
This is a profound feeling, Pat, and no damn whipped-up failed court-martial can touch it. If there were any innocent children in that cave, then they are in my family forever, like little Edward and Pete Petrosian, and the rest of my life is a poem to them. But the army says there weren't, and so do I. I love you and love you and love you. You can stop worrying now and start thinking about being married to a Columbia law student with one hell of a good future. I won't tell you any more war stories than you want to hear, and that's a promise, whether the stories are about Nam or Palmyra. Always yours, Harry, a.k.a. Beans. Peter Straub is the author of Julia, If You Could See Me Now, Ghost Story, Shadowland, and Floating Dragon, as well as The Talisman, written in collaboration with Stephen King. The first two titles, along with a previously unreleased novel, Under Venus, have been collected in one volume as Wild Animals. Forthcoming are two books, the novel Coco, and a collection of novellas. The Monster by Joe Haldeman Start at the beginning? Which beginning? Okay, since you be from outside, I give you the whole thing. Sit over there, be comfort. Smoke em if you got them. They talk about these guys that come back from the Nam all fucked up and shit, and say they be like time bombs. They go along okay for years, then get a gun and just go crazy. But it don't go nothing like that for me. Even though there be the gun involved this time, and an actual murder this time. First time I be in prison, after the court-martial, I try to tell them what it be, and what they get me. Social workers and shrinks. Guy to be a shrink in a prison ain't be no good shrink. What they can make outside is the way I figure it. So at first I don't give them shit. But then I always get discipline. So I figure what the hell, and make up a story. You watch any TV, you can make up a nom story, too. So some of them don't fall for it. They go along with it for a while, because this is what crazy people do, is make up stories. Then they give up, and another one comes along, and I start over with a different story. And sometime when I know for sure they don't believe, when they start to look at me like you look at an animal in the zoo, that's when I tell them the real true story. And that's when they smile, you know, and nod, and the new guy come in next. Because if anybody would make up a story like that one, he'd have to be crazy, right? But I swear to God it's true. Right, the beginning. I be a lerp in the Nam, which means long-range recon patrol. You look in these magazines about the Nam, and they make like the lerps be always heroes. Brave boys go out and face Charlie alone, bring down the artillery on them and all. But it was not like that. You didn't want to be no lerp where we be. They make you be a fucking lerp if they want to get rid of your ass, and that's the God's truth. Now I can tell you right now that I don't give a flying fuck for that U.S. Army, and I don't like it even more when I be drafted. But I got to admit they be pretty smart the way they do with us. Because we get off on that lerp shit. I mean, we be one bunch of badass brothers and good old boys, and we did love that rock and roll, and God, they give us rock and roll. Fuck your M-16. We get real Tommy guns with one hundred round drum. Usually one guy get your automatic grenade launcher, one guy carry that starlight scope, another guy the full demo bag. I mean, we could have taken on the whole fucking North Vietnam Army. We could have killed fucking Rambo. Now, I like to talk strange, though any time I want, I can talk like other people. Even Jamaican, like my mama, ain't understand me if I try. I be born in New York City, but at that time my mama be only three months there. When she speak her English, it be island music, 
but the guy she lived with, bringing me up. He be from Taiwan. So in between them, I learn shitty English, same same shitty Chinese, and live in Cuban neighborhood. Poor el Espanol shitty. He was one mean motherfucking Chinese cab driver, slapped shit out of me for twelve year, and then I take a kitchen knife and slap him back. He never come back for the ear. I think maybe he go off some place and die. I don't give a shit any more. But when I be drafted, they find out I speak Chinese, send me to language school in California. And I be so dumb I believe them when they say this means no nom for the boy. I stay home and translate for them, tapes from the radio. So they send me to the nom anyhow, and I go a little wild. I hit everybody that outranks me. They put me in the hospital, and I hit the doctor. They put me in the stockade, and I hit the guards. The guards hit back. Some more hospital. I figure sooner or later they got to kill me or let me out. But then one day this strack dude come in and tell me about the lerp shit. It sound all right, even though the dude say if I fuck up they can waste me and it's legal. By now I know they can do that shit right there in LBJ, Long Bin Jail. So what the fuck? In two days I'm in the jungle with three real badass dudes with a map and a compass and enough shit we could start our own war. They give us these maps that never have no words on them, like names of places, just Town Pop 1000 and shit like that. They play it real cute, like we so dumb we don't know there be places outside of Vietnam where no G.I.s can go. They keep all our I.D. in base camp, even the dog tags, and tell us not to be captured. Die first, they say. That shall be more pleasant. We laugh at that later. But I keep to myself the way I do feel. That the grave be one place we all be getting to, long road or short, and maybe the short road be less bumps, less trouble. Now I know from twenty years how true that be. They don't tell us where the place be we leave from, after the slick drop us in, but we always sure as hell head west. Guy named Duke, mean honky, but not dumb, he say all we be doing is harassment. Busting up supply lines coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia. It do look like that. Long lines of gooks carrying ammo and shit, sometime on bicycles. We would set up some mine and some claymores and wait till the middle of the line be there, then pop the shit, then maybe waste a few with the grenade launcher and tommy guns, not too long so they ain't regroup and get us. Duke be taking a couple Polaroids, and we go four different ways, meet a couple miles away, then sneak back to the LZ and call the Slick. We go out maybe six time a month, maybe lose one guy a month. Me and Duke make it through all the way to the last one. That last one. That time no different from the other times, except they tell us, try to blow a bridge up. Not a big bridge like the movies but one that hang off a mountainside. Be hard to fix afterward. It also be hard to get to. We lose one guy, new guy name of Winter, just trying to get to the fucking bridge. That be bad in a special kind of way. You get used to guys getting shot or be wasted by frags and like that. But to fall like a hundred feet onto rocks be a different kind of bad and it just break his back or something. He laying there and crying, till all the world where we be, until Duke shut him up. So it be just Duke and Cherry and me, the chink. I am for going back. No fucking way they could blame us for that. But Duke crazy for action. Always be crazy for killing. And Cherry would follow Duke anywhere. I think he a fag even then. Later I do know when the monster killed them.
This is where I usually feel the need to change. It's natural to adjust one's mode of discourse to a level appropriate to the subject at hand, is it not? To talk about this monster requires addressing such concepts as disassociation and multiple personality, if only to discount them, and it would be awkward to speak of these things directly the way I normally speak as chink. This does not mean that there are two or several personalities resident within the sequestered hide of this disabled black veteran. It only means that I can speak in different ways. You could as well if you grew up switching back and forth among Spanish, Chinese, and two flavors of English, chocolate and vanilla. It might also help if you had learned various Vietnamese dialects, and then spent the past twenty years in a succession of small rooms, mainly reading and writing. There still be the bad motherfucker in here. He simply uses appropriate language. The right tool for the job, or the right weapon. Let me save us some time by demonstrating the logical weakness of some facile first-order rationalizations that always seem to come up. One, that this whole monster business is a bizarre lie I concocted and have stubbornly held on to for twenty years, which requires that it never have occurred to me that recanting it would result in much better treatment and possibly release. Two, that the monster is some sort of psychological shield or barrier that I have erected between myself and the enormity of the crime I committed. That hardly holds up to inspection, since my job and life at that time comprised little more than a succession of premeditated cold-blooded murders. I didn't kill the two men, but if I had, it wouldn't have bothered me enough to require elaborate psychological defenses. Three, that I murdered Duke and Cherry because I was upset at discovering them engaged in a homosexual act. I am and was indifferent toward that aberration or hobby. Growing up in the ghetto and going directly from there to an army prison in Vietnam, I witnessed perversions for which you psychologists don't even have names. Then, of course, there is the matter of the supposed eyewitness. It seemed particularly odious to me at the time that my government would prefer the testimony of an erstwhile enemy soldier over one of its own. I see the process more clearly now, and realize that I was convicted before the court-martial was even convened. The details? You know what a Hoi Chan was? You're too young. Well, Chiu Hoi is Vietnamese for open arms. If an enemy soldier came up to the barbed wire with his hands up, shouting Chiu Hoi, then in theory he would be welcomed into our loving, also open, arms and rehabilitated. Unless he was killed before people could figure out what he was saying, the rehabilitated ones were called Hoi Chans, and sometimes were used as translators, and so forth. Anyhow, this Vietnamese deserter's story was that he had been following us all day, staying out of sight, waiting for an opportunity to surrender. I don't believe that for a second. Nobody moves that quietly, that fast, through unfamiliar jungle. Duke had been a professional hunting guide back in the world, and he would have heard any slightest movement. What do I say happened? You must have read the transcript. I see. You want to check me for consistency. I had sustained a small but deep wound in the calf, a fragment from a rifle grenade, I believe, I did elude capture, but the wound slowed me down. We had blown the bridge at 1310, which was when the guards broke for lunch, and had agreed to rendezvous by 1430 near a large banyan tree about a mile from the base of the cliff. It was after 1500 when I got there, and I was worried. Winter had been carrying our only radio when he fell, and if I wasn't at the LZ with the other two, they would sensibly enough leave without me. I would be stranded, wounded, lost. I was relieved to find them still waiting. In this sense, I may have caused their deaths. If they had gone on, the monster might have killed only me. 
This is the only place where my story and that of the Hoi Chan are the same. They were indeed having sacks. I waited under cover rather than interrupt them. Yes, I know. This is where he testified I jumped them and did all those terrible things. Like he had been sitting off to one side, waiting for them to finish their business. What a bunch of bullshit. What actually happened— What actually happened— was that I was hiding there behind some bamboo, waiting for them to finish, so we could get on with it, when there was this sudden loud crashing in the woods on the other side of them, and bang! There was the monster. It was bigger than any man, and black. Not black like me, but glossy black, like shiny hair. And it just flat smashed into them, bashed them apart. Then it was on Cherry. I could hear bones crack like sticks. It bit him between the legs, and that was enough for me. I was gone. I heard a couple of short bursts from Duke's Tommy gun, but I didn't go back to check it out. Just headed for the LZ as fast as my leg would let me. So I made a big mistake. I lied. Wouldn't you? I'm supposed to tell them sorry the rest of the squad got eaten by a werewolf? So while I'm waiting for the helicopter, I make up this believable account of what happened at the bridge. The slick comes and takes me back to the fire base, where the medics dress the wound and I debrief to the major there. They send me to Tui Hua, nice hospital on the beach, and I debrief again to a bunch of captains and a bird colonel. They tell me I'm in for a silver star. So I'm resting up there in the ward, reading a magazine, when in comes a couple of MPs, and they grab me and haul me off to the stockade. Isn't that just like the army, to have a stockade and a hospital? What has happened is that this gook, Honorable Hoi Chan Nguyen Von Trong, has come out of the woodwork with his much more believable story. So I get railroaded and wind up in jail. Come on, now, it's all in the transcript. I'm tired of telling it. It upsets me. Oh, all right. This Nguyen claims he was a guard at the bridge we blew up, and he'd been wanting to escape, they don't say desert, ever since they'd left Hanoi a few months before. Walking down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So, in the confusion after the blast, he runs away. He hears Duke and Cherry and follows them, waiting for the right opportunity to go Chiu Hoi. I told you how improbable that actually is. So he's waiting in the woods while they blow each other, and up walks me. I get the drop on them with my Thompson. I make Cherry tie Duke to the tree. Then I tie Cherry up, facing him. Then I castrate Cherry with my teeth. You believe that? And then, with my teeth and fingernails, I flay Duke, skin him alive, from the neck down, while he's watching Cherry die. Then, for dessert, I bite off his cock, too. Then I cut them down and stroll away. You got that? This Nguyen claims to have watched the whole thing. Must have taken hours. Like he never had a chance to interrupt my little show. What, did I hang on to my weapon all the time I was nibbling away? Makes a lot of sense. After I leave, he say he try to help the two men. Dookie say be still alive, but not worth much. Say he follow Duke's gestures and get the Polaroid out of his pack. When those pictures show up at the trial, I be a had daddy. Forget that his story ain't making sense. Forget, for Christ's sake, that he be the fucking enemy. Picture of Duke be still alive and his guts all hanging out. This god-awful look on his face. I could have been fucking Sister Teresa, and they wouldn't have listened to me. At this point the respondent was silent for more than a minute, apparently controlling rage, perhaps tears. When he continued speaking, it was with the cultured white man's accent again. I know you are constrained not to believe me, but in order to understand what happened over the next few years, 
you must accept as tentatively true the fantastic premises of my delusional system. Mainly, that's the reasonable assertion that I didn't mutilate my friends, and the unreasonable one that the Cambodian jungle hides at least one glossy black humanoid over seven feet tall with the disposition of a barracuda. If you accept that this monster exists, then where does that leave Mr. Nguyen von Krong? One possibility is that he saw the same thing I did, and lied for the same reason I initially did, because no one in his right mind would believe the truth. But his lie implicated me, I suppose, for verisimilitude. A second possibility is the creepy one, that Nguyen was somehow allied with the monster, in league with him. The third possibility is that they were the same. If the second or the third were true, it would probably be a good policy for me never to cross tracks with Nguyen again, or at least never to meet him unarmed. From that it followed that it would be a good precaution for me to find out what had happened to him after the trial. A maximum security mental institution is far from an ideal place from which to conduct research, but I had several things going for me. The main thing was that I was not, despite all evidence to the contrary, actually crazy. Another was that I could take advantage of people's preconceptions, which is to say, prejudices. I can tune my language from a mildly accented Jamaican dialect to the almost impenetrable patois that I hid behind while I was in the army. Since white people assume that the smarter you are, the more like them you sound, and since most of my keepers were white, I could control their perception of me pretty well. I was a dumb nigger, who with their help was getting a little smarter. Finally I wangled a work detail in the library, run by a white lady who thought she was hard-ass, but had a heart of purest tapioca. Loved to see us goof off so long as we were reading. I was gentle and helpful and appreciative of her guidance. She let me read more and more, and, of course, I could take books back to my cell. There was no record of many of the books I checked out. Computer books. She was a nice woman, but fortunately not free of prejudice. It never occurred to her that it might not be a good idea to leave her pet darky alone with the computer terminal. Once I could handle the library's computer system, my Nguyen project started in earnest. Information networks are wonderful, and computerized ordering and billing is, for a thief, the best tool since the credit card. I could order any book in print. After all, I opened the boxes, shelved the new volumes, and typed up the catalog card for each book, if I wanted it to be catalogued. Trying to find out what the monster was, I read all I could find about extraterrestrials, werewolves, mutations, all that science fiction garbage. I read up on Southeast Asian religions and folk tales, psychology books, because Occam's razor can cut the person who's using it, and maybe I was crazy after all. Nothing conclusive came out of any of it. I had seen the monster for only a couple of seconds, but the quick impression was, of course, branded on my memory. The face was intelligent, perhaps I should say sentient, but it was not at all human. Two eyes, okay, but no obvious nose or ears. Mouth too big and lots of teeth like a shark's, long fingers with too many joints, and claws. No mythology or pathology that I read about produced anything like it. The other part of my Nguyen project was successful. I used the computer to track him down, through my own court records and various documents that had been declassified through the Freedom of Information Act. Not surprisingly, he had emigrated to the United States just before the fall of Saigon. By 1986, he had his own fish market in San Francisco. Pillar of the community, the bastard. Eighteen years of exemplary behavior, and I worked my way down to minimum security. It was a more comfortable and freer life, 
but I didn't see any real chance of parole. I probably couldn't even be paroled if I'd been white and had bitten off the cocks of two black men. I might get a medal, but not a parole. So I had to escape. It wasn't hard. I assumed that they would alert Nguyen, and perhaps watch him, or even guard him for a while, so for two years I stayed away from San Francisco, burying myself in a dirt-poor black neighborhood in Washington. I saved my pennies and purchased, or contrived, the tools I would need when I eventually confronted him. Finally I boarded a greyhound, crawled to San Francisco, and rested up a couple of days. Then, for another couple of days, I kept an intermittent watch on the fish market, to satisfy myself that Nguyen wasn't under guard. He lived in a two-room apartment in the rear of the store. I popped the back door lock a half hour before closing, and hid in the bedroom. When I heard him lock the front door, I walked in and pointed a forty-four magnum at his face. That was the most tense moment for me. I more than half expected him to turn into the monster. I had even gone to the trouble of casting my own bullets of silver, in case that superstition turned out to be true. He asked me not to shoot, and took out his wallet. Then he recognized me, and clammed up. I made him strip to his shorts, and tied him down with duct tape to a wooden chair. I turned the television on fairly loud, since my homemade silencer was not perfect, and traded the magnum for a twenty-two automatic. It made about as much noise as a fly-swatter each time I shot. There are places where you can shoot a person, even with a twenty-two, and he will die quickly and without too much pain. There are other sights that are quite the opposite. Of course I concentrated on those, trying to make him talk. Each time I shot him, I dressed the wound so there would be a minimum of blood loss. I first shot him during the evening news, and he lasted well into Johnny Carson, with a new bullet each half hour. He never said a word, or cried out, just stared. After he died, I waited a few hours, and nothing happened, so I walked to the police station and turned myself in. That's it. So here we be now. I know it be life for me. Maybe it be that rubber room. I ain't care. This be the only place be safe. The monster he know. I can feel. This is the end of the transcript proper. The respondent did not seem agitated when the guards led him away. Consistent with his final words, he seemed relieved to be back in prison, which makes his subsequent suicide mystifying. The circumstances heighten the mystery, as the attached coroner's note indicates. State of California, Department of Corrections, Forensic Pathology Division, Glenn Malin, M.D., Ph.D., Chief of Research. I have read about suicides that were characterized by sudden hysterical strength, including a man who had apparently choked himself to death by throttling, though I seem to recall that it was a heart attack that actually killed him. The case of Royce Chink Jackson is one I would not have believed if I had not seen the body myself. The body is well-muscled, but not unusually so. When I'd heard how he died, I assumed he was a mesomorphic weightlifter type. Bones are hard to break. Also, his fingernails are cut to the quick. It must have taken a burst of superhuman strength to tear his own flesh without being able to dig in. My first specialty was thoracic surgery, so I well know how physically difficult it is to get to the heart. It's hard to believe that a person could tear out his own. It's doubly hard to believe that someone could do it after having brutally castrated himself. I do have to confirm that that is what happened. The corridor leading to his solitary confinement cell is under constant video surveillance. No one came or went from the time the door was shut behind him until breakfast time, when the body was discovered. He did it to himself. 
and in total silence. GM WR Joe Haldeman is the author of The Forever War, Mind Bridge, All My Sins Remembered, Dealing in Futures, and The World's Trilogy. A winner of both the Hugo and the Nebula Award, his short works have appeared in Playboy, Omni, and many other magazines and anthologies since the early 1970s. He recently completed a screenplay and is currently at work on new short stories and a novel. Lacuni by Carl Edward Wagner They were resting, still joined together, in the redwood hot tub, water pushing in bubbling surges about their bodies. Elaine watched as the hot vortex caught up streamers of her semen, swirled it away like boiled confetti, dissipating it throughout the turbulence. I'm disseminated, she thought. Elaine said, I feel reborn. Alan kissed the back of her neck and brushed her softening nipples with his fingertips. Your breasts are getting so full. Are you stepping up the estrogens? His detumescent penis, still slick with Vaseline, tickled as it eased out of Elaine's ass. Alan's right hand moved down through the warm water, milked the last droplets of orgasm from Elaine's flaccid cock. Gently he turned Elaine around, kissed her lovingly, probing his tongue deep into her mouth. Here, said Alan, breaking their kiss. He pushed down on Elaine's shoulders, urging her beneath the foaming surface. Elaine let her knees bend, ducked beneath the water that swirled about Alan's hips. As Alan's hands cupped her head, Elaine opened her mouth to accept Alan's slippery cock. She tasted the sweet smear of her own shit as she sucked in its entire length. Suddenly swelling, the cock filled her mouth, hardening as it pushed deep into her throat. Elaine gagged and tried to pull back, but Alan's hands forced her head hard into his pubic hair. Water filled Elaine's nostrils as she choked, bit down in an uncontrollable reflex. Alan's severed cock, bitten free at the base, wriggled inward, sliding past the back of her throat and down into her windpipe. Elaine wrenched free of Alan's hands. Blood and cum filled her lungs, spewed from her mouth in an obscene fountain as her head pushed toward the surface. But her head could not break through the surface, no matter how desperately she fought. There was a black, resilient layer that separated her from the air above, closed like wax over her face, pushed the vomit back into her lungs. A vortex of blood and semen sucked her soul into its warm depths. The first thing she heard was a monotone, chit, 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 like autumn leaves brushing the window. She became aware of an abrupt pressure against her abdomen, of vomit being expelled from her mouth. She was breathing in gasps. She opened her eyes. The layer of clinging blackness was gone. Shit, God damn it! said Blacklight, wiping vomit from her face and nostrils. Don't ever try that alone again. Elaine stared at him dumbly, oxygen returning to her brain. Beside her on the carpet lay the black leather bondage mask, its straps and laces cut. The attached, phallus-shaped gag, almost bitten through, was covered with her vomit. A spiked leather belt, also slashed, was coiled about the mask. Jesus, said Blacklight. You okay now? He was wrapping a blanket around her, busily tucking it in. There was a buzzing somewhere, in her head or in her pelvis. She wasn't sure. Memory was returning. I dreamed I was a man, she said, forcing her throat to speak. Fucking A. You nearly dreamed you were dead. I had a buddy from Nam who used to do this kind of shit. He'd been dead two days before they found him. Elaine looked upward at the chinning bar mounted high across her entrance hall doorway. The leather mask with its padded blindfold and gag, sensory deprivation and sensual depravity, cutting out the world, 
The belt looped around her neck, free end held in her hands as she kicked away the stool. The belt buckle should have slipped free when she fainted from lack of oxygen. Instead, its buckle had become entangled with the complex buckles of the bondage mask, not releasing, nearly suffocating her. Friends who had shown her how to experience visions of inner realities through this method had warned her, but until now there had been no problems, no worse than with the inversion apparatus. I heard you banging about on the floor, Blacklight explained, taking her pulse. He had been an army medic until he'd sectionated. No future for a broad six-foot-eight medic in the paddies. Thought maybe you were bawling somebody, but it didn't feel right. I busted in your door. Good job through two dead bolts and a chain, but Blacklight could do it. Her neighbor in the duplex loft had split last week, and the pizzeria downstairs was being redone as a vegetarian restaurant. Elaine might have lain there dead on the floor until her cats polished her bones. I dreamed I had a cock, she said, massaging her neck. Maybe you still do. Blacklight told her. He looked at his hands and went into the bathroom to wash them. Elaine wondered what he meant, then remembered. She reached down to flick off the vibrator switch on the grotesque dildo she had strapped around her pelvis. Gathering the blanket about herself, she made it to her feet and waited for Blacklight to come out of the bathroom. When she had removed the rest of her costume and washed herself, she put on a Chinese silk kimono and went to look for Blacklight. She felt little embarrassment. Between cheap smack and nom and killer acid and the hate, Blacklight's brain had been fried for most of his life. He was more reliable for deliveries than the Colombians, and old contacts supported him and his habit. Blacklight was standing in the center of her studio. The loft was little more than one big room with a few shelves and counters to partition space, staring uncertainly at an unfinished canvas. You better look closer at your model, or else you got a freak. The canvas was wall-sized, originally commissioned and never paid for by a trendy leather bar since closed. Blacklight pointed. Balls don't hang side by side like that. One dangles a little lower. Even a dyke ought to know that. It's not completed. Elaine said. She was looking at the bag of white powder Blacklight had dropped onto her bar. You want to know why? What? It's so they don't bang together. Who doesn't? Your balls. One slides away from the other when you mash your legs together. Terrific, said Elaine, digging a fingernail into the powder. You like it? The thing about balls. Elaine tasted a smear of coke, licking her fingertip. Uncut Peruvian flake, Blacklight promised, forgetting the earlier subject. Elaine sampled a nailful up each nostril. The ringing bitterness of the coke cut through the residues of vomit. Good shit. It's like yin and yang, Blacklight explained. Good and evil, light and dark. One doesn't correct a large and crazed biker. He was wrestling his fists together. Have you ever heard the story of love and hate? Across the knuckles of his right fist was tattooed love. Across those of his left, hate. Elaine had seen The Night of the Hunter, and she was not impressed. An ounce? One humongous O.Z. Blacklight was finger-wrestling with himself. They got to be kept apart, love and hate, but they can't keep from coming together and trying to see which one's stronger. Elaine opened the drawer beneath her telephone and counted out the bill she had set aside earlier. Blacklight forgot his Robert Mitchum impersonation and accepted the money. I got five paintings to finish before my show opens in Soho, okay? That's next month. This is the end of this month. My ass is fucked and I'm stone out of inspiration. So give me a break and split now, right? Just don't try too much freebasing with that shit, okay? Blacklight advised. He craned his thick neck to consider another unfinished canvas. 
It reminded him of someone. But then he forgot who before he could form the thought. Your brain is like your balls. Did you know that? He picked up the thread of the last conversation he could remember. No, I didn't know that. Two hunks rolling around inside your skull, Blacklight said, nodding his fists side by side. They swim in your skull side by side, just like your balls swing around in your scrotum. Why are the two halves of your brain instead of just one big chunk, like, say, your heart? I give up. Blacklight massaged his fists together. So they don't bang together, see? Got to keep them apart. Love and hate. Yin and yang. Look, I got to work. Elaine shook a gram's worth of lines out of the baggie and onto the glass top of her coffee table. Sure. You sure you're going to be okay? No more anoxic rushes with a mask on. And thanks. You got a beer? Try the fridge. Blacklight found a St. Pauli and plinked the non-twist-off cap free with his thumb. Elaine thought he looked like a black-bearded Wookiee. I had a buddy from Nam who offed himself trying that, Blacklight suddenly remembered. You told me. Like, whatever turns you on, just don't drop the hammer when you don't mean to. Want a line? No, I'm off, Charlie. Fucks up my brain. Blacklight's eyes glazed in an effort to concentrate. Off the goddamn dinks, he said. Off them all. There were old tracks fighting with the tattoos as he raised his arm to kill the beer. Are you sure you're going to be okay? He was pulling out a fresh beer from behind the tuna salad. Elaine was a foot shorter and a hundred pounds lighter, and aerobicized muscles weren't enough to overawe blacklight. Look, I'm all right now. Thanks. Just let me get back to work, okay? I mean, deadline-wise, this is truly Crunch City. Want some crystal? Got a dynamite price. Got some. Look, I think I'm going to throw up some more. Want to give me some privacy? Blacklight dropped the beer bottle into his shirt pocket. Hang loose. He started for the door. The beer bottle seemed no larger than a pen in his pocket. Oh, he said, I can get you something better. A new one. Takes out the blank spots in your head. Just met a new contact who's radically into designer drugs. Weird dude. Working on some new kind of speed. I'll take some, said Elaine, opening the door. She really needed to sleep for a week. Catch you later, promised Blacklight. He paused halfway through the door, dug into his denim jacket pocket. Superb blotter, he said handing her a dingy square of dolphin-patterned paper. Very inspirational. Use it and grow. Are you sure you're going to be okay? Elaine shut the door. Mr. Fixit promised to come by tomorrow, or the next morning after that, for sure. Elaine replaced the chain with one from the bathroom door, hammered the torn-out and useless dead bolts back into place for her own peace of mind, then propped a wooden chair against the doorknob. Feeling better, she pulled on a leotard and tried a gram or so of this and that. She was working rather hard, and the airbrush was a bit loud, although her stereo would have drowned out most sounds of entry in any event. That blue, said Kane from behind her. Cerulean, to be sure, but why? It impresses me as antagonistic to the overdone flesh tones you've so laboriously mauled and muddled to confuse the faces of the two lovers. Elaine did not scream. There would be no one to hear. She turned very cautiously. A friend had once told her how to react in these situations. Are you an art critic? The chair was still propped beside her door. Perhaps it was a little askew. Merely a dilettante, lied Kane. An interested patron of the arts for many years. That is not a female escutcheon. It shouldn't be. Possibly not. 
I'm expecting my boyfriend at any minute. He's bringing over some buyers. Are you waiting for them? Blacklight contacted me. He thought you'd like something stronger to help you finish your gallery collection. Elaine decided to take a breath. He was big, very big. His belted trench coat could have held two of her and an umbrella. A biker friend of Blacklight's was her first thought. They hadn't quite decided whether to be hitmen for the Mafia or their replacements in the lucrative drug trade. He was a head shorter than Blacklight, probably weighed more. There was no fat. His movements reminded Elaine of her karate instructor. His face, although unscarred, called to mind an NFL lineman who'd flunked his advertising screen test. His hair and short beard were a shade darker than her hannahed Grace Jones flat top. She did not like his blue eyes, quickly looked away. Here, said Kane. She took from his spade-like hand a two-gram glass file, corner headshop stuff, spoon attached by an aluminum chain. How much? There was a can of mace in the drawer beneath the telephone. She didn't think it would help. "'New lot,' said Kane, sitting down on the arm of her largest chair. He balanced his weight, but she flinched. "'Trying to recreate a lost drug from long ago. Perfectly legal. How long ago? Before you'd remember. It's a sort of super speed. Super speed? Kane dropped the rest of the way into the chair. It held his weight. He said, Can you remember everything that has happened to you, or that you have done, for the past forty-eight hours? Of course. Tell me about eleven-thirty-eight this morning. All right. Lane was open to a dare. I was in the shower. I'd been awake all night, working on the paintings for the show. I called my agent's answering machine, then took a shower. I thought I'd try some TM afterward, before getting back to work. But what were you thinking at 11.38 this morning? About the showing? No. Elaine decided it was too risky to jump for the phone. I forget what I was thinking exactly, she conceded. Would you like some coffee? Scalding coffee in the face might work. What was on your mind at 9.42 last night? I was fixing coffee. Would you like some? At 9.42. Exactly then. All right, I don't remember. I was flipping around the cable dial, I think. Maybe I was daydreaming. Lacuni, said Kane. Say what? Gaps. Missing pieces. Missing moments of memory. Time lost from your consciousness, and thus from your life. Where? Why? He rolled the file about on his broad palm. No one really remembers every instant of life. There are always forgotten moments, daydreams, musings, as you like. It's lost time from your life. Where does it go? You can't remember. You can't even remember forgetting that moment. Part of your life is lost in vacant moments, in lapses of total consciousness. Where does your conscious mind go, and why? This, and he tossed the glass file toward her, will remove those lost moments. No gaps in your memory. Wondering where your car keys are, where you left your sunglasses, who called before lunch, what was foremost in your mind when you woke up. Better than speed or coke. Total awareness of your total consciousness. No more lacuni. I don't have any cash on hand. There's no charge. Think of it as a trial sample. I know, the first one is free. That's meant to be a mirror, isn't it? Kane returned to the unfinished painting. The blue made me think of water. It's someone making love to a reflection. Someone, said Elaine. Narcissus? I call it Lick It Till It Bleeds. I'll make a point of attending the opening. 
There won't be one unless people leave me alone to work. Then I'll be getting along. Cain seemed to be standing without ever having arisen from the chair. By the way, I wouldn't shove that. New lab equipment. Never know about impurities. I don't like needlework anyway, Elaine told him, dipping into the file with the attached spoon. She snorted cautiously, felt no burn. Clean enough. She heaped the spoon twice again. She closed her eyes and inhaled deeply. Already she could feel a buzz. Trust Blacklight to steer her onto something good. She was trying another spoonful when it occurred to her that she was alone once again. Blacklight secured the lid of the industrial chemical drum and finished his beer. The body of the designer drug lab's former owner had folded inside nicely. Off to the illegal toxic waste dump with the others. Some suckers just can't tell which way the wind blows. Did you really land in a flying saucer? he asked, rummaging in the cooler for another beer. Kane was scowling over a chromatogram. For sure. Looked just like a 1957 Chrysler 300C hubcap. Blacklight puzzled over it while he chugged his beer. The prettiest girl in his junior high. Her family had had a white 300C convertible. Was there a connection? Then how come you speak English so good? I was Tor Johnson's stand-in and Plan 9 from outer space. Must have done a hundred retakes before we got it down right. Blacklight thought about it. Did you know Bella Lugosi? Kane jabbed at the computer keyboard, watching the monitor intently. I've got to get some better equipment. There's a methyl group somewhere where it shouldn't be. Is that bad? Might potentiate. Start thinking of another guinea pig. At first she became aware of her hands. It was 1.01.36 a.m., said the digital clock beside her bed. She stepped back from the painting and considered her hands. They were tobacco-stained and paint-smeared, and her nails needed polish. How could she hope to create with hands such as these? Elaine glared at her hands for forty-three seconds, found no evidence of improvement. The back of her skull didn't feel quite right either. It tingled, like when her mohawk started to grow out last year. Maybe some wine. There was an opened bottle of Leapfrau milk in the refrigerator. She poured a glass, sipped, set it aside in distaste. Elaine thought about the wine for the next eighty-six seconds, reading the label twice. She made a mental note never to buy it again. Stirring through a canister of artificial sweetener packets, she found half a lewd, washed it down with the wine. She returned to Lick It Till It Bleeds, and worked furiously, with total concentration and with mounting dissatisfaction, for the next one hour, thirty-one minutes, and eighteen seconds. Her skin itched. Elaine glowered at the painting for another seven minutes, nineteen seconds. She decided to phone Alan. An insomniac recording answered her. The number she had dialed was no longer in service. Please. Elaine tried to visualize Alan. How long had it been? Her skin itched. Had she left him, or had he driven her out? And did it really matter? She hated him. She had always hated him. She hated all that she had previously been. Her body felt strange, like a stranger's body. The leotard was binding her crotch. Stupid design. Elaine stripped off her leotard and tights. Her skin still itched, like a caterpillar's transformation throes, death throes of former life. Did the caterpillar hate the moth? She thought about Alan. She thought about herself. Love and hate. There was a full-length mirror on her closet door. Elaine stared at her reflection, caressing her breasts and crotch. She moved closer, pressed herself to the mirror, rubbing against her reflection. 
making love to herself, and hating. Pressed against her reflection, Elaine could not ignore the finest of scars, where the plastic surgeon had implanted silicone in her once flat breasts. Fingering her surgically constructed vagina, Elaine could not repress the memories of her sex change operation, repress the awareness of her former maleness. Every instant remembered. Of joy, of pain, of longing, of rage, of hatred, of self-loathing, of being Alan. Her fists hammered her reflection, smashing it into a hundred brittle moments. Blood trickled from her fists, streamed along her arms, made curling patterns across her breasts and belly. She licked her blood and found it good. It was shed for herself. Gripping splinter shards of mirror, Elaine crossed to her unfinished painting. She stood before the life-sized figures, loving and hating what she had created. Her fists moved across the canvas, slashing it into mad patterns. Take! This is my body! Given for me! Blacklight was finishing a cold anchovy and black olive pizza. He considered his greasy, sauce-stained hands, wiped them on his jeans. Stains were exchanged, with little disruption of status quo. He licked his tattooed knuckles clean. It was raining somewhere, because the roof of the old warehouse leaked monotonously away from the light. He watched Kane. Maybe Lionel Atwill's caged gorilla on the loose in the lab. Maybe Rondo Hatton as Mr. Hyde. So what are Lacuni? Kane was studying a biochemical supply catalog. Gaps, cavities, blank spaces. Spaces are important, Blacklight said. He knotted his pizza-stained fists and rolled their knuckles together. Do you know how atomic bombs work? Used to build them, Kane said. They're overrated. You take two hunks of plutonium or something, Blacklight informed him. Big as your fist. Now then, keep spaces between them, and it's on safety. But, and he knocked his fists against one another, take away the spaces, slam them together. Critical mass. Kerblooey. He punctuated the lecture with an explosive belch. So that's why there's always got to be spaces in between, Blacklight concluded. Like the two halves of your brain. Id and ego, yin and yang, male and female. Even in your thoughts, you've got to have these gaps, moments to daydream, to forget, to be absent-minded. What happens when you fill in all the lacunae? Critical mass, said Kane. The mirror was a doorway, clouded and slippery with the taste of blood. Clutching angry shards of glass, Alan and Elaine waited on opposite sides, waited each for the other to break through. Carl Edward Wagner's books include Darkness Weaves, Death Angel's Shadow, Bloodstone, Dark Crusade, Night Winds, The Road of Kings, and In a Lonely Place. A former psychiatrist, he is the publisher of books under the Carcosa imprint, as well as editor of the annual series The Year's Best Horror Stories. He has won the British Fantasy Award four times, and the World Fantasy Award twice. Part Two They're Coming for You Pale Trembling Youth by W. H. Pugmire and Jessica Amanda Salmonson Dykes, kikes, spicks, mix, fags, drags, gooks, spooks. More of us are outsiders than aren't. And that's what the dear young ones too often fail to see. They think they've learned it all by age fifteen. Perhaps they have. But they're not the only ones who've learned it. They're wise youngsters, no doubt about it, and I wish them all survival of one kind or another, though few of them will have it. They're out there on the streets at night. They've spiked their hair and dyed it. 
They've put roofing nails through their earlobes and scratched their lovers' initials in the whites of their eyes. And they're such beauties, these children. I have empathy for them, though by their standards at thirty I'm an old man. Am I a dirty old man? Perhaps. But I keep my hands to myself, and I'm outraged by the constant exploitation I have seen. I help who I can, when I can. They laugh at me for it. I don't mind. Much as they hate to admit it, they appreciate the helping hand. They assuredly need it. The new bands have power. They have raw, wild, gorgeous, naive energy. The temporary nature of these bands, the transience of the sound they create, the ephemeral nature of their performances and their youth has a literal and symbolic truth to it that breaks my heart. Ah, the dear young ones! Their own parents hate them. Their parents hate themselves. How morosely, pathetically beautiful it all is. But I have my criticisms. I don't tell them what to do with their lives, but I do tell them they're not the first and only ones to know. They all think they've invented it. Invented everything. Twelve-year-old artists of the street. Don't ever doubt that some of them are geniuses. Their music, dress, and Xerox flyers are undeniably brilliant works of art. Stripped of technical gaudiness and the veneer of social dishonesty, these kids and their art alienate people because of the reality that's exposed. Reality is pain. But none of it is new. A punk who's a good friend, a good kid, I gave him a rare old Dada poster for his birthday. He loved it. He thought it was something new. No, sir, I told him. It was printed before World War I. He was impressed. He got some white paste and smeared it onto the window of an uptown jewelry store. What brilliance! It breaks my heart. So there's nothing new, least of all pain. It's the oldest thing around. I want to tell them, yes, you're outsiders. Yes, this thing you're feeling really is pain. But you're not alone. Or you're not alone in being alone. A poison-bad planet. For everyone. On the north side of Lake Union, visible from about any high point in and around the city, is a little spot called Gasworks Park. Considering how visible it is on the lake's edge, it's rather out of the way. It has the appearance of war's aftermath, a bombed factory. When the Gasworks closed shop several decades back, no one knew what to do with that extraordinary network of chimneys and pipes and silos. For years they sat rusting. Then someone had the fat idea of painting the whole thing, laying a lawn and calling it a park. It looks good. It looks monstrous. It is urban decadence at its best and worst. It's not much frequented at night. A pathetic old faggot took me across on his sailboat. He's not only pathetic, but rich. Spent his whole life buying his way to the inside. But he's an outsider, too. We met in a downtown park in the days of my own alienated childhood, when he wasn't much younger, but his gums were less black, and we've pretended we're friends ever since. I had been on his boat most of the late afternoon and early evening, until the sun was going down. Then I said, I don't need to go back into town. Let me ashore at Gasworks Park. He let me off. I stood on the concrete landing and waved to the old man, who looked almost heroic, pulling at the rigging, but not quite. The sun had set. The last streaks of orange were visible beyond the city's silhouette. The skyscrapers south of the lake were shining like boxes full of stars. I turned my back, climbed the grassy knoll, and gazed toward the antiquated gasworks. The garish paint had been rendered invisible by the darkness. I breathed deeply of the cold, clean evening air, and felt invigorated. The decayed structure before me was huge, the skeleton of a gargantuan beast. Its iron pipes, winding steel stairs and catwalks, variety of ladders, planks, chains, and tanks, had a very real aesthetic charm. Danger, keep off, a sign read on a chain-length fence. Even in the darkness, the evidence of the structure's conquerors, their graffiti, 
was palely visible on the surface of its heights. Hearing footsteps in the gravel behind me, I turned and saw a tall, skinhead punk shambling toward the fence. He nodded and smiled at me, then leaned toward the fence, curling fingers around the links. I thought I detected a sadness in his eyes. He was looking upward into one particular part of the gasworks with such intensity that I could not help but follow his gaze. It seemed that he was staring at a particular steel stairway that led up and into a long pipe. The sound of his deep sigh made me look at him again. He had taken a pack of cigarettes from a pocket in his black leather jacket. Smoke? he offered, holding the pack toward me. No, thank you, I replied. Kindness and gentility, contrasted against a violent image, no longer surprised me in these youths. Something else, ain't it? he said, nodding at the structure. It is, I replied, not in a mood for conversation. He continued. My band and I used to come here at midnight to record tapes of us banging on parts of it. Fucking inspiration. You get some really cool sounds. You're in a punk band? I asked lamely. No, industrial band. Kind of an offshot of punk and hardcore. A lot of screaming and banging on pipes and weird electronic sounds. Put it all together and it makes an intense noise. Hmm, I said, having trouble imagining why anyone would want to sit around banging on pipes and screaming. I must occasionally admit to a gap between this generation and mine. But we broke up, he continued in a quiet voice. Our singer hanged himself. Up there. He turned to gaze once more at that particular section of the structure. I felt a chill. Talk of death was unpleasant to me, and this was too sudden an introduction of the subject. I'm sorry, I said. Yeah, it's sad. He had a great voice. He could scream and make you feel like you'd die. Then he could sing so tenderly you couldn't hold back tears. But he was messed up. His dad was always getting drunk and beating on him. So he took to the streets, came to live with me and some others in an abandoned building. We called him Imp. He was so small. He'd never eat, just drink coffee and do a lot of speed. He shook all the time. And he had so little color to his skin that some of us took to calling him the pale, trembling youth which he didn't like as much as Imp. He paused to take a drag from his cigarette. The night had grown especially dark. The gasworks stood silently before us and seemed to listen to the young man's tale. He really loved this place. He used to come at night with a wrench or hammer to investigate sounds. He slept here a lot. He'd bring his girls here. He stopped again, his face sad. His last girlfriend killed herself with sleeping pills. He loved her like none of the others. A few days later he was found up there, swinging from that pipe, his studded belt around his broken neck. How old was he? Sixteen. After a pause he tossed his cigarette to the ground and shoved his hands into pockets. Well, it's getting cold. Think I'll head on back to the district and find me some anarchy and beer. He smiled kindly. I returned his smile. Nice talking to you. We nodded to each other. He turned and stalked into the darkness. It had indeed grown cold, but as I turned to look once more at the weird structure, I felt drawn near. Looking with dismay at the fence before me, I took hold of it and began to climb. When I reached the top of the fence, I moaned softly at the difficulty climbing over and down the other side. I felt cold air against my neck. Looking at a section of the gasworks where the punk had taken his life, I thought I saw a shadowy figure watching me. Then the shadows blended and the image was gone. Wind played with my hair. With sudden resolve I climbed over the top of the fence, almost falling down the other side. I stood near a huge rusted pipe. It was perhaps forty feet long and five feet high. I felt a thrill of boyish excitement, for I have had a love of tunnels since I was small. Going to one end of the pipe, I stood to look inside. I entered. My footfalls echoed weirdly as my boots hit the metal surface. 
The sides felt cold and rough. When I reached the middle, I sat down, bending knees to chest, listening to the sounds of evening. Then I heard a pinging coming from the end of the pipe that I had entered. I looked and saw a small person standing there, looking at me. From its stance I took it to be a boy. The figure held something in its hand, which it slowly, nonchalantly struck against the pipe. Then my vision seemed to blur. I rubbed my eyes with shaky fingers. When I looked again, I saw nothing. I sat for what seemed endless moments. Finally I raised myself on unsteady legs. From above came a sudden banging, a horrible and ferocious sound, as though a madman were leaping from place to place and violently striking at pipes and metal surfaces with something large. The sound of it shook the pipe I was in. I felt the reverberations like a throbbing pain in my skull. Shouting in alarm, I fell to my knees, covering my ears with moist palms. On and on it went, until I was sure that I would lose my mind. Then it stopped. For a few moments all I could hear was the ringing in my ears. Then another sound came to me. Low sobbing. I had never heard such misery and loneliness in a voice. It tore my heart to listen to it. It froze my soul. Gradually it faded into silence. I was too weak to rise. When at last I found the strength, I crawled weakly out of the pipe into the waiting dark. W. H. Pugmire claims to be a militant punk rock homosexual who worships death and reads H. P. Lovecraft religiously. He was the publisher of Midnight Fantasies, a magazine devoted to Lovecraft, and of the regional rock magazine Punk Lust. Jessica Amanda Salmonson has published five novels, of which Ulu Can and the Beautiful Madwoman is the most recent. She is also a poet, innocent of evil, and World Fantasy Award winning anthologist, Amazons. Her latest books are the collection A Silver Thread of Madness and the anthology Heroic Visions Two. Forthcoming is a contemporary horror novel, Anthony Shriek. Muzak for Torso Murderers by Mark Laidlaw Donnie gets to work with the quick-setting cement. It will probably have hardened before most of the blood has congealed in the chest's cavities. The brass lion's feet on the antique bathtub gleam from his attentive polishing, as does the porcelain interior. Scoured so many times with Bonami that the scratch marks of steel wool pads appear in places. Shiny black plastic wrapped parcels almost fill the basin. Whistle while you work, he thinks. But the cement is so heavy that he hasn't any breath to spare for frivolities. This is the part of his work that he likes less every time. Messy cement, sweaty, grunting labor. Disgusting slopping sounds as the viscous mixture oozes over the plastic bundles and fills the tub to brimming. There it sits like his mother's oatmeal, untouched by any spoon. He can hear her in the kitchen while he works in the garage, her radio perpetually tuned to an easy listening station while you-know-what bubbles in a cauldron on the stove and her knife chops, 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 along with a thousand strings. He prefers Bernard Hermann, the score from Psycho, but she never lets him play his albums while she's in the house. Too disturbing, she says. If only she knew how much her music disturbs him. Donnie, are you almost done in there? Your dinner's ready. Be right there, he calls. Hands clean this time? I'll use Barack so honest. Under his breath, he allows himself a brief curse. Christmas. Of course, nothing ever goes right when he hurries, and thanks to his mother, he tips the wheelbarrow in which he'd mixed the cement, and the muck drips over his Oxfords. His new shoes. Another pair for the furnace. Another sweaty chore. It's only a movie, he tells himself, to make himself relax. Sometimes Mom makes his life unbearable. 
True, she feeds him, provides a home, sews his clothes, and buys him most, though not all, of the things he wants. The video cassette player, for instance, was her idea, but he'd had to purchase TCM secretly with his own allowance. Despite all she does for him, her regimen is at times too much for a son to endure. Hot meals at the same hour every day, always accompanied by oatmeal, just to fill you up, dear, and regular vegetable snacks in between. She doesn't believe in dessert. It's no wonder that he's had to develop outlets for his energy, secret pastimes, forbidden games. As he scrubs his hands with gritty powder, he feels the ever-present thrill of potential discovery. He doesn't fear the police, but if Mother ever finds out what goes on beneath her roof, well, he could get in real trouble. Donny, it's getting cold! But that is all part of the fun. Sometimes he wishes he could tell her. She is, after all, his only possible confidant. She might approve. On the other hand, Look at your nails, she says as he raises his first forkful of salad to his lips. Red dressing splatters the tablecloth. I thought you said you washed up. What is that? He examines his thumbnail and discovers a traitorous crescent of dark red film clotted up to the quick. He swallows the leaf of romaine and quickly digs under his nail with a tine of the fork. The deposit comes away in a rubbery lump. It's only Russian dressing, he lies. Dried stuff from the mouth of the jar when I twisted the cap off. Don't talk with food in your mouth. He nods and stabs a tomato, takes another bite. Too late. He remembers the blob on the end of the fork. He's a cannibal now. How about that? Have you decided what to do about a job? He nods, wishing she would turn down the radio. Send in the clowns is playing again. Sure, send them into the garage and he'd take care of them. Pull off their noses, shave their frizzy wigs, paint their mouths red with their own... I thought that woman from the agency called you. He shrugs and gives the ineluctable bowl of oatmeal a stir. As usual, it's much too sweet. She just wanted to find out my birthday, he says. I forgot to put it on the form. Well, wasn't that nice of her. Maybe they'll throw you a party. Maybe, he smiles to himself. She believes anything he tells her. The agency lady had called to ask if he wanted to work in a mailroom downtown, and of course he'd said he couldn't go that far, because Mother was ill, and he had to be able to get home quickly to fix her lunch and put her on the toilet, and by the time he'd gotten that far, the lady had said, I'm sorry, but all of our jobs are in the financial district. Maybe you should try an agency out in your neighborhood, perhaps one specializing in manual labor. Ugh! That was when he'd hung up. But it was fine with him. Now they should leave him alone. He doesn't like the thought of risking himself on a job anyway. He had almost come undone at the agency interview, and that was nothing. They'd given him forms on which to answer a great many personal questions. He had raced through them, neatly slashing the sections concerning work history. Then he had come to the tricky part. Essay questions. What would you do in this situation? Your superior comes into your office, complaining that you scheduled her for two crucial meetings at the same time. His neck itched with sweat. The office air conditioning chilled him. He felt as if he had swallowed a mouthful of monosodium glutamate. Throbbing spine, burning cheeks, torpid muscles. He scrawled, Apologize. Your supervisor makes a mistake on a memorandum, and you are blamed for the error. What would you do? Is it a man or a woman, he thought, as the fluorescent lights began to strobe. He carefully penciled. Explain to my supervisor's supervisor. From somewhere in the walls or acoustic tile ceiling of the office, sweet voices sang, Raindrops keep falling on my head as though it were a hymn, so sincere, so saccharine. 
For the third time in a week, a mailroom employee delivers your mail to the wrong address. You call him into your office, and he claims that your handwriting is illegible, and he cannot read the destination. What do you do? The Bacharach tune drove pins into his brain. Three times this week, he thought. God, that music! I ask him if he has seen the view from my window, and while he is looking away I hit him on the head with a marble ashtray. Then I lock the door, I take the saws out of my briefcase, spread plastic on the floor, and cut him up as quickly as I can, even working into my lunch hour to get the job done. I wrap the pieces separately in the plastic, cover them in brown butcher paper, type out address labels, and drop them in the mail. An advertisement for secluded retirement homes rescued him from committing this response to the agency files. He crumpled the form, staggered to the desk with hands dripping, and asked if he could have another. The secretary had stared at him as if he were an ape from the zoo. He felt enormous and ungainly, surrounded by polite clerks. "'I made a mistake,' he said. The second form took hours to complete— because he worked only during commercial breaks in the Muzak. And why had he gone to all that trouble in the first place? Because Mother had insisted. She had money, plenty of money. But she said a job would do him good. He had gone thirty-five years without a job. He saw no reason to start now. Besides, he had his own work to pursue. Sometimes it paid in cash— but the true rewards were hardly monetary. More oatmeal, Donnie? No, thanks, Mom. I'm stuffed. You just go watch TV. I'll do the dishes and come join you. Okay, Mom. He slouches into the living room, turns on the VCR, and takes an oft-handled cassette out of the rack. It is labeled, The Care Bears and the Land Without Feelings, a title he was sure would never interest his mother when he glued it to the cassette. He slips it into the player, turns on the set with the sound down low, listens to the dishes clinking in the kitchen. The remote control stays in his hand, in case Mom should come in at a bad time. And in this movie, all times are bad. Outside of a fever dream, the Care Bears could never have found themselves in a land so devoid of human or ursine sentiment as the one on the screen. Images swam out of his memory, merging with the light that plays across his eyes. It's only a movie, he tells himself. What have we here? Cross-sections of red meat, stumped limbs or trunks— no, it's the infernal sun, with flares strung out and heaving across the void, the raw stuff of violence on a cosmic scale. The sight of it makes him feel significant, attuned. His breathing comes swiftly in shallow gulps. The miasma of night begins to gather in his eyes and the pit of his gut, as if he's about to black out. He can hardly see the TV any more. The volume is turned down so low that his mother's music overwhelms the ominous soundtrack. Strings and synthesizers sigh. A chorus of castrati whimpers, Please, mister, please, as Texas Chainsaw Massacre buries itself in his eyes. Donnie, how about some iced tea? He jerks and switches from video to live TV, a news anchor woman mouths at him, apparently concerned for his well-being. What was that? she says. Add for some shocker, Mom. Oh, those horrid things. I swear I don't know what the world is coming to. Who does? To the left of the newscaster's head, bright letters appear beneath a stylized cartoon toilet bowl, whose rim is stained red. Basin Butcher he taps the volume control slightly until he can hear the TV over his mother's voice. Fifth in a series of apparently linked murders. Police say the body of another unidentified male was cut into pieces, wrapped in mylar, and embedded in cement inside five antique porcelain sinks. Did you know that someone set fire to Gracie's poodle? The poor little thing, really. First the poison bait, and now this. 
The TV news team switches to field coverage, the same it showed last night. He sits up to appreciate this replay. Channel 2 has the best footage. Policemen scramble down a dusky shore of the bay, stumbling among concrete blocks and rusting wrecks of old cars. The camera zooms in on five gleaming white sinks, standing out like porcelain idols against the choppy water. Seagulls dive to peck hungrily at the basins. The taps and handles gleam in the light of the setting sun. And so does he. An ambitious trick, but not as neat as the tub will be. The toilets had been a coarse guffaw of a murder, an attention-getter. Soon he will run out of the fixtures left over from his father's business. After one more tub, the next stage of his work will commence. There are dozens of statuary molds waiting to be filled with his homemade cement and flesh porridge, and more than enough cement powder to fulfill his dreams for the indefinite future. He need never expose himself by purchasing supplies. I hear that another poor woman was mugged at Safeway yesterday, right at the checkout counter, his mother says. The search continues for the person or persons responsible for the killings. Police seek information regarding a vehicle seen in the Bayshore area Wednesday night. An old model truck with wooden paneling. He switches the channel quickly, unnerved, and looks at his mother to make sure she hasn't been paying attention. She watches him steadily over her bifocals. "'What's wrong with you, Donnie? You haven't been yourself lately.' "'I don't know what you mean, Mom.' "'You don't talk to me any more. You're a stranger. You're tuckered out all the time, and I never see you when you're working. What are you doing out there, anyway?' I told you, Mom, it's a surprise. You're not supposed to know. She smiles, a prim expression that reassures him that she won't press any further, never fear. He gets up and gives her a kiss on the cheek. I love you, Mom. Why don't you sit down and I'll bring you some iced tea? Would you? What a darling. All right, I'll plump my fat old fanny down and take a rest. She chatters on as he enters the kitchen, opens the icebox, and takes out a tray, finds two tall glasses, and loads them with cubes. The tea is in a pitcher on the counter, next to the radio. And here the muzak is deafening. But he doesn't dare turn it down, though it makes the glasses chatter in his hands. Who's looking out from under the stairway? Everyone knows it's... Donny. He forces his fingers to relax before they crush the glasses. His teeth are clamped together. There is fog in his eyes and fear on his breath. He stands in darkness, fumbling for a way back to the light. His hands encounter a drawer. Donnie, come in here. He walks toward her voice like a servile mummy, stiff-legged, carrying drinks. The gleeful Muzak dictates his steps, sets the pace of his heart. He reaches the coffee table and starts to set down the drinks, only to find that he is not holding beverages after all. In either hand is a knife, not as sharp as his special knives, being for domestic use, but still sufficient for his purposes. On the screen, to which Mother draws his eyes with a bony finger, is frozen a frame from his video, a flayed corpse in a cemetery. TCM. He almost drops the knives. I put on the Care Bears, she says. His hands begin to shake as the Muzak blasts at his shoulders, pushing him closer to her, closer. Aren't they wonderful? He whispers. Such feeling, such care. Why, yes, she answers, looking past the knives that almost touch her throat. She doesn't see them. She smiles at Donnie. I thought we could watch them together. What's this cute fellow's name? He looks at the screen and lowers the knives. He never has a name, but later... He sets the knives on the coffee table, iced tea forgotten, and seats himself beside her. Later you'll meet Leatherface. Leatherface? And is he very nice? Oh, yes, he says. 
Very, very nice. And these are the Care Bears you watch every day? That's right. He nods eagerly, amazed by her blindness. She must see only what she wants to see. How could she believe anything but the best of her son? Her first sight of the corpse, where she had expected to find an animated teddy bear, must have snapped her mind. What a relief. It means he can finally be honest with her. After so much furtiveness, he can tell her his secrets and bask in her praise. She should be as proud of him as she'd be if he'd found a job or built a birdhouse. The video player whirs, begins to move again. Oh, Donnie, I see, she says in high-pitched merriment. I'm so glad we're together, just you and me. So am I, Mom. I have to tell you. The confessions are ready to come bubbling up, but she interrupts him. It was you who poisoned Gracie's noisy little dog, wasn't it? Her tone is comforting. And set the fire? He blushes, but when she gives his knee a gentle squeeze, he nods shyly. Yes, Mom, and you don't know how relieved I am to hear it, and it's you who've been taking out Dad's truck late at night, isn't it? He straightens. Oh, no, Mom, honest. I wouldn't do that without asking. You know I— Her eyes begin to wander. Then I must be losing my mind, she says gently. Try to remember filters in from the kitchen. I'm so old I've started hearing things. No, Mom, don't say that. He chokes back a sob. Okay, I have gone out. That was me, you heard. I won't do it any more, though. I promise I won't use the woody. That's a true lie. He'll have to use the other car from now on, since the woody was spotted. I know where you've been going, Donny. Do you, Mom? Of course I do. I'm not senile, you know. No, Mom, you're sharp as a tack. I was going to tell you about it. Really, I— Hush! I know you better than that. She puts a finger to her lips, rises from the sofa, goes to the stereo. She takes out an album and puts it on the player. He's so excited that he doesn't even care that it's Lawrence Welk. As the schmaltzy music fills the air, and a slaughterhouse on the television brightens the room, she comes back and kisses him on the crown. I've heard them, you see, she says. Oh, that, he says, feeling awkward. Now be honest. I've heard them come in with you, and the noises. You make them squeal, don't you? They like you very much, isn't that so? Like me? He stretches his collar, clears his throat. You don't think I— I've told you not to lie to me, Donnie, she snaps. What's been going on in my house? Something dirty? Something shameful? Black champagne bubbles float up and gather against the ceiling, filling the room from the top to the bottom. That music. Muzak. Take off this record, Mom, please. Are you doing wicked things in there? No, Mom, no. It's nothing like that. Vile things? Evil? Mom, I kill them. That's all I swear. I keep them tied up for a while, and then I chop them into pieces. Don't lie to me, Donnie. She glares at him, one finger tapping in time to Lawrence Welk. There's nothing else in the room. None of the comfort of the TV massacres. Only Mom and her accusations, which are brutal as blows because unjust. He tries to rise, but the music beats him down. Where are the knives? He squints through the black ballooning air, but the only blades he sees are in her hands. Don't lie to me. No, Mama, I'm not lying. Please don't punish me. I'll be good. Muzak thicker than murder. He bolts through his muddled thoughts, escaping in the only direction open to him, with his body paralyzed, and his mother waiting for him out there in the land without feelings. 
This proves to be a dead end. But by the time he has backed out to consciousness, he has truly immobilized. Ropes cut into his wrists and ankles. He lies cramped on his side in a cold coffin. Is it only a movie? he asks himself. Never, never do it again, his mother is saying. You'll never. I won't, he tries to promise, but his mouth is plugged with a kitchen sponge. He opens his eyes to stare at a shiny white wall high as a cliff, all porcelain. Mom stands looking down at him, humming to a saccharine tune from the other room. He fights the Muzak's spell, but he cannot fight the ropes. You've been a very bad boy, she says. I have to see to it that you don't bring any more trouble to this house. Over the cliff, the lip of the tub. The edge of the barrow appears. Her shoulders strain to lift it. Not cement, he thinks. Oh, no, not cement. A gray flood drools steadily toward his face. There's a sickly sweet smell. Just to fill you up, she says. The basin reverberates with the sound of his struggles as the clammy mixture spreads across his cheeks. What a stupid sound! And the last thing he hears, as oatmeal seals his ears, is pure schmaltz. Mark Laidlaw sold his first short story at the age of seventeen. Since then, his work has appeared in such diverse publications as Omni, Creepy, Ramsey Campbell's New Terrors, and Contemporary Literary Criticism. A novel, Dad's Nuke, was published in 1986. He is currently employed at the University of California Medical Center, where he peruses the Journal of Trauma in search of inspiration for further stories and novels. Goodbye, Dark Love by Roberta Lannis Marla ran her fingers down to the fold in her chenille robe and parted the front. She leaned into the bed where the body lay, still and very dead. She let the robe drop from her shoulders. It made a muffled sound, like that of a swan's wing flapping as it hit the floor. She looked down at her breasts, then at the slowly graying form. Grasping one nipple, she reached with her other hand to the body and the exquisite erection that rose over the wide elastic band. Her hand enveloped the shaft as she manipulated her nipple to hardness. Her breath came in gasps as she jerked the stony cock while kneading, teasing, exciting herself. Her fingers moved down to her crotch, parting the lips, feeling for the nub of flesh, touching, tingling, vibrating with urgency. She felt herself dipping close to climax. No, no, she whispered, not this way. She released him, pulled herself, her mind, from the place she had been. She made herself think about the outside, the bus stop where people were waiting for their lives to begin again, exchanging lies and wary glances. She listened to their distant voices, motor noises. She heard his wristwatch, the radio playing softly in the front room, music, playful, far away, calming. A cry. The baby. Mrs. Lopez's baby. Myla smiled. So perfect. So new. So un... But no. She grabbed the erection more firmly, lusting. She could only want. She mounted him. She pushed the beet-colored rod to the mouth of her heat and plunged down on it. Orgasm. Again and again. Driving it in an icicle unrelenting in its cold against her living warmth. Suddenly the acrid stench of urine overpowered her. There was no ignoring it now. The memories of restrooms and parks and town, on the boardwalk, the bus station, stinking, cold, dark gray walls with white turbans of paper toweling hurled against them, fecal arcs, like a mad artist's attempts at a statement. Why there? 
Why had he always wanted to do it there? There. Then. The better days. The time he'd taken her to the pike. It was hot, sunny. She wore the new sundress he had bought her. Pink, scant. He won her a stuffed octopus. Bought her a snow cone. Rode on the roller coaster with her. When they ran into two of the men he worked with, he introduced her as my lady. They smiled at her and told him she was gorgeous, a knockout. He'd looked at her that day, really looked, like he was seeing her for the first time. It made her hope things would change. Maybe, someday. She saw herself then, grimaced, then saw herself here, now, impaled on his lifeless cock, ecstatic, on her terms for once. The knock at the front door tore into her. She froze. Her foot began to cramp. She could hear no voices, no sound but her own ragged breath. Like a shot, another knock. It couldn't be anyone important. There was no one. Panic roiled inside her. She clenched her teeth. Then, quietly, footsteps marked the retreat of the stranger, whoever it was. Marla sighed, relieved. A soft heartache, a little pain rose up from deep inside, breaking the angry lust, crawling up her throat until a small cry passed her lips. Her friends, where were they now? He'd once welcomed them, enjoyed their laughter, their warm company. Then, one by one, they were forbidden to her. His friends she never saw. They were a part of his world, a world he told her she was better off not knowing a world she never allowed herself to be curious about. After all, she had someone who loved her, someone to protect her. Her friends had not. She let him become her world, let herself be whatever part of his world she could. Then the day came when she knew he had protected her too well. She pulled herself from him and got up. She paced around the bed, pulling on her robe, looking at him, his face was still handsome in death. Clear blue eyes, staring wide, flared nostrils, aquiline nose, lips full, parted, inviting. She put her face close to his. She could smell the familiar alcohol, sour. She covered his lips with hers. Her tongue searched for warmth, familiar places. He took her warmth, but did not hold it. She nuzzled him and felt the five o'clock shadow growing on his cold cheeks. Murky amber light from drawn old yellowed shades gave the room a dream ambience. Alone now beside him, she had her dream, the dream she had been too frightened to acknowledge, even to herself, for so long. The dream was of choice. Another man, anyone but him. She didn't know when her love, her lust, her need of him turned, when his arrival made her cringe, when the scent of him made her turn away, when his touch reviled her. But when it changed, so did she, slowly, steadily, finally, irrevocably, completely. What was between them seemed no longer bittersweet, electric. She became aware he was waging a battle, she the unwilling enemy. It was he, Victorious, sabotaging, cunning, brutal, unrelenting. An army of one in a war without political cause, without provocation, without reason. One day he was playful, toying. The next day he was cruel. And all the days after, until something in her turned her devotion into a grain of anger. The grain multiplied into a handful, a bucket, a barrel until nothing could contain it all, until today. He left her his money, his belongings, but they were unimportant to her now. She wanted someone else, a man who would love her tenderly, openly, kindly. Any man would do. She could choose now. She was leaving the chains behind. His death was the ultimate permission. He left her her own life. 
That she would cherish. She looked hard at him. A new power flowed into her. You will never again tell me that no one else can have me. And I'll never hear your lie, that no one else but you could make me come. She stood on her knees near his face, letting the robe fall open. Her fingers went to the slash between her legs, parting the swollen lips, touching the growing bud of skin inside. Her fingers moved quickly, hungrily. Her other hand pushed one breast up to her mouth. Her tongue darted out over her nipple, flicking it until it raged red hard. Watch me. Her voice was a husky whisper. She rocked over her fingers, moaning. Falling back on the bed, spent, she gasped, choked. It had wasted her. She lay there a few minutes until her breathing slowed. Then she propped herself up on a pillow and reached for the pack of cigarettes on the nightstand. She lit one. She blew smoke in his face. As she took long drags, she played with the small round scars over her stomach and chest. Turning the butt in her fingers, she pressed the lit end into the flesh that fell wrinkled and moist from his jaw. The cigarette went out with a spitting sound. In that instant... She recalled an evening after a long day on the beach. She was severely sunburned, blistering. He'd been so concerned. He put ointment on her, cool compresses. All night, until she finally fell asleep, he held her hand, held an ice cube to her swollen lips, cooed soothing words. The next morning, before she was fully awake, he was on her, taking what he said was owed him. The pain. Does it feel good? You told me that pain and pleasure were so close, so close. Does it feel the same to you, you bastard? What did you know? You just wanted to mark me for life so no one else would want me. You made sure, didn't you? You loved it, hurting me. Knowing I would have to lie to anyone who found them. Knowing the lies would be useless because everyone could tell what they were. Knowing no one would dare suspect you, no. Only weird Marla could do that to herself. Ha! She lit another cigarette. The air conditioner wheezed, then chugged once before purring again. Its rusty, dark bulk in the window allowed street sounds to filter through. She had often imagined that it was a huge radio transmitting the music of the city, the raw beat, the wails the whistle of the wind, the roar of engines, the pounding of the rain, the sirens, the music only she could understand. He'd called her bizarre, silly. He had never understood anything. She burned his cheek. Hair sizzled, stank. She could hear the bus pull up. Brakes screamed. All the liars, the rapists, the cheats, the motherfuckers, the phony assholes, the teasers, the pleasers, the real crazies there, packed in for rides to their individual hells. Soon more would come, standing in their rootless anger, littering their disappointments, waving false hope behind TV smiles. After all, what else was there in the world? What? One by one she left tiny burns across his chest until a heart began to take shape. The sound, like a distant cat's hiss, soothed her. Pulling back her robe, she looked down at the heart shape long ago tattooed into her stomach. She did not smile. It was not beautiful to her. Nor would it be to anyone else. He'd known that. She put the cigarette out in his navel. He was beginning to stink. Like shit. Like spoiled canned vegetables. Like mold and piss and sweat and vomit and sickness. She gagged. She turned up the flame on the lighter so that it shot out like a blowtorch. She touched the tip of the flame to one of his eyes. She almost expected it to close in reflex. It sizzled and popped. She held her breath. The flame slowly burned the entire eye away, leaving a deep, smoking black pit. She began on the other eye. Gagging, she quit. 
It was time. She went into the kitchen and found a large carving knife, a box of scented candles, and six heavy-duty trash bags. She lit the candles first, scattering them around the room. The odors of him seemed to lessen. She then set about carefully dismembering the body. She tried to be neat. It was much more difficult than she had expected. The knife required her full weight behind it to go through bone. She filled the six bags with the now simplified body, the bedsheets, and her robe. She knotted the tops. In the kitchen she washed off the knife and put it back where she found it. She then took a long hot shower, dried off, dressed, packed three suitcases, and began to straighten up. Room by room she went, reminiscing. They were full of memories, many good ones. The curtains he bought her that she just had to have, the sofa and love seat she saw in the Sears catalogue that he just had to have. There was his brush on the sink, still full of his soft graying brown hair, the pair of reading glasses he wore to read the TV guide. She loved watching TV with him. She went to the phone and called a taxi. She cursed herself for being too young to drive. In a few months she would be sixteen. Then she would come back and take his car. Until then she would have to be patient. Lastly, she dragged the six bags, one by one, to the back door. She opened the door and set them outside in the alley. She locked the door, staring down at the six neatly tied, shiny black sacks. Wistfully she turned away. The taxi horn sounded out front. Well. I guess it's time to say goodbye, Daddy. Thanks for everything. She shrugged. Thanks for nothing. She let the taxi driver take her suitcases out. She stood at the front door trying to remember what it felt like to love him. She felt nothing. She locked the door and walked out to the waiting world. Roberta Lannis is a fine artist and illustrator, as well as a teacher of English, art, journalism, creative writing, and photography. She is also the designer of graphics for a number of corporations. Though she has been writing since the age of eight, this is her first professionally published horror story. She is presently at work on a novel of obsession and murder, The Hallowed Bed. Out There by Charles L. Grant When Rick looked in the bathroom mirror, there was blood on his cheek. He watched, fascinated, as his finger drifted down the length of the scratch without touching his skin, from just under his right eye to the edge of his jaw. Along the way, small red bubbles slipped out and quivered, and he daubed at them with a tissue, wincing, though he didn't even feel the beginning of a sting. Odd, he thought. His head tilted to the left, lifting the cut to the light above the glass, probed from the inside with his tongue, poked with a clean tissue, and frowned. While he was asleep, he decided. He must have done it while he was sleeping. A check of his stubbed fingernails, and he shrugged. They weren't sharp enough to dent butter. But it could have happened in a dream. He could have had a nightmare, thrashed around, and done it without knowing it. That he didn't remember the nightmare didn't bother him. He knew he'd been having them for a month or so now, but once morning woke him, they were gone, and all that was left was a residue of apprehension that had him looking over his shoulder once or twice before he fully awakened, as if expecting to see someone in the bed beside him. It didn't seem serious, more than likely pressure from the job— and after-the-fact qualms about his decision to accept a new position in the firm's San Francisco branch. The first time in almost two decades he would be living anywhere else but here. He touched the cut again, top and bottom, then proceeded to finish his toilet, knocking rather than brushing his hair away from his forehead, doing his teeth with scarcely any toothpaste, soaping and rinsing his face with a washcloth that skirted the wound gingerly, close enough to rid the skin of the dried blood, and far enough away to keep from aggravating it with soap. When he was done, he stepped back, adjusted the knot of his tie, and reached for his suit jacket on the hook on the back of the door. 
a cursory turn for wrinkles on the sides and back, and he laughed with a slap of his hand on the light switch. The kitchen was neat without being pristine, and when breakfast was over it remained that way. The living room was neat without being a showcase, and as he sipped his coffee and stared out the window, he felt a great satisfaction that another day had begun. Across the street was an apartment building similar to his, all brownstone and high windows, shades midway to the sill, Venetian blinds open to catch the morning's warmth. Below, on the street, pedestrians were already on their way to work, wearing winter coats that were, he noticed, mostly unbuttoned. Cool, then, but not as cold as it had been over the past few days. A nod of approval, and he returned the cup to the sink, rinsed it, lay it on the drain board, and fetched his overcoat from the closet. A quick swipe of his shoes against the backs of his trouser legs, and he draped the coat over his arm, picked up his briefcase, and left. There was no one in the elevator. A rare treat. No artificial conversations to be made. No false smiles. No comments on the weather. The only person he would have liked to see this morning was Fred Aletta, the old man who lived three doors down from his own apartment. A fellow historian, he liked to think, but the man hadn't been seen in a while, wasn't answering his telephone, and most of the neighbors had decided he'd gone on vacation to his place up in Maine, a small home on the coast where he was going to retire at the end of the year. Rick wasn't worried. He had his own life to fuss over, and Aletta was more than capable of taking care of himself. A reminder, then, to make a point of calling before Fred left for good. And the moment he stepped outside, his cheek felt as if someone had laid a branding iron on it. He gasped and staggered, his free hand instantly clamping to his face. His vision blurred with tears, and he shook his head to clear it, moved a tentative step sideways, and straightened. Someone asked if he was all right, and he managed a nod, a weak smile, and mumbled something about a toothache. A second step, a third— and the pain subsided, the skin on his cheek feeling as though it were drawn taut over wire. God, he thought, lengthening his stride to normal, cautiously lowering his hand. It must have been a delayed reaction. But damn, that hurt. At the first opportunity he checked himself in a shop window. There was no blood that he could see, only the angry red line that now seemed more like a gash. He shuddered held his coat to his chest, and moved on to work, five blocks away, listening to the morning sounds that hadn't changed in a hundred years, listening to the old men muttering to themselves, watching the old women in their war paint, heading for the department stores with their purses against their stomachs as if they'd been wounded, stopping only once, when a trio of young men in leather and boots and glaring decorative chains too bright for the sun stepped in front of him from a doorway and stared at him, waiting, and grinning when he finally swerved and moved on, head down. He didn't think about them. He didn't look back. But his teeth ground together, and the cut on his face throbbed like a toothache. Jesus, he thought. Jesus, that hurts and thought it once again when he reached his destination, glanced over his shoulder, and saw the three young men push their way onto a bus. Brother, he thought, and touched the marble façade for luck. The office building was black glass and chrome. The lobby was potted plants. The elevator was brass and wood. All of them were filled with hurrying workers, not one of whom spoke to him all the way to his cubicle on the eleventh floor. Once there, and once his briefcase had been placed on end beside his desk, his coat hung on the hook beside the door, he sat, patted the computer terminal a fond good morning, leaned back, and closed his eyes. The pain was gone, but he was as breathless as if he'd just run ten miles. "'You really ought to stop living it up like that, Rick,' a woman's voice said. "'It's hell on productivity.' Funny, Roberta, very funny. He opened his eyes then and gave the pale-skinned woman a sour smile, winced before he felt the stab in his cheek, and just barely stopped his hand from coming up to touch it. Roberta Young moved to the side of the desk. Cut yourself shaving? He hesitated before nodding. I was half asleep. Five minutes earlier and I would have cut my throat. 
She barked a single laugh and dumped a low pile of folders in front of him. Well, cut your throat on this one, Ricky. The hotshots upstairs want the information by this afternoon. He gave her the groan he knew she was expecting and closed his eyes again to wish her gone. How about lunch? Kind of a farewell party. God, he said. I'm not going for another six months, for crying out loud. Okay, she shrugged. Then just plain old lunch. He shook his head, opened his eyes, pointed ruefully at the folders. You are the bearer of your own bad tidings, kid. With a touch of a hand to her curly black hair, she gave him a dramatic sigh. You're a hermit, you know that early. You're a goddamned hermit. Maybe he was, he thought, when she left. But it was better than the way it used to be. Much better. This way it didn't hurt so much. Old Fred knew, which was why they had become, not friends, but occasional companions. But never outside, always in the building the old man called the fort. And he thought nothing more about it. And at the end of the day, when the research was completed, the writers had their facts, he picked up his empty briefcase and started home for the night. Wincing at the shriek of the traffic, standing aside to watch himself blend into the herd, struggling toward the corners, dodging the cabs, turning away from the buses that spat fumes in his face, breaking through a line at a movie theater and seeing the eyes, the dead eyes, the wary eyes, the eyes that warned him to keep on going, don't bother to stop. A line was a line, and a man's a man for that. He smiled, caught himself, and went home. He ate dinner, watched the early news, and decided that maybe he ought to see a movie. It had been a while since he'd gone, and it would help in talking with the others at the office. He knew they thought him strange. He knew and had been working at caring. He was reaching for the paper when the telephone rang, an occasion so rare he had to stare at it for several seconds before grabbing the receiver. Rick? No, he said silently. It's the masked man and the Indian. What do you want, Anne? There was a pause. You haven't changed. Always the charmer. What do you want? He said again. God, all I wanted was to thank you for sending the check early, that's all. It was a help. God. He sagged in his armchair and towed off his shoes. Sorry, a bad day. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks anyway, I appreciate it. The urge to ask her out to go to the movies was so sudden, so strong, he could only grunt, and his ex-wife took it as she usually did. She hung up, and he listened to the dial tone for another minute more before dropping the receiver back on the cradle and turning to the television to watch the faces move around. The next morning he didn't see the cot until he stepped into the shower and had to wipe the soap away from his belly to be sure it wasn't a shadow, one that started above his left hip and ran almost to his groin. He looked at his nails, hurried out of the bathroom, and threw back the blanket on the low single bed in the bedroom that held nothing more but a second-hand dresser. A hand pressed against the sheet, swept over it, caressed it hunting for the protrusion from the mattress below. When he found nothing, he stripped off the sheet and tried it again, and scowled when his palm came away unscathed. Mr. Early, he said to his reflection in the bathroom, you really must be having one hell of a nightmare. One that dropped him to one knee before he was halfway to the corner, that had him scrabbling for his briefcase in perfect mime of a clumsy clerk, that had him leaning against a lamp post until the burning faded and his vision cleared, and he looked up at the sky and saw the first snowflake falling. He made it to the office, but he couldn't stand straight, and Roberta followed him to his desk. What you need, you know, is something more than those foul hamburgers you shove down your throat. I know this place over on Lexington, where— He sat and slumped back, and looked at her patiently, waiting for her to continue. She was staring at his stomach. He looked down and saw the blood. Come on, she said urgently, and grabbed his arm, pulled him up. Jesus, leave the damned briefcase, okay? 
It isn't going to walk, you know. He didn't argue. He let her take him to the lounge, empty now, and let her put him on the plastic couch. When she pulled his shirt from his trousers gingerly, he made only a token effort to stop her, stopping himself when he saw the raw wound and heard her gasp. God, you were knifed! She ran for the company nurse, and while he lay there, wondering how he could have been stabbed and not even know it, others came in and looked and looked away. They muttered to themselves. They didn't talk to him. They looked away and looked back, and he finally shouted at them to leave. I didn't see anyone, he told himself, and closed his eyes to watch himself walk out of the building the same way he always did, check the pedestrians, check the traffic, and start up the block. He saw it all, and he saw no one who was close enough to touch him. No one. And he said it aloud when he was taken to the hospital and was stitched up and was sent home. He said it to Roberta, who stayed with him, holding his hand and snapping at the interns and goading them, chiding them, flirting with them, to give her friend here priority. "'You should have been in the Army,' he said later in the elevator. "'Don't think I haven't thought about it,' she said, and took his keys, helped him inside, helped him to the bed. Then she reached into her purse and pulled out a sheet of paper. "'I'll get this filled, okay? You're going to need it when that painkiller wears off.' He knew his smile was mere bravado, but he gave it to her anyway and shook his head. "'You don't have to. I feel better already.' When she smiled back, it was softly. "'I know I don't have to. I want to, Rick, all right? I've got the keys. I'll let myself back in.' And she was gone, the scent of her lingering, the shadow of her still standing in the doorway. Well, he said to the room, I think you've got yourself an angel. It was strange. It was perhaps nice. It was odd enough that he didn't question it until he'd sat up and walked into the bathroom, closed the door, and stripped. Then he looked in the full length mirror. He knew the gash was ragged, but the methylate stain on his skin and the bulk of the dressing made it look worse. But no one had touched him. No one. He knew it. And stared for ten more minutes before stumbling back to the bed, to the pillow, to an examination of the ceiling and the cracks he knew better than he knew the palm of his hand, wondering and not wanting to know, thinking and wanting to avoid it by falling asleep, dozing until Roberta returned with the large orange pills, two of which she made him take before she'd taken off her coat. Then she pulled a chair in from the kitchen and sat beside him, waiting for the medication to work, saying nothing and saying it all with the round of her eyes and the set of her mouth and the way her knees shifted against the mattress, touching and falling away, touching and staying. He closed his eyes. He slept. He woke just after dawn and saw her curled under a blanket, still on the chair, hair and webs over her face, and her hands tucked under her chin. Quietly he slipped out of bed and padded into the bathroom, closed the door, switched on the light, and saw the cut that ran the length of his left arm from elbow to wrist. He wasn't sure if he screamed, but the next thing he knew, Roberta was beside him, paying no attention to his nakedness as she traced the red line with a finger and shook her head. Jesus! He tried to laugh. You attacked me while I was asleep. It's hardly bleeding. You're lucky. She shook her head. God, you're beginning to look like Frankenstein, you know. You look like you've been stitched together or something. God. I think... He passed a hand over his eyes. I think I'm going to sit down now. She grinned and held his arm, brought him back to the bed and sat him gently, at the same time draping a corner of the sheet over his lap. Somnambulist, she said with a sharp nod. Huh? You sleepwalk, dope. You move around. Cut yourself. Go back to bed and are none the wiser. You'd better watch them California hills, boy. 
You'll fall off and split your skull, and good old Roberta won't be around to take care of you. A laugh. A finger to her cheek. Either that, or it's ghosts. You have any ghosts here, Rick? Anybody die in this place in the last ten years? He laughed. He couldn't help it, not knowing if she was serious, and deciding she'd better not be. I hate to disappoint you, but I've lived here for almost twelve years, and I don't think I'm haunting myself. Twelve years? She was astounded and looked around the room as if hunting for its age. It must be sleepwalking, he said. I mean, it must be. As far as he knew, he'd never walked in his sleep before, but that didn't mean he wasn't doing it now. He had to be. Cuts, bruises, just didn't appear. Rabbits out of the hat. And if he was, then he would have to see a doctor. If he kept it up, he'd slice himself to death. Imagine that, Roberta said. Twelve years in one place. In the city. That's incredible, you know. Ever since the old lady left me, he said, making it sound partly a matter of pride, partly a sentence the judge had handed down. Don't get me wrong, though. I love it here. I have a friend. He calls it the fort. Keeps the Indians out there from getting our scalps, if you know what I mean. Then he gestured her out of the room and dressed, moving stiffly for the bandage, keeping an eye on his arm, rolling up the sleeve to give the cut air. When he finished, he found her in the kitchen, breakfast already on the table. He wanted to be annoyed, but there was no mess. The frying pan had already been rinsed off and was drying on the drain. He sat, uneasy that she was still there. You're going to be late for work. They'll live, she said, sitting opposite. I don't want you to get in trouble on my account. Her frown was attractive. Like I said yesterday, I do it because I want to. You want to deny me my heart's desire before you zap off to California and leave me to the vultures? They laughed awkwardly, and stopped only when a neighbor knocked on the door. Fred Aletta, the red-eyed woman said, had been found dead in his apartment by his daughter the night before. Apparently someone had broken in to rob him, found him home, and killed him, cut him up good, and stuffed him in the closet. His suitcase was packed like he was leaving for Maine. That's the fourth one, Rick said when Roberta returned with the news. You're kidding. Well, four and a dozen years isn't that bad, I guess, considering the age of most of the people who live here. Easy targets for the hoods, you know what I mean? She looked at him without expression, then decided aloud she might as well go to work, just to keep the bosses happy. She ordered him to finish his meal and go back to bed. The pills were in the bathroom, and she would call at lunchtime to see how he was doing. He walked her to the door, waved as she stepped into the elevator, and spent the rest of the morning trapped by the old men and women who lived on the same floor, all of them with theories about poor old Fred's death, all of them ready to move out as soon as they could, because the police don't give no protection, especially if you're old and in the same breath they lamented his leaving, because who was going to protect them from all the monsters out there, the things, the thugs? Who was going to save them when good old Rick was gone? When he was finally able to escape back into his rooms, he was thirsty, and discovered there was nothing to drink in the refrigerator. A look out the window showed him pedestrians with no coats on, and a check of his bandage showed him no further bleeding, no aches, not even a stinging. Five minutes wouldn't hurt then, he told himself, as he went to the elevator and pushed twice at the button before it would light. Five minutes to the corner and back, and then a little reading, a little TV, a nap before dinner, and maybe a recovery good enough to let him take in an early movie. At the front door he stopped, looked out to the pavement, felt a twinge in his side, a twinge in his cheek, and looked down at his arm and saw the first drops of blood spilling from his thumb onto the floor. He put his hand to the doorknob and felt the twinge become a burning. He backed away. He blinked. The elevator was gone, and he took the worn marble stairs two at a time, hauling on the banister with his right hand, 
holding his left arm hard against his side. Panting by the time he reached the second floor, gasping by the third, walking by the fourth as he stumbled down the hall and pushed into his home. The telephone was ringing. He ignored it and went into the bathroom, stripped and looked at his face, his side, the condition of his arm. Nothing. Scratches, no blood. And he stood there until his legs began to shake, watching himself in the mirror, half expecting a limb to crumble, an eye to bulge, his hair to fall out in radioactive clumps. Hermit, he thought then. And Fred sliced up on his way to Maine. Twelve years in the same apartment, making it his, making him as much a part of the place as Fred had been before he decided to retire to Maine. There was a whimper. Twelve years keeping the world away. And now, at last, when he wanted to see more of what was out there, beyond the neighborhood, beyond his job, beyond the monsters and the things and the Indians and the thugs, a hard swallow, and he hurried to his bed and propped the pillows against the headboard, and sat there cross-legged, with the sheet and blanket held to his chin, staring at the light draining from the window, staring at the doorway filling with black, not bothering to reach over and turn on the lamp, because when his right arm moved, he saw the cut begin to form at the top of a knuckle, move down to the wrist, curl under to the thumb, where it stopped, and didn't bleed. Charles L. Grant is the author of The Nestling, The Tea Party, Night Songs, The Blood Wind, Nightmare Seasons, and many other books, including the popular Ox Run Station series. Anthologies as editor include Nightmares, Horrors, Fears, and the ongoing Shadows series for Doubleday. He is a multiple winner of both the Nebula Award and the World Fantasy Award. His latest novels are The Pet and The Orchard. Little Cruelties by Steve Rasnick Tem he had changed. Sometimes he didn't recognize himself. His voice sounded wrong. The timber was unfamiliar. The vocabulary wasn't his. The opinions were unrecognizable. And he did things he could not have imagined. Again and again, Paul came back to the incident with the chicks. It had been only a little thing, a small cruelty. Something he could never feel proud of, certainly but not an act that deserved such intense shame. Ten years ago, for Christ's sake, Joey had been only five. He couldn't have taken care of the chicks anyway. He wasn't old enough. He was old enough for resentment, however. He'd always been old enough for that. It had been their last Easter in the old house. Joey had wanted chicks. Paul had explained very carefully how they had no place to keep pets like that in the city. Their yard was too small, and he didn't want animals smelling up the basement or the garage. They had a nice old urban home. They didn't live on a farm, for Christ's sake. And he was too little to take proper care of them anyway. Mom or Dad would end up taking care of them, and that wasn't very fair now, was it? Joey had cried so much that weekend— that Eve had finally given in, going out the Saturday before Easter and coming back with the three yellow chicks. Paul hadn't even known about it until Joey had brought the basket in for him to see, all excited and thanking him profusely, climbing up on his lap, basket and chicks tipping precariously, to kiss him sloppily on the cheek. Paul had been furious, but he couldn't say no. Joey was too excited. Besides, Paul couldn't let himself be the bad guy. It snowed in April that year, freakishly late and heavy. The yard and the hill behind the house were white ice. The chicks were sick, losing feathers, near death. Joey had failed to take care of them, just as Paul had predicted. He didn't take any pleasure in that. It was just simple fact. They were suffering. Paul felt terrible about it. 
It was his responsibility. He was Joy's father, after all. He had to do the right thing. He got up at dawn, dressed warmly, and sneaked into Joey's bedroom to get the chicks. They were so sick, he would take pains to remember, that they barely made any noise when he picked up the box. Joey was dead to the world, the covers twisted tightly around his legs. Paul stopped for a moment, set the chicks down, and freed his son. He walked up the slight hill in his heavy winter boots, the ice-covered snow crackling with each step. The chicks began to shiver, but remained silent. When he reached the top of the hill, he found he couldn't go any farther, and he also couldn't see himself setting the chicks gently down into the snow. It was a failure of nerve. He'd wanted to do the right thing. He suddenly tossed the box over to the other side and turned away. A cat, maybe a dog, would take care of them. On his way back into the house, he thought about fraternity pranks he'd heard about in college. Pig embryos left in a sorority house, dead dogs mailed to opposing football coaches, a snowball of frozen chicks. But he'd wanted to do the right thing. It was ridiculous to think that the death of chicks might diminish him somehow. Paul told Joey that the chicks had died during the night, and that he'd disposed of them. The boy cried most of the next day. I wanted to bury them, he'd said between sniffles. They were mine. It's too cold outside. The ground's frozen. Then how did you do it? Paul couldn't look him directly in the eyes. I'm a grown-up man. I can shovel better than you can. I don't think I believe you. You buried him? Good? His son moved closer. Paul never failed to be surprised, almost appalled, by the directness of the little boy. Yes, I... I buried them. From the way Joey nodded, Paul knew he'd believed that, at least at the moment. But the doubt was still obviously latent in his son. Paul was up at dawn the next day, raking gloved fingers through the top layers of snow that still covered the shaded hill. Every few minutes he found a clump of wet mud and leaves, or dog shit masquerading as one of the rancid little corpses, but the dead chick saluted him. He thought maybe he'd been lucky, and a neighborhood animal had in fact eaten them or dragged them away. He gave up when he saw Joey's bedroom light come on. In a few minutes the child would be down in the family room for his morning cartoons. Later, Paul would think that all these actions were not normal for him. If he just had time to think about it, plan it out, then maybe he would have behaved better. As it was, he could not recognize himself. He could not fully accept the things he was doing. Two days after the thaw, he saw Joey playing with the desiccated chick corpses in the backyard, passing them from hand to hand like lumps of gray modeling clay. Paul had to restrain himself from going out and stopping it, from explaining how dead things bore germs, how dead things might make a little boy sick. Joey had to know what his father had done. But they never talked about it. Neither of them could even bring it up. Paul had just wanted to do the right thing. What Joey would never understand, what none of them seemed to understand, was how much it pained Paul to hurt his son. It happened too often, he knew, and always in such little ways, but it wasn't as if he wanted the hurt to happen. He just couldn't stop the little cruelties from happening to Joey, even when he seemed to be so much a part of them, any more than he could stop the little cruelties from happening to himself. Sometimes Paul didn't understand the situation, and so Joey was punished unnecessarily. Sometimes Paul did something— like take a particular toy away from his son, or deny him a trip to a neighbor's house, or devise a particular kind of punishment that was meant to help the child grow up. But sometimes it backfired, and on reminiscence it appeared to be a cruel thing. But Paul had tried to do the right thing. He'd done the best he could. That was the way of things. That was the way the world usually worked. For Christ's sake, he loved his son. 
In any case, the city was no place for animals. Sometimes he imagined he heard his son crying in the night. Little cruelties. It was the small malevolences, the tiny hatefulnesses, the lesser portions of ruthlessness, which had always made Paul's life in the city seem a little sour, and which finally led him to move his family out of the old house on Parker Street. Joey hadn't wanted to go. All his friends were there, friends he'd be starting first grade with. Paul tried to be reasonable, but how many close friends could a six-year-old have, anyway? Eve hadn't liked the idea, either, but was willing to go along with whatever Paul thought was right. Paul had no doubts. He didn't know what it was about the city that made people act the way they did. Whether it was because of overcrowding, he thought often of those experiments in which mice were packed into a confined space, or lack of contact with the ground. You spent ninety-nine percent of your time on concrete or asphalt, or the deterioration in municipal services. On how many mornings was it the first thing he smelled garbage? or some sort of degeneration of the species. But every day he saw more and more tense people, more and more crazy people. He saw people trapped in the middle of traffic jams, going berserk when someone cut in front of them, ramming the other car repeatedly with their own, getting out and trying to drag the other driver out through a window. He had neighbors who couldn't keep a sprinkler head, or a hose, or even a trash can for more than a few months at a time before it was stolen or destroyed. Security lights didn't make any difference, and small nightly destructions had become so commonplace you didn't bother to distinguish the sounds. Every day someone was insulted. Saying it made it sound banal, but Paul had become convinced that the little insults people had to endure each day, the, we can't do it, it's not procedure, delivered by a minor government official, the, how many other stores have you stuck? From some anonymous bill collector on the phone. The, you have to do something about your weight, from an employer. We're dragging people down gradually to the level of the animals. People stepped on you, and there really wasn't a lot you could do without getting yourself into a great deal of trouble. Paul himself felt slighted a dozen different ways each week. No one seemed capable of seeing that he was hurt by their remarks. He did his best. Surely that was worth a great deal in the scheme of things. And yet every encounter hid a potential insult. Little cruelties. He didn't discuss them aloud with anyone. More often than not, putting his complaints into words made them sound faintly ridiculous. Occasionally he was moved to write a letter to the editor concerning the latest such lapse in human compassion— the woman who got rid of the cookies molding in her cookie jar by passing them out to kids on Halloween. The man who was charged for leaving a puppy tied to a tree for two days in the pouring rain. The neighbor's little girl who sneaked into her best friend's closet and tore up all her dresses when she wouldn't lend her doll. These people never murdered anybody. These were little crimes, little cruelties. But as these unkind examples accumulated, Paul began to see them as monstrous in their implications. His letters were eloquent, but he rarely mailed them. The little cruelties were the worst. They made each day a series of subliminal defeats. Trying to stop them seemed futile. They were too much a part of life in the city. He could never decide if it was the city changing the people or the people changing the city. Sometimes he thought he could hear his son crying in the night. It had been like that for a very long time. The faintest echo of a wail or a howl, as if the boy had shrunk back to embryonic size or smaller, and was being tortured in some other world. He used to check on his son, climb down the two flights of stairs to his room, where he always slept soundly, where the covers had been knocked awry with his feet, and Paul was compelled to fix them, tuck his beautiful boy in, kiss him lovingly somewhere in the nimbus of down that covered his face, awed still again by the sweet smell of him. After a few years he finally stopped the checking. He now knew it probably wasn't his son who'd cried out, and there no longer was any excuse for the nocturnal visitation. 
Sometimes he thought he could hear his son crying in the night. But he knew that could not be. Particularly now, when Joey no longer lived there. He wondered how many times it had happened that you heard a distressed voice in the night, someone crying or screaming, someone asking for help, but you did nothing, because that sort of thing happens all the time in the city, and you didn't know if the person crying was drunk or stoned or just crazy. And there was always the possibility that there might be danger for you there, even from a phone call, because they always seemed to know who had complained, and in any case you'd give it away by your actions, standing by the windows and holding the curtains apart, to see what the police were going to do. But Paul still believed it was a bad thing not to call. People might die if you didn't. People died all the time because of inaction, because of all the small neglects. The day they moved into their new house didn't go smoothly. Paul made a mistake arranging for the truck and had to pay double for a replacement. Eve complained that she didn't have adequate time to pack and spent the last few days cramming unsorted clothing, papers, and junk into cartons and garbage bags, and at the last minute she discovered a whole new series of complaints. I'm going to lose my friends, my Wednesday afternoon bridge club, the good fresh meat from Kelsey's butcher, not to mention Jimmy, the flower vendor. He's been giving me free cut flowers at the end of every weekday for over five years now. She looked up from her packing and glared at him. What are you giving up, Paul? Paul couldn't stand to be in the same room with her when she was like that. He headed for the door. It's for our safety, for Christ's sake. I'm just trying to fulfill my responsibility, but I guess you just can't see that. Joey had been alternatingly crying and sullen. Some of his friends had come by to see him, but he'd refused to come downstairs, even when Paul got angry with him about it. They just didn't understand what he was trying to do for them. Christ, they thought he was being thoughtless. They thought he didn't care about their feelings. They thought he was being cruel. The new house was meant to protect his family. He'd spent years trying to find just such a place. It wasn't actually outside the city, but in a small community called Globeville, which had been segmented and virtually torn apart when two crossing interstates were built over it. Most of the commuters who passed over it every day didn't even know it existed. The day they drove to the new house, Eve had seemed increasingly anxious. Paul found the Globeville neighborhood quaint and appealingly isolated. Eve thought it looked like a slum. Half the stores are boarded up. We can still do our shopping in the city if you like. She was going to spoil their first day with an argument. She was always starting the arguments. He never could see any reason to argue. I haven't seen a single restaurant or grocery store that isn't out of business. There's a pretty good Mexican restaurant down here, and a couple of bars, and a grocery store just a little smaller than Kelsey's. But I'm sure they stock enough for most of our needs. So where is everybody, Dad? It was the first thing Joey had said since he got into the car. They're mostly old people, people who have lived here all their lives, even some who were here before they built the interstate. That's one of the best things about the neighborhood. I guess old people don't always get outside that often. But Paul himself was vaguely disturbed by the almost empty streets. Somehow the neighborhood seemed shabbier to him, with Joey and Eve in the car. A large percentage of the houses hadn't been repainted in years. A number of the empty buildings served as warehouses for downtown businesses who wanted storage facilities midway to the suburbs. There were delivery trucks parked along the streets, but very few cars. Most of the cars he could see were in the yards up on blocks and overgrown with weeds, rusting to a dirty cinnamon color. For a moment Paul wondered if it might be the city air settling here. But it could be seen as peaceful. Certainly he could see it that way. Despite the fact that the highways were almost on top of them, the combination of trees and elevated roadway kept the neighborhood relatively quiet. It is nice, Paul. 
There was hesitation in her voice. Paul looked up. A slight hill on their left. They'd arrived. The Victorian house was in great shape. Paul had checked it out with the realtor several times. Most of the exterior woodwork, the gleaming white frills and gingerbread, was intact, as if immune to the acidic pollution which had taken its toll on old houses and other parts of the city. The red brick walls and gray stone foundations were firm, and showed no signs of crumbling or even discoloration. Perhaps his favorite features were the two round towers, like sentry turrets, that rose from the second story, one at each corner. And for all that sense of age, the house had a modern kitchen and a good heating plant. The house was going to keep the city available to them when they needed it, and yet still provide a sanctuary. An evolution was afoot. Human beings were being transformed within the concrete womb of the city, and to what he didn't even want to speculate. The evidence was all around them, the cruelties accumulating into a disease of harshness spreading throughout every metropolitan area. But Eve and Joey, they just didn't want to see it. He probably should have moved them all to the country. The neighborhood's terrible. Eve's complaints became a familiar litany. There isn't any crime, but it's so dirty here, Paul. I clean the house top to bottom, and it needs dusting again almost the very next day. It's an old house, Eve. You get dust in old houses. But at least it's not like the pollution we had to live with before. Admit it. Wasn't that a lot worse? There's nothing to do here. Maybe if he had it all to do over again, he'd move them to the country but he'd felt the need to monitor the progress of the city's disease, and Globeville provided him the perfect vantage point. Now he would sometimes gaze out his bedroom window and see Joey digging up the backyard, straightening up occasionally to examine the balls of dirt in his hands. But Joey and Eve had been gone for years, Eve long before Joey, and in any case, Joey would be at least sixteen now and this was a younger Joey, excavating his lawn, silently examining the moist dirt and drier clay, looking for dead Easter chicks. Sometimes he did not recognize himself. His sadness belonged to someone else. Eve left less than a year after they'd moved into the Globeville house. He supposed it was inevitable. She missed her friends, and she could see nothing in Paul's theories— which even he knew were becoming a bit of an obsession. What he could not understand was the way she left Joey behind. He was just a child, her child. He gathered she had said goodbye to the boy, but Joey never would tell him what she'd said. He changed. Sometimes he could not recognize himself. Raising his son on his own was far different from what he'd imagined it would be. Paul never knew how to act. He didn't know how to convince his son that his intentions were good, whatever mistakes he might make. He could not convince his son to love him. Sometimes he hid his son's toys. Sometimes he took Joey's homework out of his roadrunner notebook and threw it away. Sometimes he slipped down to the basement and threw the circuit breakers, and the little boy, who was terrified of the dark, was forced to struggle through rooms of shadow and sudden night. Sometimes he heard his son cry out faintly in the darkness, and he did not come. "'Your son is bullying the other children.' The voice on the phone was distant, unreliable. He should never have allowed Joey to attend school in the city. "'No, not my son. You must be mistaken. He curses the teachers, he writes vile things on the walls, he defaces school property. "'No, no.' It's the school. It's you people. I should be educating him here in our own home. He's cruel to— What's wrong is you people. I've seen the way you let the children hang around outside the school, smoking and laughing, acting like little adults, for Christ's sake. Not like children at all. You've robbed them of their childhoods. No wonder they think they can say whatever they please. He slammed the phone down, shaking. He could hear Joey moving around downstairs. 
He wondered if Eve had sensed that Joey, too, had become infected by the cruelty. He wondered if Eve ever suspected what had really happened to the chicks. He had gone downstairs to talk to Joey. Maybe he was going to talk to Joey about the chicks. Maybe he was just going to discuss the boy's behavior in school. He would never be quite sure. When he walked into the kitchen, Joey was sitting cross-legged on the floor. He had two oblong lumps of clay, passing them from hand to hand. He looked serene, contented. He made no sounds, but Paul could almost hear the gentle hum the boy's mind must have made. Paul looked past his son and saw that the floor was dirty. Gray and white animal fur adhered to the green tile. A sticky substance stained the floor and the lower part of the pale yellow cabinets. He looked back at his son. Now he could see the faint pinkness in the clay lumps, the edges of red, the small gaping mouths with sharp teeth. For several days there had been a poster on the telephone pole outside their house announcing two lost kittens. The lettering was crude, done with crayon, and above the lettering there was a crayon illustration of the two missing pets, one of them gray and one of them white. Joey stared at him, as if waiting. Paul's lips moved silently, as if by themselves. He turned and went back up the stairs. That night Paul heard things in the darkness, small cries and whispers. He imagined someone somewhere was in need of help, but he did not leave his bed. The next morning Joey was gone. Today, on foot and on his way back from the grocery store, he had seen Joey, or someone who looked like Joey, standing across the street from the Globeville house, watching it. He'd run to catch the teenager, but the grocery sacks were too bulky, and he didn't want to drop them. Joey had been gone several years now. Paul couldn't even be sure he was still alive. The police were of no help. In fact, for a time, they seemed to suspect that Paul had actually done something to Joey as if he were a murderer. That had been a cruel suspicion, and by it Paul knew they'd been infected the same as everyone else. Finally they concluded that Joey had run away to or been kidnapped by his mother. They weren't optimistic about ever finding him. Paul couldn't see it. Eve had abandoned Joey, so why would he leave his father? It wasn't as if his father were a murderer, a thief, a fiend. He knew his son must be dead. Someone had taken the boy from his bed, and the cruelties had just gotten out of hand. They had a way of doing that, cruelties did, as if they had a life of their own. And yet the boy was outside in the night, digging up his father's yard. It was a cruel thing. Even chicks had their place in the scheme of things. Their deaths could change how you lived within the world. Eventually Paul began seeing Joey, or someone who looked like Joey, nearly every afternoon, passing in front of the Globeville house, but on the other side of the street like a shy lover. At night the boy excavated his yard. During the day Paul could see the changes that had occurred to brick and wood, the subtle disintegrations, so like plant blight or cancer. Paul made sure his windows and doors were locked at night. Sometimes he would wake up and watch the ceiling over his bed, where the shadows of wind-blown tree limbs and thick power lines tangled over a dim yellow oval of glare. He thought he could hear the sound of narrow hands sliding repeatedly into soft earth, like a dying fish flapping on a sodden wooden plank. It's not as if I tried to hurt anyone, he'd whisper to the dark. He'd hear his own voice crying softly in the distance, and no one bothered to investigate. He'd seen no one on the street in front of his house for days, but he hadn't been out, and the weather was breezy. Mostly old people, retired people, lived here, and the air might have been too much for them. Despite the breeze, the pollution was bad, which was a little hard to figure. Black, cottony lines of smoke floated low over the buildings. A chimney must be working somewhere, he thought. 
The sunsets were soiled shades of magenta, orange, red, and bruise-colored. During Indian summer, the clouds started to bleed after four o'clock. The gutters were lined with trash. But then that had happened before, a jurisdiction problem between municipal sanitation departments. There appeared to be more cracks in the pavement out front than he remembered, but these back streets got short shrift on road repair. Stray slivers of noxious pollution rubbed the brick edges of his house. Red decay powdered the gray-green bushes planted near the house's exterior walls. Occasionally he'd open a window, but then shortly would close it because of the smell. Periods of still air trapped the stench in his neighborhood. Eve had insisted that the house needed cleaning every other day. He had never much seen the point. He kept the garbage in airtight bags on the back porch, and some day he would haul it all out. He kept the door to the back porch closed, except when he needed to add another bag to the pile. He watched a many-legged insect. He couldn't remember the name. Leave a thin trail up the dining-room wall. Dead insects filled the windowsills. Some nights the house grew stuffy, and he ached to open the windows, but he was afraid. Weeds grew over the curb and softened the borders of the street. The guttering along the eaves rusted. One of the exit pipes turned brown and fell into the yard. Then he never saw it again. The grass swallowed it. The grass swallowed the walk, and he became afraid of stepping into the yard. The pipes made cracking noises in the night. He secretly hoped the pipes would break and separate completely. They linked him to the city's sewer system. Graffiti grew along the walls of his beautiful, strong house like a vine, flowing with the grain of the brick, then separating, multiplying, seeking any empty space. One night his garage roof fell under its own weight, crushing his car, but the gas tank had been empty anyway. Toward the end of the month it rained for several days. When it was over, he stood out on his front porch. Water had flooded the gutters. The sewer vomited. Yolky and cinnamon-colored liquids oozed out of the sewer grates and stained the pavement. A grayish human corpse lay face down with its skull against the opposite curb, the viscous water nudging it rhythmically. Paul had the urge to go down and touch it, pick up the lifeless arm and the head, play with it, pass the disease from hand to hand. Sores spotted his lawn. Paul went back in and secured the door. He could never decide if it was the city changing the people or the people changing the city. Joey dug up his backyard. Great piles of earth lay sprawled, decayed while they slept. They cried softly in the distance, but no one called the police. Paul wandered the darkened rooms of his sanctuary, the dried bodies of insects crackling under his old socks. Sometimes he would try to open a window, brushing leaves and wallpaper chips and brittle insect hulls from the window ledge, but the window fell apart when he lifted. He watched Joey painting huge green, white, blue graffiti in the middle of the street. Somebody should have stopped him, but no one left their quiet, worn houses. He watched Joey breaking the windows of the house next door. It's not as if I were, he tried to say. Paul mourned the day and cried in his sleep. He bruised his cruel hands against the walls and scratched at his cruel face with the broken fingernails. All the next day Paul waited by his empty body, while Joey called from the distant tunnel he had dug for himself underground, that snaked its way under the yard and curled in on itself, deep under the house. No one knew him, or recognized his absence, or the minute reduction of cruelties in the world once he had disappeared. Around him the concrete rotted, the city pavements grew rancid. Steve Rasnick Tam published close to a hundred short stories between 1979 and 1986. During that time he also edited the Umbral Anthology of Science Fiction Poetry. 
His stories continue to appear in periodicals in and out of the fields of science fiction and fantasy, and in many original horror anthologies. His first novel, Excavations, will appear shortly. At the moment he is working on the horror novel New Blood, about Kentucky in the thirties, snake handling, and the Melungeons. The Man with the Hoe by George Clayton Johnson There is no new truth, only that which is old. There is nothing to be discovered that you have not known all along. Fearing the hungry wolf you gathered together for protection, saying, Surely he will not attack. There are so many of us. You felt warm and safe, knowing there were others between yourself and the wolf's terrible teeth, and lulled by the lowing of the herd, you fell asleep. You did not hear the stealthy footfalls of the famished wolf, or see the alarmed group scatter to leave you exposed and helpless, a sacrifice. You looked about, seeking one who could save you. By that time it was too late. No, he gasps and awakes. He can hear his wife sleeping fitfully beside him in the darkness. His mind is racing. Careful not to disturb her further, he rises, and following the dim flashlight beam down the carpeted hall and to his book-lined den, he slumps into the familiar chair. He turns off the heavy flashlight to save the batteries, and leans back tiredly, rubbing his grainy eyes. What a hell of a mess life is! The gods play rough. He cranks open the window, hearing the distant freeway sounds, and the nearer cry of mating cats. From the pain and fury in the screams, he pictures them clawing and snapping at each other. He tries to focus, make sense of everything, make plans, but it is too terrible to think about. He has already considered everything. As he looks blankly out the window into the darkness of the backyard, an odd image rises unbidden before his mind's eye. A TV image. Numberless, white-draped black men, arms laced together in long lines, jammed behind apartheid fences, rising and falling together. It comes back to him like a photograph. A political protest in South Africa. He'd seen it on the tube before the Department of Water and Power shut off the electricity, and before he hawked the TV. The Africans clung to each other, hip to hip, supporting each other, leaping up and down together in a slow rhythm. He couldn't tell what it was they were chanting. Moaning? Howling? The roar was drowned out by the newscaster's voice, describing the protest, the racial violence, the whips, the clubs, the hostility and terror. The image had stuck in his mind. Looking at those black, straining, agonized faces, he knew that they had the mentality of savages. What was the poem? Is this the dream he dreamed who shaped the suns and marked their way upon the ancient deep? Yes, Edwin Markham, the man with the hoe. Down all the caverns of hell to their last gulf there is no shape more terrible than this more tongued with censure of the world's blind greed, more filled with signs and portents for the soul, more packed with danger to the universe. Yes, kept separated by South African law, those illiterate brutes had become the man with the hoe. He tries to imagine what will happen when those vengeful blacks break through those fences, the bloodshed. He tries to understand what those black Africans are thinking, and can't. They are a mystery from the depths of a primitive jungle. Markham had said it. What gulfs between him and the seraphim? Slave of the wheel of labor, what to him are Plato and the swing of Pleiades, the long reaches of the peaks of song, the rift of dawn, the reddening of the rose? But if not thinking, then what are the Africans feeling? Even the dumb animals have feelings. It is a mystery. He breathed silently in the darkness. Is this the thing the Lord God made and gave to have dominion over land and sea, to trace the stars and search the heavens for power, to feel the passion of eternity? 
He had read somewhere that the poet got his idea from a famous painting of a French peasant working in a darkening field. Commenting on the painting and poetry, Markham had arbitrarily collaborated with Millet, the great Impressionist painter. Betrayed, plundered, profaned, and disinherited. Leaning on the windowsill, remembering fragments of the poem, he thinks he sees a shadow move on the moonlit garden wall he had built to keep intruders out. A cat. The big gray he called Bruiser, because of its burly carriage and bullying manner. Will that cat never learn? Somewhere he had read that man was the product of almost a hundred generations of accumulated knowledge, while each cat was the original cat from the primeval wilderness, unaltered by time. Silently he eases open the desk drawer and rummages among its contents, finding the slingshot and the bag of glass marbles. Putting a slippery marble in the leather pouch, he takes careful aim through the open window. That damned cat understands territory well enough, and is defying him. Somewhere far off thunders mutter and energies stir, but he doesn't hear, although he must feel the power. Were they not watching from the hidden world? Did they not care about his fate? It is the cat's attitude, their arrogance. It is they who own the yard, not he, for when he shouts angrily at them, they turn languidly to eye him, before marking the spot with scent and sauntering insolently away. If he chases them, they are over a wall and gone, where none can pursue. It is maddening. He holds his fire as he tests the tension in the surgical rubber tubing, stretching and releasing slightly, feeling the heavy glass pellet inside the cowhide pouch. With the mnemonic pull in his muscles, he remembers in flashes as a child, aiming and firing rocks at tin cans, glass insulators on telephone poles, street lamps, and, when that grew less challenging, at gophers on the Cheyenne Prairie, frogs along Crow Creek, jackrabbits waiting hidden till the last moment before making their break, birds on limbs and wires and snow fences, and on the wing, bringing them out of the sky. Remembering how he and his cousin Chuck killed a forbidden robin redbreast in Frontier Park, with weapons made out of inner tube rubber and cleverly twisted pieces of coat hanger, and the tongues of an old pair of shoes and kite string, and how they had put the plump bird on a stick, feathers and all, over a tiny twig fire beneath the bushes, and how exultantly they ate the charred and unrecognizable results as though they were wild red Indians on the plains. Men, by God! In the dark, aiming the slingshot, he feels rage build glowingly within him at the sly insolence of cats. If only the whole neighborhood wasn't a single interconnected roadway to everywhere for the sneaky, treacherous things. If only that damned woman next door didn't feed them so cheerfully, leaving out pie-pans of kitty victuals like bait in the driveway near the leaky water faucet for every stray. And not only the strays, but even well-fed cats on the nearby streets, seeking better pickings, the big males bullying the others away from the pan, or waiting patiently, ranked according to their malignant ferocity. If only the neighborhood cats hadn't all chosen his tree-shaded trellis to do their mating, ringing in a female to stare her protests down, groaning and yowling and snarling and spitting. Suddenly he puts his finger on it. The dogs! Where are the dogs that usually keep the cats under control? They are natural enemies. For dogs there are leash laws, but cats are classed as wild animals and free of regulation. They can't be leashed, is that it? There was a time, he thinks swiftly, when the world was different. Everyone, it seemed, worked for the aircraft plant, or the post office, or the steel mill, and they all went off to work at the same time, and came home at the same time, and then was when they thought to feed the animals, and with the lure of food kept them dependent. But now, with the closing of the plants, the pattern has broken down. Now they simply ignore the animals, or put out a dish of kibble and forget it till it's empty. Now they haven't a single idea where their little darling spends the night. 
So it has come to this. He blinks away tears, feeling the moistness of the cold night air from the open window. He pities his neighbors in their blindness. They can't see the signs. They aren't aware that the whole world system is breaking down, overwhelmed by numbers and greed and stupidity. Damn you, he says to the cat shape in his mind. I've never really liked you, nor any of your tribe. I don't like your two-faced ways, your cruelty, your spitefulness. Now suddenly the shadows resolve themselves, and he can see the big gray poised on the wall, motionless, listening, probing the neighborhood with its senses, evaluating the texture of the night. It gives a low, penetrating groan, which is echoed from afar, and again from a place more distant. He pulls back on the leather pouch, stretching the rubber tubing. The cat shadow moves on the garden wall. And I don't like the way you treat your women, he says under his breath, and releases the missile with a whap of disturbed air. He sees the marble fly off into the darkness, and with his mind's eye he sees it arch magically, as if drawn on a string to its target, guided by his confidence. He can see the cat struck even as it turns and leaps. Aside from a startled lurch in the air and a sharp intake of breath, the cat makes no sound as it flees back into the darkness. There by damn! He feels momentary satisfaction, the thrill of an act well done with accuracy and precision, the cold, solid control that is fueled by rage. He pictures the hurt cat skirting the neighbor's shed and coming to rest beneath the jasmine bush by the poolside to lick its wounds. He pictures the cat's eyes in the gloom, bright, sly, glowing with malevolence, filled with hatred. He hears a long cat yell, sustained, penetrating. Nearby, answering cat cries. Now they'll all know. He pictures cats waking in darkened rooms to heed the call. He pictures them slipping out of houses into the night to converge on his house, summoned by Bruiser, nursing his hatred, seeking revenge. Let them come. He is ready for them. He puts another marble into the leather pouch and looks warily into the darkness. He listens intently, picturing the neighborhood cats responding, picturing them coming together from faraway places to form a group under the neighbor's jasmine bush called forth by the injured one who nurses an age-old grudge. Another sound. His wife. She has come down the hall and opened the door. He cannot see her face, but he knows that she looks very tired. Reflexively, he hides the slingshot in his lap. Darling, she says hesitantly. When he doesn't answer, she says, I'm worried. I couldn't sleep. He waits. Don't you think you should talk to your cousin Chuck about this? If he knew how bad it is, maybe he'd help. He has the money. Cousin Chuck again. He remembers the last time he went to Chuck for the money they needed for groceries. First Chuck had to know all the details. Then he'd put on that face and said, how could you let things get this bad? Then he talked about needing some kind of collateral for the hundred-dollar loan. The son of a bitch. He wouldn't go for the broken sewing machine that cost a bundle, or the hand-carved chess set. No. Chuck wanted the rifle and shells, even though he never really liked to shoot. A rifle's more negotiable in bad times, Chuck had said already planning how to sell it. But that was careful Chuck. He thinks about the thirty thirty and the two boxes of cartridges lying in Chuck's carport storage cabinet, rusting. If he had his hands on that rifle, those cats would learn a lesson. He imagines himself looking down the sights at Bruiser or Midnight or Lightning. He's named all the strays. It helped him keep track of them. His wife feels his resistance and withdrawal. If we lose the house, what will we do? She asks, reading his mind, knowing he doesn't have the answer. 
Hasn't she always been the one to supply that? With him simply the provider? Bringing home the check, having learned it from his father, who had failed at being the man? I'll think up something, he replies tightly, knowing he won't. Hasn't his role in life been to let her do the planning and budgeting? She having learned it from her mother, who had failed at being the woman? Don't you think it's cold? she says, putting ideas in his head. Maybe you ought to come to bed. You know that whatever happens tomorrow you'll need your sleep. He feels her manipulation, aware suddenly of how much of his life has been subject to that. At the sound of her voice he also feels a great weakness. He tries to remember how long he has been lying to her about small things rather than face her, and how long she has known about it, and relished the power it gave her over him, treating him like a disobedient son. He tries to remember just when it was he lost control. Had it been the day he was hired by the company, learned to take orders, to depend blindly on the judgment of others, learned to hide his true feelings, stopped being a wild dog, and accepted a collar, stopped being an outsider, and became an insider? And for what? Did it matter to them that he was on their side, willing to close his eyes and harden his heart? How quickly after the plant closed were their meager savings gone? How quickly the union had proved itself impotent? How quickly the unemployment insurance had run out while he was left standing in lines, filling out applications? How quickly the utility companies had acted to stop service when the timely checks ended, forgetting years of prompt payments and talk of good credit. How quickly the house had gone into foreclosure after a baffling exchange of letters with the insurance company that held the second mortgage. How quickly he and his wife had been reduced in circumstances, chastened, humiliated, degraded, while time tightened about them. You never talk, she cries. How can I know what you're thinking? Didn't she know she could beat him at talking? That his power over her was his silence? Didn't she know that talking always led to his downfall? That he was only safe when he was silent? That the less people knew about him, the better? The less she knew about him, the better? She waits vainly. At last, she says, You'll get something. Sure, he says, not believing it any more. Go back to bed. I'll be there in a minute. And he knows that he'll never again in his life hold a job that pays seventeen bucks an hour. He hears her go. He thinks he hears a sob. He hears the door close at the end of the hall. He sits quietly, trying not to think of anything. The groaning yowl of cats echoes and re-echoes closer. The night is alive with menacing cries. They'll come that way, he thinks, from the corner of the yard where the walls are tallest and the growth is deepest, a perfect staging ground for an assault upon the house. Yes, he says softly, that's the way they'll come. He pictures them mounting the wall in single file to gather in the pool of ink under the branches of the neighbor's overhanging mulberry tree, their eyes glittering wickedly, exchanging cold, smirky grins before descending to slink out over the dark ground, creeping invisibly in the tangled black shadows. He stares into the blackness, shielding his eyes against stray city light, looking for movement. His wife's careworn face appears before his mind's eye. He searches her face for signs of reproach. He wants her to say, You didn't do anything wrong. He wants her to say, It isn't your fault. After all, she isn't the one who has to face the smug bastards. She isn't the one who has to offer herself abjectly to their persistent refusal, knowing that the sands of the world have shifted— with the computer running the factories, and the worker no longer needed. He stares into the pit where his job has vanished. The backyard is silent, unmoving. 
Has he heard footfalls on the roof? The rake of claws against screen? Scratching at the door? He'd better go in to join her. She is right. In spite of everything, he has to sleep. He puts the slingshot down on the desk alongside the flashlight and feels his way to the bedroom door. Mama, he says, are you asleep? Come to bed, she says sleepily. Nothing can be done until morning. She is right. He remembers the open window and the flashlight. I'll be with you in a minute, he says. He feels the gods leaning in on him, attending his every move, plumbing the depths of his intentions, feels their presence as they pause to remember their perfidy of cats and the failures of men. Touching the walls protectively, he makes his way to the den window and closes it carefully. The astonishing cam action of the lever snugs it home, locks it tight. Picking up the bulky flashlight, he flips the switch briefly to test the batteries. Revealed by the beam is his slingshot. He stares at what he sees, uncomprehending. The rubber tubes have been clawed by sharp teeth, severed in several places, ruined. He stiffens with shock. He hears the scamper of claws on the wood floor close by. While his back was turned, one of the cats must have gotten inside. He pictures the cat trapped in the locked house, desperate, alarmed, deadly. He pictures it searching for escape down the hall into the front room, where all the doors and windows are secured. Fine. Now we'll find out who has the control. He feels a sense of power and outrage. Guided by the flashlight, he goes searching for a cat who is too smart for its own good. He hears soft footfalls on the living room rug. He hears the cat's quiet breath and the amazing silence. He finds it crouched back in the corner under the couch, big and charcoal gray, marked with battle scars. Bruiser. When he flashes the light, it spits and snarls, showing its needle teeth. If he goes for a broom handle, he may lose it. He is momentarily baffled. The cat shrinks back into the corner, eyes wide and blazing with reflected light, muscles flexed and ready, claws gripping the carpet, teeth threatening, throat hissing. So it's going to be like that? Adrenaline pops in his veins. It is galling, impossible. The final insult. Inside his own house. Red rage flares through him. Holding the light steady and without considering the consequences, he sticks his bare left fist under the couch, reaching, reaching farther. A dare. The cat bites savagely, sinking its fangs into his hand. He unclenches his fist, jamming the cat's mouth wide open, the jaws powerless against his superior strength. Surprisingly, there is no pain, only a sense of triumph. Locked in his hand, the cat's teeth can't release their hold. The teeth have gone into the bony knuckles, and though the cat squirms and thrashes, it is helpless to escape. He feels the tug of jaws against the ligaments, but everything holds. Now we'll see. He begins to draw the resisting cat toward him, pulling it out from under the couch. It twists and jerks in terror. He raises the heavy flashlight and brings it down like a club on the now truly dangerous animal, feels the satisfying sting in his palm, feels the cat's spine break, feels the metal rim of the flashlight give, but the light holds steady. He raises the torch high and strikes again. The light is a dim yellow beam. The cat is still. There. His breath whistles through his teeth as he pries loose the dead jaws. He is bleeding like hell from the torn knuckles, and his hand is beginning to ache. He'll need a shot of penicillin and a couple of stitches. He flashes the light on the cat's rigid body. Now they'll all know he means business. He pictures the news of Bruiser's death flashing out from house to house, carried from cat to cat like a silent telegraph. He pictures their consternation, 
realizing that the war they have triggered is to the death. That man accepts no compromises. He pictures them rising to eliminate the threat, to restore the status quo. He pictures them coming from distant neighborhoods, leaping, running along fences and tree limbs, across porch roofs and sheds, pausing invisible beneath parked cars, stalking him now as they grow in number. He hears the faint cry of cats on the night air, sounding and resounding. Or are they tires on the freeway? Pain from his damaged hand pulls him back into the dark living room. He puts the knuckles of his now-throbbing fist to his mouth and begins to suck on it. Now, with the taste of the hot blood in his throat, he suddenly knows. Abruptly, he knows what those black Africans on TV were thinking and feeling, rising and falling behind wire fences, arms locked together like an army, heads thrown back, defiant, menacing, a powder keg of hatred. O oh, masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, how will the future reckon with this man? How answer his brute question in that hour when whirlwinds of rebellion shake all shores? A crack of light appears in his brain. He sees the glimmering of a way out. He doesn't owe anything to the others. He is on his own. They've made that clear enough. Already he can hear cats scratching at the doors, the windows. He can hear their murderous keening. With the kids gone, there is just he and his wife. Yes, he owes them nothing. He sees everything through fresh eyes. The bastards have revealed themselves. How will it be with kingdoms and with kings, with those who shaped him to the thing he is, when this dumb terror shall rise to judge the world after the silence of the centuries? He thinks of his rifle rusting away at Cousin Chuck's. Cautiously, he pushes open the back screen door. Stepping into the garden, he hears a hiss behind him and whirls, poised on the edge of the low roof, shaped against the moon, ready to spring, is a black cat, back arched, all its fur aloft. He hears stirrings in the garden darkness surrounding him, a threat. He feels the hackles go up on the back of his neck. Let them dare. He raises the flashlight threateningly, and with the gesture and the killing weight in his palm, he finds himself thinking of his sleeping wife, thinking, You could bust a man's skull with a club like this. Thinking, Let them come. He is ready. And later, walking over to Cousin Chuck's house, he can feel the cat's weary eyes on him in the dark as he nurses his hurt hand against his chest and cuts at the air with his not-yet-useless flashlight, thinking, the flashlight will come in handy if Chuck tries to stop him. With that loaded rifle in his hands, they'll play hell, evicting him from his own home. Are the gods hungry? Do they lust for more blood? Yes, you gathered together against the wolf, believing that there was strength in numbers. To your astonishment, you discovered that there was weakness in numbers, and when you learned that the group would not protect you, you were free to survive as best you could. But, oh, my children, what of honor! But what of grace! Yes, there is no new truth, only that which is old. The dead past is alive in the present, and you never find the people that you go to meet in dreams. George Clayton Johnson wrote a number of the original Twilight Zone episodes and shares screenplay credit on Twilight Zone, the movie. He co-authored the novels Ocean's Eleven and Logan's Run. He wrote the premiere episode of Star Trek, as well as segments of Route 66, Honey West, The Law and Mr. Jones, Mr. Novak, and Kung Fu. His short stories have appeared in 100 Great Fantasy Short Shorts, Author's Choice No. 4, Masters of Darkness, and Elsewhere. They're Coming for You by Les Daniels Mr. Bliss came home from work early one Monday afternoon. 
It was a big mistake. He'd had a headache, and his secretary, after offering him various patent medicines, complete with their manufacturer's slogans, had said, Why don't you take the rest of the day off, Mr. Bliss? Everyone called him Mr. Bliss. The others in the office were Dave or Dan or Charlie. But he was Mr. Bliss. He liked it that way. Sometimes he thought that even his wife should call him Mr. Bliss. Instead, she was calling on God. Her voice came from on high, from upstairs in the bedroom. She didn't seem to be in pain, but Mr. Bliss could remedy that. She wasn't alone. Someone was grunting in harmony with her cries to the Creator. Mr. Bliss was bitter about this. Without even waiting to hang up his overcoat, he tiptoed into the kitchen and plucked from its magnetic rack one of the Japanese knives his wife had ordered after watching a television commercial. They were designed for cutting things into small pieces, and they were guaranteed for life, however long that happened to be. Mr. Bliss would see to it that his wife had no cause for complaint. He turned away from the rack, paused for a sigh, then went back and selected another knife. The first was for the one who wanted to meet God, and the second for the one who was making those animal noises. After a moment's reflection, he decided to use the back stairs. They were more secretive, somehow, and Mr. Bliss intended to have a big secret just as soon as he could get organized. He had an erection for the first time in weeks, and his headache was gone. He moved as quickly and carefully as he could, sliding across the checkerboard linoleum and taking the back stairs two at a time in slow, painful, thigh-straining stretches. He knew there was a step which creaked, couldn't recall which one it was, and knew he would step on it anyway. That hardly mattered. The groans and wails were reaching a crescendo, and Mr. Bliss suspected that not even a brass band behind him could have distracted the people above him from their business. They were about to achieve something, and he wanted very much to be there before they did. The bedroom took up the entire top floor of the house. It had been a whim of his to flatter his young bride with as spacious a spawning ground as his salary would allow. The tastefully carpeted stairs led up to it in front as inexorably as the shabby wooden stairs crept up the back. Mr. Bliss creaked at the appointed spot, cursed quietly, and opened the door. His wife's eyes rolled back in her head, were like wet marble. Her lips fluttered as she blew damp hair from her face. The beautiful breasts that had persuaded him to marry her were covered with sweat and not all of it was hers. Mr. Bliss didn't even recognize the man. He was nobody. The milkman, a census-taker. He was plump, and he needed a haircut. It was all very discouraging. Cuckolding by an Adonis would at least have been understandable, but this was a personal affront. Mr. Bliss dropped one knife to the floor, grasped the other in both hands, and slammed its point into the pudgy interloper at the spot where spine meets skull. It worked at once. The man gave one more grunt and toppled over backwards, blade grinding against bone as head and handle hit the floor. Mrs. Bliss was there, baffled and bedraggled, spread-eagled, naked against sopping sheets. Mr. Bliss picked up the other knife. He pulled her up by the hair and stabbed her in the face. She blubbered blood. Madly but methodically he shoved the sharp steel into every place where he thought she'd like it least. Most of his experiments were successful. She died unhappily. The last expression she was able to muster was a mixture of pain, reproach, and resignation that thrilled him more than anything she'd shown him since their wedding night. He wasn't done with her yet. She had never been so submissive. It was late that night before he put down the knife and put on his clothes. Mr. Bliss had made a terrible mess. Cleaning up was always a chore, as she had so frequently reminded him, 
but he was equal to the task. The worst part was that he had stabbed the waterbed. But at least the flood had diluted some of the blood. He buried them in separate sections of the flower garden and showed up late for work. This was an unprecedented event. The quizzical eyebrows of his colleagues got on his nerves. For some reason he didn't feel like going home that night. He went to a motel instead. He watched television. He saw a movie about someone killing several other people, but it didn't amuse him as much as he'd hoped. He felt that it was in bad taste. He left the Do Not Disturb sign on the doorknob of his room each day. He did not wish to be disturbed. Still, the unmade bed to which he returned each night began to bother him. It reminded him of home. After a few days, Mr. Bliss was ashamed to go to the office. He was still wearing the same clothes he'd left home in, and he was convinced that his colleagues could smell him. No one had ever longed for the weekend as passionately as he did. Then he had two days of peace in his motel room, huddling under the covers in the dark, and watching people kill each other in a phosphorescent glow. But on Sunday night he looked at his socks and knew he would have to go back to the house. He wasn't happy about this. When he opened the front door, it reminded him of his last entrance. He felt that the stage was set. Still, all he had to do was go upstairs and get some clothes. He could be gone in a matter of minutes. He knew where everything was. He used the front stairs. The carpeting made them quieter, and somehow he felt the need for stealth. Anyway, he didn't like the ones in the back any more. Halfway up the stairs he noticed two paintings of roses that his wife had put there. He took them down. This was his house now and the pictures had always vaguely annoyed him. Unfortunately, the blank spaces he left on the wall bothered him, too. He didn't know what to do with the paintings, so he carried them up into the bedroom. There seemed to be no way to get rid of them. He was afraid this might be an omen, and for a second considered the idea of burying them in the garden. This made him laugh, but he didn't like the sound. He decided not to do it again. Mr. Bliss stood in the middle of the bedroom and looked around critically. He'd made quite a neat job of it. He was just opening a dresser drawer when he heard a thump from below. He stared at his underwear. A scrape followed the thump, and then the sound of something bumping up the back stairs. He didn't wonder what it was, not even for an instant. He closed his underwear drawer and turned around. His left eyelid twitched. He could feel it. He was walking without thinking toward the front stairs when he heard the door below them open. Just a little sound. A bolt slipping a latch. Suddenly the inside of his head felt as big as the bedroom. He knew they were coming for him, one from each side. What could he do? He ran around the room, slamming into each wall and finding it solid. Then he took up a post beside the bed and put a hand over his mouth. A giggle spilled between his fingers, and it made him angry, for this was a proud moment. They were coming for him. Whatever became of him, no more job, no more television, he had inspired a miracle. The dead had come back to life to punish him. How many men could say as much? Come clump, come thump. Come, slithering sounds. This was a triumph. He stepped back against the wall to get a better view. As both doors opened, his eyes flicked back and forth. His tongue followed, licking his lips. He experienced an ecstasy of terror. The stranger, of course, had used the back stairs. He had tried to forget what a mess he had made of them, especially his wife. And now they were even worse. And yet, as she dragged herself across the floor, there was something in her pale flesh, spotted with purple where the blood had settled, and striped with rust where the blood had spilled, that called to him as it rarely had before. Her skin was clumped with rich brown earth. She needs a bath, he thought, 
and he began to snort with laughter that would soon be uncontrollable. Her lover, approaching from the other side, was hardly marked. There had been no wish to punish him, only to make him stop. Still, the single blow of the TV knife had severed his spine, and his head lurched unpleasantly. The odd disappointment Mr. Bliss had felt in the man's flabbiness intensified. After six days in the ground, what crawled toward him was positively puffy. Mr. Bliss tried to choke back his chuckles till his eyes watered and snot shot from his nose. Even as his end approached, he saw their impossible lust for vengeance as his ultimate vindication. Yet his feet were not as willing to die as he was. They backed over the carpet toward the closet door. His wife looked up at him as well as she could. The eyes in her sockets seemed shriveled like inquisitive prunes. A part of her, where he had cut too deeply and too often, dropped quietly to the floor. Her lover shuffled forward on hands and knees, leaving some sort of a trail behind him. Mr. Bliss pulled the gleaming brass bed around to make a barricade. He stepped back into the closet. The smell of her perfume and of her sex enveloped him. He was buried in her gowns. His wife reached the bed first, and grasped the fresh linen with the few fingers she had left. She hauled herself up. Stains smeared the sheets. This was certainly the time to slam the closet door. But he wanted to watch. He was positively fascinated. She squirmed on the pillows, arms flailing, then collapsed on her back. There were gurgles. Could she be really dead at last? No. It didn't matter. Her lover crawled over the counterpane. Mr. Bliss wanted to go to the bathroom, but the way was blocked. He cringed when his wife's lover, who was this creeping corpse anyway, stretched out fat fingers, but instead of clawing for revenge, they fell on what had been the breasts of the body beneath him. They began to move gently. Mr. Bliss blushed as the ritual began. He heard sounds that had embarrassed him even when the meat was live, liquid lurchings, ghastly groans and supernatural screams. He shot himself in the closet. What was at work on the bed did not even deign to notice him. He was buried in silk and polyester. It was worse than he had feared. It was unbearable. They hadn't come for him at all. They had come for each other. Les Daniels' books include Comics, A History of Comic Books in America, Living in Fear, A History of Horror and the Mass Media, Dying of Fright, Masterpieces of the Macabre, Thirteen Tales of Terror, and three novels about the immortal vampire Don Sebastian de Villanueva, The Black Castle, The Silver Skull, and Citizen Vampire. He is presently at work on a new Sebastian chronicle, tentatively entitled Yellow Fog. Their Coming for You is his first short story.